Thank you. If the rest of you could be seated, please, because we are now going to begin. Excellencies, dignitaries, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Juliette Foster and welcome to day two of the second Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. Let's go back to yesterday because we discussed the humanitarian development challenges from conflict and climate change, the impact on the different agencies involved and how that's leading them to examine their working relationships with each other and their approach towards man-made and natural disasters. Well, today we're going to further broaden the discussion parameters by looking at specific groups of people and how they're served in times of crisis. And that is reflected in the title of our panel, Women, Children and People with Special Needs in Crisis and the Humanitarian Work Challenges. Now, tragically, humanitarian crises are a fact of life and the impact on those on the receiving end is often disproportionate. If we take, for example, figures from the United Nations and its partner organizations, nearly 168 million people will require humanitarian assistance and protection in 2020. That translates as one person in 45, the highest in decades. Now, it's a figure that should be familiar to most of us because it, it was raised during one of our panel discussions, the opening discussion, in fact. Now, regardless of whether a crisis is man-made or the result of a natural disaster, there are certain groups of people who will always be particularly vulnerable. Disasters have killed or maimed record numbers of children, forcing survivors to flee their homes into an economic and social wilderness. One in five people in conflict zones have mental health problems, while statistically, women and girls are at a higher risk of sexual and gender-based violence. Women and girls with physical disabilities or those from ethnic minorities or low castes are especially vulnerable, a reality reinforced by those very social labels. A 2016 study found that adolescent girls with the physical and intellectual disabilities are more likely to face, and I quote, multiple intersecting and often mutually reinforcing forms of discrimination and oppression which are exacerbated in situations of crisis. Now that susceptibility is further underscored by the roles of women and girls. Let's take one example. In the Sahel, a scarcity of resources has meant that women and girls are forced to walk longer distances to fetch fuel and water, increasing their exposure to harassment and sexual assault. Now one way around this was for the girls to collect the water at night. Yet ironically, that heightened the risks to their safety. What it reveals is that gender-based violence should not be treated as a standalone issue given how it connects with sustainable development goals. In 2018, one in six children, that's around 415 million, were living in conflict zones. That's more than double the number recorded in 1999. Now that trend reinforces the case for initiatives to end preventable infant deaths, support healthy brain development in younger children, including those with disabilities, while driving economic recovery and peace building. Let's not forget that the first 1,000 days in a child's life are vital for nurturing and learning, hence the value of early intervention programs and early childhood development initiatives focusing on education, access to healthcare, and good nutrition for both the mother and the child. To quote a 2018 report from the Early Childhood Peace Consortium, by intervening early and engaging with children's families, Early childhood development services offer a unique opportunity to make a cost-effective and sustainable impact on interrupting cycles of poverty and violence. Don't forget that women are vital in helping to make a success of development and humanitarian strategies, which is why their economic empowerment is essential as it is key to breaking those very cycles of dependence. So the question is, what does this mean for humanitarian agencies and their strategies? Do they overlook other categories of need? Should they revisit the definition of vulnerable? Plenty to think about in that overview. Let me introduce the panel. I'd like to start first with Dr. Rima Sala. If you care to join us on the stage, Dr. Sala. 
And let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a former Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF, that is the United Nations Children's Fund, and she's also Chair of the Early Childhood Peace Consortium. In fact, I quoted from your report, so thank you so much for that. She's also a former Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General to the UN Mission in the Central African Republic and Chad, serving on the high-level panel on peace operations. So thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate that. His Excellency Dr. Tariq al Ghug, please join us on the stage. And Dr. Tariq al Ghug is the Chief Executive Officer at Dubai Cares and member of its Board of Directors, a role to which he was appointed in 2009. Under his direction, Dubai Cares is recognized as a best case practitioner and global leader in education program design and innovation. So thank you so much for being with us. The Honorable Frances Townsend, She's a former Homeland Security Advisor to the US President George W. Bush, as well as former Chair of the Homeland Security Council. So please come and join us. I'm now going to gather my breath here because Frances has a very impressive resume. She joined the White House from the US Coast Guard, where she served as Assistant Commandant for Intelligence. Prior to that, she spent 13 years at the US Department of Justice in a number of senior roles under multiple administrations. And currently she serves as EVP, so that's Executive Vice President, excellent, of Worldwide Government Legal and Business Affairs at McAndrews and Forbes, an American diversified holding company working across their portfolio companies, focusing on international legal compliance and business development issues. So thank you so much for being with us, Francis. I'd also like to invite to the stage Dr. Amal Al Habdam, so please come and join us. And to give you a little bit of background about this unique lady, she is head of King Salman Relief Community Support Unit. And I know that one of the issues that she's very keen to discuss is the charity's Child Soldiers Rehabilitation Program, in which she is actively involved. I'd also like to stress as well that if you want more information about that program, you'll not just hear about it in the conversation that we're going to have, but there is literature available as well. I'd also like to invite to the stage Dr. Padmini Murphy. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Murphy is a physician, activist, and professor and global health director at New York Medical College. For the past 28 years, she has practiced medicine and public health in various countries. And in 2016, she was awarded the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal by the American Medical Women's Association for her contribution to the field of women in medicine. So thank you so much for being with us. And finally, could you please give a very warm welcome to Lina or Sheikh Omar Majoub. Please come and join us on the stage. Now she became the Sudanese Minister of Labor and Social Development in 2019 in the transitional cabinet of Prime Minister Abdar Khandok. And she's interested in promoting corporate social responsibility and is co-founder of the Impact Hub Khartoum website, which aims to provide, and I quote, a cooperative environment for entrepreneurs, intellectuals, and innovators. So all of you, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to be with us. Let me give you an idea of what's going to happen next because I'm gonna be speaking with our panelists individually, but we've agreed amongst us that we're going to interrupt in the nicest possible way because we want to get a conversation going here from which all of us can learn. This is interactive for us and we want it to be interactive for you as well. Now you the audience you will get your chance to take part and there are people around here who will have microphones so if you want to ask a question or perhaps make a comment then raise your hand somebody will give you a microphone and all I ask is that if you're going, up, going to ask a question then please keep it brief and when you do speak to us please give your name and also the organization that you represent so I'm going to dash over here to my chair not very good with technology so I think the technology has gone on strike but whilst we tr correct it let's begin the process because I want to start first with Dr. Rima Sala Now I know that early childhood development is your issue and what I want to know about is why these early childhood development programs are important in times of crisis and more specifically 
I want to understand the science behind it. Talk us through that. Ah, I think there's a, there's a switch. There's a switch. Thank you very Brilliant. much for the question. Uh, you mentioned some statistics of uh, women and children that are affected by conflict, but I want to say, tell you also that 250 million children under five years of age, we know, in low- and middle-income countries and in situation of war and conflict, will not reach their development potential as they will be met by a range of risks and adversities such as poverty, lack of learning opportunities, abuse and neglect. And also this is compounded by the conflicts, violent conflicts and displacement. We know today we have 70 million people that are displaced and mostly women and children. In 2018 alone, 29 million babies, almost one in five, were born into conflict-affected areas. 50 million children, according to UNICEF, have been uprooted from their homes. And 28 million, uh, half of them, were forced to flee from conflict and violence and insecurity. So we know that conflict and displacement are risk multipliers for children. We rightly are haunted by the plight of families and children in displacement and under conflict. But we, what should haunt us more and concern us more is really that the lasting negative impact of deprivation and violence on children. This will eventually not affect the children, but affect the children, their families, societies, and communities. Why? You asked me about the science. Advances in development neuroscience are really causing a revolutionary shift in the way we think about child development as we learn more about the impact of both negative and positive experiences. We know and we realize that the, in the first year of life, the brain grows at a pace of 700 to 1,000 new neural connections per second, a pace that is never achieved again. It is early life experiences that from preconception onward that determine the capacity of the brain and has influence on the physical health of the child. And this, all these adversities will affect the lifespan of the child, particularly when the child is exposed what to call toxic stress, which are the biological response to adversities. And this include, the adver include emotional behavioral problems which can continue for generations. We didn't know this before. And so it is so important then to really invest in the early childhood development in times, in all times, but particularly in times of crisis, as the intervention can provide immediate results and mitigate the impact of conflict and displacement and provide a foundation really for improved outcome later in life and really is a path to more peaceful and cohesive societies. I'm glad you've mentioned the scientific case for this because too often when we talk about children who've been traumatized, we don't associate it with the science, the actual impact on brain patterns, and also the fact that that trauma can be generational, so it perpetuates itself, the destruction. Yes, yes, and also the child, of course, it affects, as we said, the child, but also it affects the family, it affects the community, and it affects the parents, and we know in times of conflict, the whole fabric of society is disrupted. And the institution even are lost, even the family institution mm. is not strong enough. But also during conflict, and when I met many people and I went to many refugee camps, and you know, the protection systems are eroded. But at that time, who raised, who are, who is going to protect the children? Of course, the family. But at that time, also the family are under stress and they cannot give the nurturing care that they should. 
without really empowering them to do that. Uh, and let's stay with this idea of family, because in that introduction, one of the things which I tried to point out was that women and other caregivers are very important within the family structure and especially in the humanitarian development structure. So how important are they in making sure that initiatives that you've been responsible for building are going to succeed because there is a massive generational responsibility. That's why they have to succeed. Yes. I've met mothers who are so worried that they cannot take care of the children, that they not, cannot give them the care that they should have. Because, as I said, their exposure to stress and challenges, you know, uh, they are not able to do it anymore. So that's why UNICEF and other actors in uh, early childhood development during crisis have to empower particularly mothers and parents and families. How do we empower them? Because the science also highlights the importance of positive parenting, that it's very important and that it reinforces the evidence, the stimulation, the caregiving, the bond between the parents and the children. So it's very important. The parents are very important. So considering this is really building programs to empower mothers, parents, particularly mothers. And those programs should be multi-leveled. When I say multi-leveled, which means the mother, the family, and the community. It's so important. Early childhood development is an inclusive program. It is not for the child alone. It is for the mother, it's for the parent, for the society. But those programs also, uh, they should be safe, they should be nurturing, inclusive, and multi-sectoral. They should have health, nutrition, safety. They should also include peace building component. And that was the point I was also going to ask you about as well, because it's very unusual to a certain extent to associate childhood development with peace building. And I, I really want to know how that works, how it connects. Yes, the peace building. Yeah, yeah the, the peace, the building, peace building, with building with childhood development. Why, why is it so important? Because also evidence sh uh, shows and the science shows that the, the link between the early years of life and the early life environment and also it substantiates the link between violence prevention and the development of pro-social behavior in the child. And, and, and so this can lead to more peaceful homes and communities. So uh, uh, the good news and the hope is that if we really in, implement, in, invest in early children, then we can change the tide of violence. We can really change the tide of violence, and this is a path to social cohesion. And I met mothers, if I give you examples, for example, from uh, Lebanon, from Afghanistan, from uh, Northern Ireland even, that told me how much the programs, the social services for the children in the community benefited them. They understand more the children. They understand more the neighbors. And this really affected to have cohesive societies around them, but also peaceful homes. So my, really, my appeal to all, of, to all of us is that if we want to build a world of peace and development, we should start very early. Investing in the early years of life is really very important. And I want to stick with that theme of investment, in fact, because just to put this in context as well, everybody has been nodding in agreement because you've answered the case so fluently and it really does link up. And I know that one of those was also note-taking, in fact, was His Excellency Dr. Tarek Gurg. Now, as, as I said in your introduction, you're from Dubai Cares. Now, this is a global philanthropic organization that was founded by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And I know that, um, you're really keen on the idea of the smart investment, early childhood development. So give us your insight on that important phase in children's life and why it really is the smart investment, the right way to go. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. When we're talking about a child, let's not forget the coronavirus mixed with it. I'm just kidding. So, so. I'd rather you don't dwell on that too heavily, please. I think we had quite a bit of that yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to take um, 
um, a deep dive on two um, uh, main points of what uh, Rima mentioned um, uh, for the 1,000 days, uh, mainly about the neural connection and, and even about the mothers. But I just want to put some numbers and statistics together so we know what the situation is in fragile settings and humanitarian settings as well. We have five million pregnant women in fragile and humanitarian context. We have 22 million newborns. We have 33 million caregivers. And we have 34 million women on productive age. We also have 75 million children under the age of six, which 50% of them are in the MENA region. This is the situation. And they all need assistance. They all we have to take care of them because it's not only about the child, it's even about the mother from conception until birth. And, and, and that is the time where that fetus in the mother's womb starts developing. So if we're talking about early childhood development, we have to talk about the mother taking care of herself. Now, here in this normal setting, I don't think that's an issue. But if you go to fragile context and you go to a humanitarian context, these mothers are not educated. A lot of these mothers have been refugees probably for 15 years or 17 years that their parents are dead and they didn't have any education on how to take care of a child. So who will give them that knowledge? So the first thing we have to do is, is, is putting the mother into the context and educating her and training her and passing policies to support her. And then comes the child, and we're talking about the first, first 1,000 mm. days that Rima spoke about. And I'm gonna take deep dives into two main points. We have to understand how a brain child functions, first of all. Every second, as Rima mentioned, there are between 700 to 1,000 neurons getting generated in neural threads. And we have millions of neural threads being generated at the same time. When a child touches something, when a child smells something, when a child smiles or cries, that becomes a memory in the child's brain. How does it become a memory? Because you have two neural threads and you have two neurons connecting to each other and that's called a neural connection. And the more neural connection there are in a brain, the more the brain develops. And when I talk develops, I mean not only cognitively, but even size-wise. And that's how a child doesn't become stunted. That's very important to understand. And the more information you give that child, the more the brain develops, and it becomes like a sponge. The more water you put in a sponge, it will pump, and the less water you give, it will become hard and crumble, and we don't want these neural threads to crumble. So that's the importance of why we have to um, 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 help the children. We have to give them the proper care, attention, nutrition, and health. And a lot of people say, yeah, but he's a child. He doesn't understand. And it's fine. Don't worry. He'll grow up and understand. No. It's the first three years of the child's life. That's where you have to give them the care right, so, and attention. So it's, it's incredibly holistic. And just to, again, put what you're all saying in context, I mean, you guys put your money where your mouth is, basically, because you've been in heavy, investing heavily in education in emergencies. And what I'm really fascinated about is, is really how you can put these practices into operation in an environment that is so incredibly fragile which is broken, where people are concerned about surviving, where you are dealing with mothers, fathers, children who are extremely traumatized. So what's the question? The question is, how do you put these, these practices into operation in those fragile, broken environments? Well, uh, um, first, you have to have a holistic approach to it. And, and putting everything into a holistic approach is uh, not an easy game. You have different actors, you have host governments, you have the actual government where, um, um, if it's a refuge situation, so you will have the original country that has to play a part of that, the care of, of, of these children and women. Let's not forget the women, because 
Whenever we talk about ECD, we only talk about the child and we forget about the woman. And putting all of this into context, let, let's not forget, the children of today are the youth of tomorrow. The youth of today are the adults of tomorrow and the future of their nations. And if we can't give the right education to the children today, we're not gonna have proper future youths. And the youth of today, because they missed out so much in, in education, it's costing us so much money and so much training and we're still not getting the quality that we want. But the youth of tomorrow, which are the children of today, if you put the right investment, you're gonna save money in the future and you're gonna have less training to those. So building a holistic approach to this context is very vital, it's very important. And later on, I can even share with you on a holistically approached model on how we can solve the problem, unless you want me to speak about it. I, have, I, can, I, can, I can connect some dots in terms of uh, having a, a, a collaboration on the ground. If you do not have the right actors on the ground, if, you're not, if you don't have the body and the framework and passing policies that will connect all of these children and women together in fragile context, have you ever heard the woman, the woman having the right to go and breastfeed in case she has a job? No. Do they have the right training to know what kind of vaccinations that she has, she, she has to give her child? No. Do, do, do men, do, do fathers play a role in fragile context? Absolutely not. But it's very important to make them understand. So spreading awareness is very important. And connecting the community centers in these fragile contexts is very important. Because you have community centers and, and, and no awareness, no education is happening on, on a community center level. And you can use the youth of today mm -hmm. to convey this message because that's the best tool. Mm, so it perpetuates, basically. And, and we know that Dubai Cares, it has a footprint in, in 59 countries around the world. And what I'd like to know from you is, is for you to share, in fact, some examples of these ECD programs that have been very successful in terms of the innovation and the difference they've made in those fragile settings. Sure, we, we, uh, we have over 200 programs uh, um, um, across 59 developing countries and we're providing education and care to more than 20 million children. So I might focus on two or three which I personally visited. I visited at least uh, 40 of these 59 countries and, and, and maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, with Laos. Laos there's a big problem in Laos where 80% of the population are ethnic minorities, 80%. And the rest are in urban cities and, and, and one is in uh, um, uh, uh, Vientiane itself, the capital, and then, and then you have um, an, a, another major city. The issue with the ethnic minorities they call them the ethnic minorities, but they're 80% of the population. I have no idea why they call them the minorities. But the only people who speak the Lao language are the people who are in the urban cities, which are two major cities. 80% of the population don't speak the Lao language. What has happened, 80% of students in grade one don't pass grade one. They drop out, they have a huge problem. The Lao government called the World Bank to make a feasibility study, to make a research to see what's happening. The World Bank didn't know what was happening. They approached us and they said, could you be part of a big research to see what's happening there? So we said, yes, we funded the World Bank, the research came out and we realized that the curriculum, the education system is all of the Lao language and 80% of the people don't speak the Lao language. So the question is, should we train teachers who speak the Lao language to give them the ethnic minority language, they wouldn't accept. Can we get the Lao teachers, bringing them to the urban cities to train them on the Lao language so they can go back? They will never go back once they come to capitals and cities. So we have an issue. And that's when we got Plan International in and we started tackling the issue and it, it became an, an, an amazing program. And what has happened, we tackled the issue from pre-primary, getting them into catch up schools and uh, accelerated learning in summer so they can join P1 immediately after summer. We got Save the Children to handle and tackle the literacy issue and 
five years passed by, we just finished it, and we're just finalizing the final research on this one to get the findings, and this will be embedded into the education system. Another example, Peru. In Peru, you have 50% of children who are aged between zero to three who are anemic. They're anemic because they have iron deficiency. Why do they have iron deficiency? Is because they don't eat any proteins. That's all about education. And to tackle that issue, once you pass the age of three and you become stunted, you can't go back. You cannot reverse stunting. So what we're doing in Peru, we're, we're, we're having a program to prevent stunting of happening. And that's the program. We're giving them nutrition. We're also giving them the right care. We're teaching parents why they should care about the children. They have to talk to them. They have to feed them. They have to pat them on the back. You know why the mother takes a child, pats the child at the back, and the child stays quiet when he cries, but the father, when he takes the child, doesn't? There's a reason behind it. I'm a father of do four daughters, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and you know what's the reason? What, what is the reason? It's because of the heartbeat. Ah. Nine months. The, the fathers would be... Right, they don't get the it's rhythm. It's different. It's different. <laughs> and it's the smell. And my wife keeps on insisting. She tells the nannies, don't put any perfume because she wants the baby to smell mine and hers. Right. There is a connection. There is a brain. This has not been created randomly. It's, it's, it's been constructed properly, the brain. And that's what we're doing. We're teaching the parents the importance. And we have so many examples, but I can't share in this setting. But but well. Sadly not. But I mean, look, the, the examples you've given us are really interesting because what they illustrate, and this is just my take from the outside looking in, is the value of these really good partnerships and the results which you get at the end of it. And of course, the importance of taking that holistic approach which you outlined. And I'm glad that you also brought the concept of empowerment into it as well, because female empowerment is essential in these crisis situations. But I guess that the question is how that empowerment is sustained, not during a crisis, but when it's over. And Francis Townsend, I want to bring you in as well, because you've seen the importance of role models in empowering, empowering women through your own involvement in humanitarian projects, because I have seen the pictures as well, and they, they're good, they're a testimony to, to what you do. But, you know, tell us about the value of that empowerment, because there are so many other aspects to it that I want to discuss with you as well. So let me, let me start by thanking His Majesty King Salman and the Crown Prince, Prince Mohammed, as well as Dr. Abdullah for inviting me. One might ask, how is it that a presidential advisor on counterterrorism is invited to a humanitarian <laughs> conference? And I really am proof of what happens when you don't do the very things that everyone else, Dr. Rima and everyone is talking about, right? These children, when they are left in refugee camps and they are not tended to younger in life, and especially these refugee camps, are left and they are fertile ground for recruiting for terrorism. And that is exactly what we see happen. And when they become youth and or they are recruited as child soldiers, um, they are taken advantage of. And so it was in December of 2018, I visited Yemen and I visited one of the child soldier rehabilitation centers. I visited um, one of the prosthetic rehabilitation centers where they took children who had lost limbs um, and they fitted them with prosthetics. They, they, the children, it was really incredibly moving to see the light in these children's eyes that, that these children who had been so lost, removed from the family home, removed from the uh, sort of a loving, nurturing environment, brought together, put back and nurtured and put, put, taken out of sort of a violent environment and begun to be rehabilitated. Um, it was really quite extraordinary, the power of that and that investment. These children didn't really care who provided it. They were just grateful. And I will tell you that the thing that I was most struck by was the 
the passage in the Quran that said, the Holy Quran that says, when you save a single life, it is as if you have saved all of humanity. You could see that in these children. It was by saving these lives, by the, by the investment that the humanitarian, the Saudi humanitarian effort makes in Yemen, these children go out into the world as a force for good, um, and, it, and it pays itself back in dividends in, in the future. Um, I will tell you that it, it was the people that came to me to talk to me about this when I was in, I was in Mar, the Marab province, were the mothers. It was the women who came to me and told me what a difference it made to the family, to the women in their lives, that they, that they had their children back. And it, it really, it was extraordinary to me the generational difference that mm. the humanitarian effort made. Yes, and, and so the, the women have got the family back and it feeds their strength as well, the empowerment that we were talking about. And the, what, what fascinates me is that you know, we, we talk about empowerment in the crisis situation and we talk about having aid workers on the ground. Could they be part of that solution in terms of empowering women with gender balanced teams where women are seen in roles of leadership? Absolutely. So as part of the counterterrorism effort here in the kingdom, um, women were incorporated into the Mabaha. They were incorporated in the rehabilitation effort um, as psychologists in the, in the rehabilitation effort. Very early on, the kingdom understood that using women at, and incorporating women into the counterterrorism effort was very much a part of how you defeated the ideology. Um, it was also in Afghanistan. I can remember visiting Afghanistan um, and there was a, a women's anti-narcotics unit and they were very much not only empowered, but they wanted not only to be a counter-narcotics unit, they wanted to be part of the national security apparatus where they could sit at the policy making table and change the course of their country. And so, it, as with most things, if you give someone an opportunity at any level, they want to participate more, they want to do more. Um, it was true in Afghanistan and it's true here in the kingdom. But then the question becomes, how do you give women the confidence that they can tap into that power and unleash their leadership skills? Because particularly if you're talking about communities that have been, well, they've, they've been broken apart by conflict or a natural disaster, to actually come up to somebody and say, hey, you know, you can do something, you can help to put the pieces back together, you can understand if they contradict that and say, no, I disagree, I just need to get by. You know, I, I think we often underestimate the power of role models. I think, you know, the minister from Sudan, simply walking into a room, I came to find myself when I was in the White House, just walking in as a woman in a position of power was sort of so powerful to other women in other countries, in my own country, um, here in the kingdom, when I would meet other women. It was inspiring and it, it, it allowed other women to imagine themselves in that position in their country. It allowed them to imagine that they too could do that. Um, and, I, and I think that we often underestimate the power of role models. I, one thing I, I would actually, well, really trying to stitch everything together that you've been saying and again, bringing in, incorporating what we've, we've heard from our other panelists, is whether it's time for the aid response to embed empowerment and female leadership in its humanitarian work. Because when people move on, those involved in development work, they've got to leave that structure behind. It has to survive. Otherwise, what was the point? So is that the next step? embedding these, these concepts into what they do. Absolutely, and I think part of that is including sort of diverse teams in the humanitarian delivery effort, right? I, I mean, I think you need women leaders, you need diverse teams that's racially diverse, gender diverse, absolutely. I think that's part of the, that's gotta be part of the humanitarian effort. Okay, and I like the idea that you were talking about inner strength because it is important if you are surviving in a conflict 
situation or where an area has been destroyed by a natural disaster. But it's really important as well when mothers or carers are looking after children who've been left traumatized by these very uh, forces. I mean, we've looked at the importance of that child development, but one thing which does fascinate me is as a group of children within the body of children generally, and their plight is sometimes fleetingly referred to in media coverage, and I'm focusing specifically on child soldiers. And Francis, you touched on them. Now, King Salman Relief, as I said in my introduction, they have established a project that works with child soldiers. And Dr. Amar Haddan, you're involved in that project, and I want to know what it does, and more specifically, if you can give us an idea about the problems these children have. And for the benefit of the audience, Dr. Haddan will be speaking in Arabic. So if you just give us a little bit of time to put on our translation headphones so that we can follow you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, everybody. مثل ما حكت الدكتورة ريما والدكتور طارق وزملائي في الجلسة أنه في كثير من الاضطرابات اللي تصيب الأطفال لما يكونوا في حالات النزاع وفي الكوارث ومن الاضطرابات اللي يمكن مهمة وخطيرة اللي هي اضطرابات الخوف واضطرابات ما بعد الصدمة هذه من الاضطرابات اللي تؤثر على الطفل وتؤثر على نموه وهي كلها هي انعكاسات لحالات الحروب واللي يتأثرون لها والنزاعات والتجنيد بالأصح لما كنا في كنت في مأرب وقابلت يمكن زي ما تفضلت زميلتي مع الأطفال اللي موجودين كان ما يستطيع النوم والكوابيس بالنسبة لهم شيء مستمر بعد ما تعرضوا لتجربة التأهيل في مركز الملك سلمان لتأهيل الأطفال المجندين تحسنت هذه الاضطرابات وتلاشت ولله الحمد وأصبحوا يعيشون إلى حد ما حياة طبيعية الاضطرابات هذه حتى عدم ثقتهم في نفس في نفسهم إحساسهم بوصمة العار إحساس أهاليهم بوصمة العار أيضا من هذه تجنيدهم هذه كلها مآسي يمر فيها الطفل المجند وأسرته لذلك مركز الملك سلمان قام بهذا المشروع النوعي والفريد واللي أشادت فيه الأمم المتحدة وأشادت فيه السيدة فرجينيا جامبا وقالت إنه هو من المشاريع الفريدة والنوعية اللي المفروض أنها تكون نموذج يحتذى فيه لأنه هو حقوق الملكية الفكرية في مركز الملك سلمان حيث تم عمل هذا البرنامج عمل هذا التأهيل بحيث يكون في تدخل مع الطفل وزي ما قالت الدكتورة ريمة إحنا نتعامل مع منظومة إيكوسيستم نتعامل مع الطفل والأسرة المجتمع المدرسة حتى نضمن أنه يكون في إعادة تأهيل كاملة آآ آآ هذا المشروع النوع الفريد أصبح جزء الآن من الائتلاف البحثي اللي موجود تابع لليوم المتحدة لمكتب السيدة فرجينيا جامبا للاستفادة من التجارب والدراسات اللي تم العمل فيها البرنامج يقوم على عملية التأهيل لهؤلاء الأطفال صحيا ونفسيا واجتماعيا وإلحاقهم بالتعليم وإدماجهم في المجتمع البرنامج يكون على مدى إيواء كامل في الفترة الأولى ومن ثم يحول إلى إيواء جزئي بحيث في نهاية الأسبوع يذهب إلى أهاليهم ومن في الأخير يتم في متابعتهم بعد عودتهم إلى أسرهم نوعية الانتقال من مرحلة إلى مرحلة قائمة على أسس مهنية يتم في قياس الأطفال احتياجاتهم الخاصة كل طفل لما يحضر إلى المركز يتم في عملية قياس نفسي وشخصي حتى نتأكد من الاضطرابات اللي موجودة لديه وفي نفس التوازي نقوم بعمل ذلك مع أسرته فحتى نكون على علم بماذا تجابه الأسرة وحتى تكون الأسرة شريك معنا في خطة التأهيل لأنه هذا الشيء جدا ضروري أن الأسرة تكون معنا في خطة التأهيل الطفل هنا ضحية وليس جاني لابد أن نتعامل مع هذا أن هذا الطفل ضحية وليس جاني وأن مثل ما قالوا يمكن زملاء ريم واستفرق أن الطفل إذا تعلمناه وأهلناه حيكون هو دعاة السلام في النهاية حنوصل للسلام وحتى نفضل النزاعات فإحنا نقوم على هذه العملية التأهيل أيضا نقوم على تطوير إبداعاتهم معرفة ما لديهم من, من, 
من مواهب وابداعات حتى نحولهم من ساحة الحرب إلى ساحة التعليم حتى يكونوا بنات المستقبل في في مجتمعاتهم والآن نعمل على تطوير هذا المشروع المشروع بدأ في سبتمبر 2017 وإلى الآن تقريبا 840 طفل تم تأهيلهم ومن الأسر 11 ألف من المستفيدين غير المباشرين والآن نعمل على منذ عام بداية عام 2019 على تطوير المشروع التطوير مر بأسس احترافية علمية منهجية بمشاركة الجامعات وأصحاب الخبرة والممارسين في الميدان بحيث يكون في منظومة متكاملة في عملية التطوير عملنا تقريبا 12 ورشة عمل ستة منها في الرياض مع الجامعات المعنية مع أصحاب المصلحة من الممارسين والأكاديميين أصحاب التخصص وستة منها في مأرب في المركز نفسه عملناه مع الأطفال ممن تجاوزوا المرحلة وعادوا إلى أهاليهم وعملناه مع الأطفال منهم الآن في مركز التأهيل وعملنا مع الأسر حتى ومع المنظمة الشريكة لدينا لأن يهمنا أن يكون هناك بناء للقدرات والتمكين للمنظمة التي نعمل معها حتى نحقق أهداف التنمية المستدامة ويكون لنا أثر مستدام موجود حتى المدارس يتم تدريبهم على كيفية متابعة هؤلاء الأطفال حتى نضمن إعادة إدماجهم في المجتمع وحتى إذا تم ملاحظة أي عدم اندماج أو, أو, أو أي سلوكيات قد تعود لهم إما سلوكيات قد تكون طبيعية مثل الكوابيس أو سلوكيات عنف أو, أو يكون هناك إعادة تأهيل مرة أخرى لأنه عادة اندماج موضوع جدا معقد And it, and it, it must be a really difficult job reintegrating these children but more specifically getting society to stand back from the stigma because the world may see that child as a ticking time bomb because of what it's been subjected to, what it has seen, what it has taken part in, but also the parents of those children. So what I'm getting at is, you know, how do you break down that stigma in society? And how important is the mother-child bond in helping that child to blend back into that family? من البداية الأسرة تكون معنا في في ونقوم بعمل العملات عمل دورات توعوية وتدريبية لهؤلاء الأمهات نعمل عمل التوعية بمخاطر التجنيد وحقوق الأطفال وكل ما يحتاجه الطفل من رعاية مثل ما ذكر زملائي الطفل من ثلاث سنوات يشعر الطفل من ثلاث سنوات الأثر موجود ذكرت دكتورة ريما أن الطفل ما هو موجود في في بداية حياته يستمر معه حتى النهاية وهذا ما يجب أن 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 نوعي فيه الأسر وبالتالي ندربهم حتى على كيفية متابعة التدريب معنا في في المنزل وكيفية احتواء هؤلاء الأطفال فالأسرة منذ البداية معنا في عملية التدريب والتأهيل نعمل لهم ورش عمل متزامنة حتى المدربين اللي يقدمون هذه الخدمة للأسر نعمل على عملية تدريبهم وحوكمة التدريب حيث نتأكد أنه المعلومات التي نريدها أن تصل للأسرة والأم تكون واضحة الأسر غالبا اللي يكون فيها الأطفال المجندين تكون أسر من فئات مهمشة أو فئات ضعيفة التعليم فيها أقل حظهم يكون أقل فنضطر إلى أن نحن نزيد من هذه التوعية أيضا من الأشياء المهمة اللي نعملها مع الأمهات اللي هي والأسر اللي هي تمكين الاقتصادي نعمل تمكين اقتصادي ونساعدهم على أن يكونون جزء من الدورة الاقتصادية في مجتمعهم وبالتالي يقومون بمتابعة هؤلاء الأطفال وبالتأكد من عدم اضطرارهم للعودة إلى التجنيد مرة أخرى إما بسبب الفقر أو غيره Thank you very much. And what I'd like to say, again, just from a very personal perspective, being involved in this conversation, it's, it's taken me on a learning curve as well, but it's really the fact that we're talking about groups who are very, very vulnerable and the need to have their voice. We all have a voice, but if you are in that fractured environment, that voice needs to be amplified and there has to be a recognition of basic rights. It doesn't matter if it's the right to live in safety or the right to good healthcare or the right to an education. It is something that we all take for granted 
and it needs to be heard. And Dr. Padmini Murphy, I know this is something that you feel very passionately about because you've written about it extensively, and it's really the importance of those voices of women and girls, the disabled, being heard at every stage of a humanitarian response, not just at the beginning, but all the way through, wherever that journey leads. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks to His Excellency King Salman, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, Dr. Abdullah, and the rest of the team for this great conference. And thank you so much, Juliet. And uh, just to add on to what my fellow panelists said is, invest in girls and women, it's a ripple effect. So we need to start at the beginning, start at the grassroots. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm putting on my academic hat here, is we start teaching our students, and we have what is called medical brigades. So it's just not that you're actively at the site, like my honored colleague, Dr. Tariq, was talking about. It's also how you train the younger generation, because they are the torch bearers. So, for example, you spoke about anemia uh, for children. The other issue is, and to add on to what Rima, you said, is it's important that the nutrition of the mother, so as a gynecologist who's now in preventive medicine, it starts at the beginning. You need to make sure women are healthy, they eat good. So one of the NGOs I was involved with, uh, uh, who worked in um, you know, providing aid, we talked to the local trainers to use the local foods to uh, give them like molasses, candy made from molasses because they get their protein, they get their iron, because you cannot give them a script for pills and say, hey, go to the pharmacy and fill it. Mm. You can't do that. So when we're talking about these, they're simple steps, they're important, you start at the basics. And the other thing is, in answer to your question, Juliet, I know you're wearing your hard journalist hat, and it's, it's great, like you're, you're playing, you know, what shall I say, frisbee with us. So I think Metaphorically it's, speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to say, I think one of the other things is, we need to make sure women are seated at the table, and youth too. We cannot neglect the youth, because they have their own, and they are their best uh, what shall I say, um, advocates. So they need to say that this is what we want. It's just not, when we do aid work, one of the things is it's team building, but it's also making sure there's sustainability. And we talk about the sustainable development goals here, especially three, which is help for all at all ages. So we cannot separate the child from the woman. Uh, you know, it's MCH, it's maternal and child health. So you cannot have a healthy child, you cannot have a development for the child without having the mother involved. I'm not saying that because I'm a woman and a mother, but I think it's like gender harmony. That's what needs to be, we need to work together to promote harmony in the society. And so I think, and it's really interesting, Julia, that I just wanted to give the statistic uh, that women who use maternal health services are more likely to use other services also for their families and their children. So we have this big movement for universal health care. So it's time we integrate basic uh, universal health care packages to see how we can move forward, not after the aid has, you know, just not when the aid is given, but throughout. So it needs to be cyclical. You need to look at the various issues. And the other interesting thing is, you know, I mean, it's not any uh, disrespect to any men. I mean, I have great male colleagues. I've been married to a man for over 30 years. But I just want to say that it is a, it's a well-known fact that girls and women spend 90% of their own income on families, much more than men do. So I think it's high time we need to have women at the crux of the table when discussing. For example, in the UN, when the declaration, Rima, with all your work on peace, 1325, one of the things Ambassador Chowdhury did, whom we know and respect, is he made sure women were at the table. So I think even for any kind of thing, you know, I mean, as a physician, as a, a public health person, I think it's so important 
to have the stakeholders have an equal voice when we uh, you know, discuss these issues. And it's also a, a good way because the ripple effect goes. So because it's being translated. And Tariq, you said so well that the, uh, and thank you for being the brave man on the panel. We really <laughs> appreciate it. And for being such a proponent of gender equality. Thank you so much. Mabrook, my, uh, my Arabic is very sketchy, but I'm <laughs> congratulating you and all the other men in the room. I just wanted to say the ripple effect is when you teach a mother, you educate a nation. So it comes down the generations. So this is important. And it doesn't matter, you know, how we educate them, the message needs to go across that. And also to all the stakeholders, you help women, you invest in them, you uh, invest in a healthy society. And let's, let's take this idea as well of, of this round table, women sitting around that actually being involved in the decision making, the strategies, etc. Because I want to focus on women and girls who are marginalized because they're disabled or from indigenous groups and what should be done amongst the humanitarian and development agencies to reach out to these groups so that they can actually feel that they are part of this process because what comes out of it is going to impact impact them too, perhaps, you know, in disproportionately, but in a positive way. Yeah, so just to answer very briefly to that, I think it's important as I re I would like to reiterate again, we need to have them as stakeholders and we need somebody who's a representative for them. So that's why it's, uh, you know, it's not that one shoe fits all, Juliet. It's very important we take the needs of different people, especially when it comes to uh, women's health issues, also the reproductive health issues, because adolescents have different issues, older women have different issues, people in the traditional childbearing age have different issues. So I think, and one of the more important things I found during my research, and you know, when we work with our medical students, is to do a local needs assessment assessment. So you cannot go in there with a, a blueprint and say this is going to work. One of the things is to be flexible, to do a needs assessment there and improvise because it's, it's such a fluid situation. It's such a fluid situation. So you need to address it to the best of what you can do. But the basic principle underlying crux of the, of the whole thing is you need to have people there. You need to talk to them. It's not that I'm going there, I, I've got these millions of dollars or I am brilliant, I can do what is needed. It needs to be a team effort and it's like we are in it together. Can I stick with this idea of needs assessment? Should it extend to humanitarian or development agencies providing safe spaces for women and girls as part of their crisis response? Should that be an obligation on them to provide that? Definitely it is. Actually, uh, thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. Maybe you read my mind uh, across her. But I think it's really important because they should not feel scared to speak about it. They should not feel ashamed to talk about what their needs are and if they have any unmet needs to talk about it. So it's very important to create a safe space where women and girls do not feel persecuted. And the reason I'm also putting girls in along with children is look at the number of young people in the world today. They are growing exponentially. Even though you have baby boomers, it's the world for them. And I think one of the panelists and you said it's important we invest in them because we will not lose so much of money. So even, I'm not an economist, but if you do the math, investing in women and girls today, tomorrow will give, uh, will build a stronger society in, you know, socially and economically, and you have a strong workforce. And I said, they are the torch bearers because they will pass it down to future generations. But I guess that also means in, in this, this process, familiarizing women with the fact that they have a basic right to medicine because all of us in this room, be you, men, be you male or female, we all know that we have that basic right. But again, when you have a society which is fractured, it is broken, it is rebuilding, that right kind of flies over the head. Perhaps you don't make that association. Yeah, thank you. One of the other things is, unfortunately, we know we have the right because we are privileged to live in not so fractured environments. 
but I think it is up to the people who work there, like the volunteers or the staff, to make sure, to tell them that you have the same right as something else, like you have the b same basic right to get your, you know, access to healthcare, your needs attended. So I think this is something we need to, and that's why I was talking about the universal health coverage, and I think we need to have the basic human right a premise woven into that fabric so that, you know, it, it, it really translates and it's a strong fabric, that means we are laying a strong foundation. I hope I've answered your question. I think you've answered it coherently and, co and very comprehensively. I'm, I'm not going to argue because you are not a lady to be argued with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, look, what, what, what has emerged Again, reinforcing it, it's been strengthened in this discussion, is that women are a linchpin in these various strategies. And there's been a lot of talk about empowerment, and it's really important in the economic sphere. Now, I, I touched on that very briefly in, in the introduction, and Lina El Sheikh Omar Rajoub, I want you to expand on that. But looking at your experience in Sudan, I want to know what is, what is happening there to economically empower women and the tools they're being given. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I just want to start with saying that one of the you know, heaviest, I mean, as Minister of uh, Labor and Social Development, it's a huge portfolio, but one of the most, um, you know, the heaviest responsibility, I think, when we're looking at the most vulnerable is when we're looking at children. And I just wanted to share that in Sudan, um, uh, we have very um, high stunting levels. I mean, one in every three children does, is, not, is unable to reach their full potential. And it's really important that we look at multi-sectoral and comprehensive uh, interventions when we're talking about children. And I echo what my um, fellow panelists has said around the importance of focusing on women and girls. And, um, you know, and since yesterday we've been talking about adopting a rights-based approach and what does that mean? and social justice, and uh, what does that mean when we're talking about women, we're talking about children, we're talking about people, disability, uh, we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about inclusive growth, and um, sustainable, you know, the agenda, the decade of uh, action, if we're looking 2030, we're looking at leaving no one behind, and um, again, it's about nothing about us without us, and I love that you said, you know, we need to engage our stakeholders in identifying what makes sense and what is relevant, and I think it's very important that we create these um, safe spaces that are um, a nurturing for whether we're talking about children, we're talking about uh, uh, people with disability or children with disability, or how can we empower women to be able to best be best positioned uh, to care for children and, and uh, contribute to these um, peaceful and inclusive societies that we talk about. Coming to Sudan, and again, I'm um, privileged to be representing a um, transitional government after a revolution that was led by women um, and youth. And I think we always ask why is it that women are at the forefront. I think because women really care about everybody and about the society. And it's then what became one of our um, ten priorities to focus on how can we as a transitional government in these three years focus on ensuring that women get their economic social and political uh, participation and empowerment. So when we talk about um, um, economic empowerment, I think it's, it's, it's thinking about women's ability to safely generate access, use, and control resources. It's about choice, and it's about being agents of change. Um, and resources are not only financial in kind or assets, but also time, because time, time is an issue. So women's ability to control use of their time through labor, family, and childcare, or leisure is also crucial, and are we really looking into that? Um, with this definition, we see that initiatives and projects that mainstream gender equality and women empowerment are expanding. However, initiatives whose primary objective is women empowerment are small in scale. And I think this is what in Sudan we're trying to focus on. It's how can we look at gender equality, what are the things that we're doing, how are we um, looking at changing norms, because it's also revisiting legislation that needs to be changed, how can we um, embrace and adopt uh, international uh, treaties and, activities and um, agreements that basically support women's um, empowerment. And I think when we talk about crisis, it's also important, um, you know, that we talk about uh, poverty, you know, it's an, and it's a, it's a vicious circle. 
We're talking about poverty, we're talking about conflict, we're talking about you know, women worrying about how are they being able to provide for their children, for their family, um, and what does that mean? And, 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 um, and, it, and it's really difficult and harsh. And, and I think about our situation in Sudan and we're going through this, you know, this, we've got protracted crises and uh, a long, um, um, you know, I think it's, it's been quite a tough few decades, um, if not more for Sudan. And now with the change, we're going through this uh, extreme economic crisis and fragility, which also brings, uh, I think, most women in a um, situation of crisis, thinking about how can they provide, and um, you know, if we're talking about children, how can we provide for their nutrition? I think that we, you know, we need to kind of think and remember that a lot of the women in, in our context in, you know, and uh, um, poor countries and fragile countries, um, they're facing a lot of economic marginalization. So you find a lot of the women are in the, for in the, in the formal, in the informal sector, um, and they receive uh, low wages and little protection. One of the things that we've done recently, just with the change, is, is basically looking at um, how can we support uh, women who work in uh, who are tea sellers and, and food sellers, and they have been the most marginalized, and uh, they've been victims, really. And we said, you know, let's see how can we support through the National Health Insurance Fund, because one of, in Sudan, um, you know, uh, out of pocket is 70% for help. And it's like one of, uh, I think, we're at the bottom of the list in the world. And this is where some of the areas that there's a lot of stress. So there's a lot of stress in women to provide, um, to, be, to have access to health, to, you know, to, um, to basically good quality, and also then to their children as well. Um, so this is one of the areas that we're kind of focusing on, is saying, you know, where, are, where can we invest more so that we ensure that there's less stress in women, there are, there's more opportunity for it's them. It's worth unleashing that potential yes. by identifying those areas of stress, working on them. Yes, exactly. And I think also um, it's about how can we ensure that women receive equal levels of, um, of education. And then comes the issue around access to leadership positions, um, senior level uh, positions, because you know, we have a lot of biases and, accord, you know, related to social norms and traditions. Um, so we need to also be looking at that um, in conflict and in a lot of different areas in Sudan, because we've been um, suffering from conflict for long years, you find that women are the sole breadwinners for their family. But access to markets and services is restricted. So their mobility and safety is also impacted by violence with high prevalence of gender-based violence and sex sexual exploitation. Um, and as part of, of their coping mechanisms, women are forced to sell their assets, skip meals, while girls are subject to child labor and early marriages. So that is, you know, it, I, I keep saying that it's, it's, it's a lot of different things. It's a, it's a cycle, to be honest, mm. and we need to think about how can we intervene to, um, at different levels. But, but clearly, it is a cycle, you're absolutely correct. You've identified the issues that you have to take on and you are making a difference. Small beginnings, but that's how big yeah. things start. And out of those small beginnings, what I'd like to know is how is that economic empowerment changing the outlook of women in Sudan? Because something is happening. And I can see from the expression on your face that you're really excited about this yeah. because you're seeing these developments every day. I think one of the things that, um, and I mentioned that actually yesterday a little bit, is, is about how can we support that they have access to credit, to finance, to microfinance, so that they are able to start their own businesses, they're able to grow their businesses, and then therefore um, are in a better position to provide. How can they also learn to, um, to organize so that they're, you know, societies, cooperatives, and they can access that. And one of the good things about, you know, um, in our ministry is that we have access to a couple of banks and microfinance is one of the tools that we're using to make sure that women are empowered. Um, again, as I said, it's, it's looking at how they're safe. I love that you mentioned safe spaces because we need to focus more on providing spaces for, for the different kind of, um, um, you know, we're talking, whether we're talking about women or children or people with disabilities so that they are able to share because I think they know best. You know, we, we, you know, we, we keep forgetting that, but I think they know best that what works and what doesn't. Um, I think it's also about how can we um, maybe um, encourage that within the human, humanitarian setting that we're looking at access for women as well.
Okay. I mean, look, it, this, this has been a, well, I found it a very interesting discussion, and I hope that um, our audience has also gained something from it too. And as I said at the start of this conversation, you will have the opportunity to raise some points with the panel and indeed to put questions to them. But I just want to throw things a bit wider now and just put some questions to all of you generally, because again, in my role as the outsider looking in, what I see is that all of you in your own way you're trying to uphold basic protections under international humanitarian law, certain rights that we all have, which we in the developed world, we take it for granted. And it's trying to really uphold those standards in countries which have undergone some sort of a trauma. And what I, I want to get from all of you, and I, it doesn't really matter who responds, but how do you feel personally when you try to protect the sick, the wounded, the disabled, civilians, other groups, and you get people like me looking in and saying, well, it's all very well and good, but you're not doing that great a job, really, are you? Because, I mean, this must be incredibly frustrating because there is a lot that is going on behind the scenes. We don't see it, but it is happening. So how do you feel when people say you're falling short in that responsibility to meet those needs under international humanitarian law? So really, whoever wishes to take it on, go for it. Please do. So, if you, so, audience, if you could wear your headsets, those of you who do not speak Arabic. The laws of the countries have a lot of rules for the protection of the children. The laws of the Geneva Convention and the Protocol of the Protocol in 1977, and also the agreement between the Paris Agreement and the agreement of Paris في المؤتمر اللي نظم في فرنسا مع منظمة الأمم المتحدة للطفولة يونيسيف 2007 بالنسبة للأطفال المجندين واعتبارهم فئات تستحق الدعم الموجود وأن يكون هناك استدامة في الدعم أيضا اعتمد مجلس الأمن الدولي 2018 القرار 2427 هذه كلها ترسانة من القرارات ولكن على أرض الواقع ما هو العمل؟ هناك الكثير من الأطفال المجندين سواء في اليمن ولا في السودان ولا في أفريقيا هناك الكثير من الاحتياج لإعادة تأهيل هؤلاء الأطفال المجندين من هنا أرى أنه لابد أن تتكامل كل المنظمات العمل الإنساني وكل المانحين على أن يستثمروا في عملية إعادة تأهيل الأطفال المجندين حتى نكون بالفعل الدين الواجب الإنساني علينا لهؤلاء الفئة لأنهم بالنهاية هم من سيصنعون السلام هم من سيصنعون مستقبل مجتمعاتهم. Thank you, and Rima, please. Yeah, go for it. Thank you very much. As uh, also my colleague here mentioned, the right, the convention. For example, for early childhood development, we have the convention on the rights of the child, who talks about you know children and the, uh, that children should develop and thrive. And most importantly, the convention reaffirmed that the advancement of societies is inevitably linked to the well-being of our children. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child was ratified by all countries of the world. Most countries except one country has not ratified. Also, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. Also, for example, Goal 4 talks about education the importance of education. And it's, for, it's historic because it's for the first time it mentions early childhood development, not only as human development, but as sustainable development. So all, all this is very, it's also linked not only to goal four, but it's, goal, it's also linked to goal five, which is gender development and gender equality. And we mentioned when we empower women and mothers, really, we, it's compatible with SDG 5, which is gender equality. It's also compatible with other goals, for example, goal 16, building peaceful societies. And you know, most importantly, to really implement this, we need, when we go to the field, to listen to the people, to listen to them, because as we, I talk to them and we talk to them. They say we're not only victims. We're not only victims, but we can be agents of change. You know, families and children and women can be agents of change. And we cannot have sustainable development if we don't work with them, if we don't, as all my colleagues say, 
empower them because we know a mother can uh, a mother is the mother who really bring peace to her home but also bring peace to the society it it's reinforces the peace so we cannot have sustainable development only by signing peace agreements it's when we involve people when we involve and all now the the conventions and particularly we have sustainable development goals that were uh, really uh, at the security council at the general assembly and they say we cannot have sustainable development unless we involve youth unless we involve women and now we involve children children are agents of change but what we need is to change policies in the countries we need to change policies and as we have with us here decision makers and uh, we have also government representative of government we have to have policies to have universal early childhood development because this is the beginning and we have to have early childhood development even in crisis because children and families in crisis cannot be left behind okay let's let's take up please go for it go for it thanks i just feel that um i think everybody else is is probably in a lesser under less pressure than i am uh, you know uh, answering the question of responsibility because at the end of the day we are responsible and accountable as government and i just wanted to say that it is very difficult i mean um you know when you're getting these questions about what is not being done and what is not you know and especially now you know we've been in almost six months in uh in uh, government as part of this uh, transitional government and from the very first two weeks we've been had and we've been having people asking you know what why, why isn't change there yet uh, because people have high expectations and um, and they expect that a lot of things can be delivered but when we you know it's it's easier said than done and we can have you know we can sign all these treaties and conventions and and you know mention all these commitments but what does it mean when we're talking i mean in sudan right now we have more than three million children out of school for different reasons whether it's conflict sometimes it's just poverty because they don't have enough uh they can't you know they they, they don't have breakfast they don't have food in the, in, the university, in school so they don't go and sometimes because they need to go and provide for their families and help support so they miss out on school and they miss out on their um on on having a proper childhood and it and it's not and it's not easy when we're talking about a country like mine where we're going through economic crisis when we you know every day think about how are we going to make ends meet as a government and then we're also asked about all these children that are not you know whether we're talking about children or even if i'm talking about you know fragile or crisis i think this is fragile but even crisis situations we're talking about you know um displaced people or um, refugees and what are we doing when it, when it comes to access to services? And then the question is, what do we do when we can't afford to? Mm. But we're still held accountable and responsible, yeah. but we want to try our best by trying to see what, how can we make ends meet with, what, with, what, with whatever we have? You know, how can we have concerted efforts? And I say that the change for us in Sudan is about, it's for the first time after 30 years, we've, we've really inherited a wreck, to be honest after 30 years of, of oppression and repression, but how can we, with the resilience of the youth and, and, the, and the persistence of the people, you know, bring together government, uh, civil society, and private sector to address these issues together, you know, and how can we make the best use of us for the first time having both a political will and a popular will for change, but it's not easy. And we look, when, you know, we look towards and we, and we look, um, for our uh, friends and the international community to, to support us in this change for a more peaceful transition for us in Sudan. An ongoing journey, effectively. An ongoing journey, and it starts here. I mean, I'd like to pick up on, on something that Rima said a few moments ago, and again, I want to throw this open to the panel. It was the word listening, we need to listen. Is this part of the problem that you can go into a country, a community, with, with the best will in the world to, to help people, but sometimes, there is that risk of thinking that you know better what's needed than those who will have to live in that community and they have to live with the aftermath of your decisions. And again, I'm throwing this open to anybody, so whoever wants to jump in, please go for it. Who'd like to take it? Please, go for it. Dr. Habdan. I'm going to talk about the real experience when we مع الأطفال المجندين ومع أسرهم كان في كثير من الفتيات الصغار 
اللي متأثرات من الحرب وليسوا مجندات فكانوا يطالبون أن يكون لهم مكان للتأهيل هذا غير من الخطط الموجودة في مركز الملك سلمان لتأهيل الأطفال المجندين ومتأثرين من النزاع المسلح أن يكون هناك أيضا جزء خاص بالفتيات لأن الفتاة أيضا مثل ما يمكن تحدثوا زملائي في الجلسة هم يتعرضون للكثير من الضغوط والكثير من الضغوط هذه تؤثر على مستقبل حياتهم وحتى رعايتهم لأطفالهم بالنهاية فإحنا من المهم كثير أن نسمع للصوت المستفيد من المهم كثير أن نكون بجانب المستفيد أن نطور وهو معنا وأن نقدم الخدمة برضاه حتى نستطيع أن نصل إلى احتياجه لأن الإنسان يختلف احتياجاته واحدة لكنه يختلف من بيئة البيئة من, من مكان المكان من ظرف إلى ظرف And that's an important point, isn't it? To listen, because if you, you, if you go in there with a set of assumptions, you can actually, I would imagine, create some form of hostility precisely because you're making assumptions about what people need and how it's going to work in, in the long term. Is that a fair observation on my part? Or, I mean, who's, who's experienced this? I mean, who'd like to comment on that? Please, go for it, Nina. Thanks. Um, I just want to emphasize listening. I think when we... We do, you know, a lot of times we don't really listen because there are so many different levels of listening. You know, at best we listen to respond, but are we really listening? And I think there's a lot of local knowledge that we need to tap into because people know best. And, and as um, has been said, that there is no one solution that fits all. Uh, there are differences uh, from one context to another. I remembered one of the um, um, in UNICEF Sudan, they had a very, ex you know, they had a really good experience on um, social innovation and social innovation workshops and skills for, uh, for children as, and, and, you know, and girls and um, young girls and boys in different settings. So in, also in some of, the, uh, some of them are refugees and some of them are IDPs and they came up with these amazing solutions. So it's, it's really about how can we listen and make the, and it's part of the empowerment as well that we, the, we ask them what could the solutions be and then we support having these solutions um, um, take place. And I think, again, when we talk about listening and how it's important for us to learn to listen, because a lot of conflict is because we're not listening. So how, I mean, maybe this is one of the things that we kind of, you know, when we're talking about spaces and we're talking about nurturing these spaces, it's maybe it's, it's spaces where people can listen to each other. Thank you. So, and let's stay with this, this theme of listening before I open things up to the audience, because Dr. Gerg, I mean, I know that in the work that you do, you're effectively saying that when you're supporting education in emergencies, it can't be the sole responsibility of one entity, that everybody has to work together for the common good. So really, this is the power of partnership, finding the right people to work with and also listening to those on the ground. So how do you see that making a difference? More specifically, how, well, when you, when you see that difference, what does it look like in the areas where you're working? Um, look, without partnerships in any context, it's not going to work. And, and, and yesterday we had two panels, they, were, they emphasized on, on partnerships and not working on silos. David Beasley emphasized on it um, a lot. Um, um, the WHO, with the, regardless of the question of the coronavirus, if, if there's no partnership and a collaboration globally on this, it's not going to work by itself. WHO cannot solve the problem. China cannot solve the problem, no one uh, can do. So when it comes to uh, early childhood development, let's say, in, in fragile context, um, I spoke earlier about a, a holistic approach, about an ecosystem that has to be built so we can solve the problem of the early childhood development, and that's also involved with the mother, and uh, Pudmini also mentioned uh, uh, the importance of involvement of the mother, I mentioned it earlier. So building that ecosystem is one, once we have that ecosystem built, now who builds that ecosystem? Is there a framework that we go as a country and we say it's ready and let's come and, and attach it? No, it doesn't exist. So I'll give you two very quick examples. So there's a global fund called Education Cannot Wait. It's a UN fund. It is founded by the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, uh, Mr. Gordon Brown. I'm a co-founder of that as well, and, and, and with, with Gordon and some others, UNICEF, Global Partner for Education, is also uh, part of it. Uh, on the global board, we have a lot of agencies, including UNHCR and some other 
uh, countries as well, uh, uh, donor countries. And, and, and what we look into is education cannot wait has two main missions. One, in any emergency, we all know that education is neglected. That is 100% and every single parameter under education, which includes ECD and women. Everything is neglected because everything goes towards health, nutrition, safety, uh, uh, shelter, and, 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 and so on. I'm not trying to dwarf the importance, but ed education is as much important. So what we do as Education Cannot Wait, which is a UN fund again, we go and we prioritize education. We go and we uh, do collaboration on the ground. We get all the players, the host country, the Ministry of Education, UNHCR, the World Bank. Uh, we get the two main humanitarian, uh, that they, they, they co-chair the humanitarian cluster response globally, which is UNICEF and Save the Children. We get INI. INI is a consortium of 15,000 members from education practitioners to teachers to experts in education. They go to any emergency and based on their framework, which is attested by the United Nations, they assess the education needs in there. That ties into nicely towards education cannot wait and education cannot wait gets all the players in and we go ahead and we set the framework. So I come back to the framework, framework set. Number two, what's the second problem when it comes to um, um, emergencies? There is no money. You go to the powerhouses and you tell them we need money and because of the bureaucratic system, you don't get money. They look into it, they need six months to look into it and they need another six months to take a decision and those are 12 months, so one year have passed. What's good about Education Cannot Wait, it gives you immediate deployment of funds, cash on the ground to get the immediate education response. So that's Education Cannot Wait. Number two, we have Global Partnership for Education, GPE, which has a board of countries and, and, and some um, uh, donor organizations. We were the first ever non-government organization to fund the GPE and uh, we did a few lobbying with the UAE for four years and we managed to get the UAE to be the first ever um, Arab state donor also to uh, the GPE. Um, and, and, and hopefully I have some meetings here in Saudi. I'm, I'm going to lobby for the Saudi government also to join the GPE. Um, what they do is very simple. They are the largest non-government donor towards education globally. They fund ministries of education in lower middle income countries and below and they go into the education sectorial plans and they fund those, which includes a lot of parameters and a lot of uh, competencies as well within their system. So these are the two main things. And, 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 and without the partnership, without the involvement, it would not work. And Juliette, if you would allow me, because my fellow panelists, they were talking about a few things and I want to elaborate a few on, on a few things with regards to inclusivity and women education and disability, if, if I can have two or three more minutes. Sure, and then, uh, yeah, absolutely, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Sure, I know sure. Are certain people who do want to ask some specific questions to you. Sure. Inclusivity and equality is, is very important. And maybe not a lot of people know the importance of it. And let's talk about um, 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 ethnic minorities I have mentioned. In a country that you have a lot of ethnic minorities, you don't give them support, what are you expecting? They're gonna stay quiet, being farmers, sweeping the floors, the streets, they're not gonna stay quiet. One day a problem will happen, it will erupt. That's one. You're gonna go to religion. I'll give you one example of the UAE. We have a ministry of tolerance. We make sure that everyone is equal. Whatever religion, whatever faith you have, and its own sects, Everyone should be equal. My daughters, when they go to school, they're mixed with so many girls and boys with different faiths and religion. They don't speak about religion or anything, but it is the culture, it's the mix, it's the nexus, which is what we're talking about in this forum as well. It's the nexus on how the government puts this as, as equality. That's when it comes to religion. You wanna talk about disability? They get nothing, zero, zilch, in Uganda. We have a program in, 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 in Bosnia, we have another program. We targeted those children, not only the children, 
we built the capacity of the uh, Ministry of Education to have policies for children with disability. And we start at the early years, early childhood. Don't come to a child who's 18 years old and you say, now I will help you, 18 years, and, and, and you're not able to do that, you're handicapped. No, there's no use. You start from the beginning. So we built centers that train, that train teachers to deliver upon these uh, um, 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 uh, specialized training. And Dr. Amal tapped into psychosocial. Psychosocial is so important. Psychosocial and socio-emotional, two different things, but they fall under the same family. That is also important. And I'll just wrap with the last point, which Padmini mentioned earlier, girls' education and the importance of educating the girl child. I just want to take you to a journey right now. Imagine a girl who is not educated, and she grows up. Most probably, 90%, she will not get a job. She will not get an income. She will get married between the age of 14 and 16. That's the average. And she gets children. 90% of those children will not see education because it's the women who take care of the children. It's not us, the men. It's always the women. And because she's not educated, she doesn't know the importance of education, 90% of these children will not get educated. And then the dominant effect, you know what's going to happen in that nation. Of course. Let's take now the mirror side of that. Imagine that same girl gets education, grows up, finishes school, gets a job, gets married, not at her early years, but maybe in her late teens or early 20s, gets married, gets children. You're telling me this educated child who became the educated mother in the future, who got a job and has children, she will not insist that all her children will get education? So what are we talking about? We're talking about we can solve the education problem globally in one or two generations, 10 to 20 years. We can solve the problem. How? Educate the child okay. today. Right. And that's the, the, the girl child. Okay, the girl child. Okay, and this girl, actually, well, I'll defer to this girl, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience, Padmini. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Tariq, for saying that. I just wanted to add, yes, but we need to make sure there's drinking water and separate bathrooms for girls to go to school. Because if you don't have a separate toilet facility, the girl will not be sent to school because of safety reasons. So I think that is in addition to what you said, that's why it's like a three-dimensional puzzle. You're building it up. You need to address these factors, the basic factors. Yes, then you're addressing SDG 3 and you're empowering the girls SDG 5. We can make this change, but it's a multi-sectorial wide approach, where as you said, the private and the public sector, academia, United Nations, everybody comes together, donor organizations, and that's what we all work under the same umbrella because we are working for the same cause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's now time to open this conversation to the audience. Quite a few people want to start. Can I go with this lady here? And I promise we'll get the microphones to you. But if you can stand up, please introduce yourself and the organization you represent. And please put your question to any member of the panel. Sorry, we can't hear you. <laughs> Mic problems, technical problems. <laughs> We're going to get there. Excellent. Please. Uh, hello, everyone. My name, my name is uh, Dr. Reem Al Abdul Wahab. I'm, represent, I'm, I'm working at Princess Noura University, uh, the director of uh, Disability Support Service. As I'm hearing all of you talking about minorities, ethnic minorities, I'm, I'm th thank you, Dr. Tar, for mentioning that. And even other populations where they are, while they are in crisis, if you are not taking care or taking, uh, taking them into your plans, uh, they might be in other groups uh, where they, they might feel that they are not taking care of. One of them is uh, individuals with disabilities. I insist of uh, using individuals other than only children because the whole spectrum is all important. I know early childhood, I'm with you, uh, Mrs. Rima, on the importance of uh, taking account uh, ch early childhood because you're going to solve a lot of problems later on. 
but if we are not taking them into our, our consideration, our programs and measures, as I'm reading in the Convention on the Rights of Individuals with Disabilities, uh, called other old countries to build on their pro programs and measures to protect this population in crisis areas. Yesterday, I was taking a tour in the booth and I was specifically asking for these programs. Is there any program that's taking care of this population? Right, so are, are there programs which are actually meeting the needs of the disabled? D yes, in, uh, in individuals with special needs. Be yes. Sure, sure, yeah. please go uh, on. As the literature said, uh, poverty is a big factor right. plays with individual disabilities. So most of them, they are, they're, uh, they're poor and they're maybe in an area of crisis or in wars they're going to be probably the most vulnerable, like there's like layers upon layer okay. upon layer. Right, okay, so I, th I think we, we can see what you're getting at. So okay. who would like to take that on? Please, Dr. Abdan. أطفال ذوي الإعاقة هم أطفال في في المجتمعات المستقرة يعني عندهم مشاكل ويحتاجون إلى تدخل يعني بكفاءة عالية وبطريقة احترافية ومهنية مركز الملك سلمان يكون دائما في لما يتدخل في مشاريع إما التعليم أو حتى مشاريع الحماية يكون للأطفال ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة من خلال المجموعة حظ فيها ونصيب ولكن بالأمس الحمد لله وقعنا اتفاقية يمكن مع اليونيسيف خاصة فقط للأطفال ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة في لبنان بحيث أنه نقدم لهم كل الخدمات المتكاملة لأنهم من الفئات الضعيفة والتي تحت الظروف النزاع والكوارث يكونون هم الفئات الأكثر يعني استجابة للتأثيرات حتى قد تكون اندماجهم في مج في اجتماع في جماعات أخرى مثل الجماعات المتطرفة أو حتى الجماعات اللي يعني تقوم بالعنف فوجود الكثير من المشاريع في العمل الإنساني للأطفال ذوي الإعاقة جدا مهم ومن المهم أن يكون لنا فيها دور قوي ومن المهم أن نضعهم في 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 يعني في الميزان وليس كجزء من المجتمع ولكن أن نوجه لهم خصيصا هذه البرامج. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I know that quite a few people want to ask some questions. I do apologize because um, there, there are some microphones, but I think because the room is so large, it's very difficult to reach you. But can we, there's a gentleman over there, and there's a gentleman here, so it depends on the, the quick, ah, ah, there's a gentleman over here who has a microphone. We will get to you, but if you could introduce yourself and the name of the organization that you represent, and indeed put your question to a member of the panel. But I promise we will try to get a microphone to everybody else. I do apologize. And now our microphone isn't working. Oh dear. <laughs> Another one is on its way. Reinforcements, even better. Excellent. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name Thank is Stephen you. Sequera from the uh, UN Office of Counterterrorism. I wanted to direct my question to Madam Townsend. Um, the UN uh, Counterterrorism Center uh, was established with a generous grant of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 2011, and we're very uh, aware of this discussion that's been going on. And I also want to thank all of the panelists for a really phenomenal presentation of some of the key issues. If a fraction of the money that's been spent on counterterrorism was spent on some of the issues you were rising, uh, we would make a long, uh, make make a lot of progress. Um, in terms of some of the programming that we're looking at, in term uh, the uh, re the question of returnees, particularly some of the women and children associated with uh, ISIL in the Al Hol and Roj camps, is a key concern for the United Nations and for Secretary General Guterres. And we're now looking at the UN Counterterrorism Center at a number of programs that could help with reintegration and rehabilitation of these children and women in countries that are able and willing to take them back. And we're working with um, all sorts of partner agencies, many of the ones that were here yesterday, to try to bridge the humanitarian development and security divide. So I'd really like to hear from you what types of efforts would be uh, effective and how we could do more uh, together with everybody in this room to uh, try to prevent uh, some of the con uh, situations that will exist if these children and women are not effectively rehabilitated in a more uh, comprehensive manner. Thank you. 
So, so France is counting fees. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has spent an enormous amount of time on the rehabilitation of act the actual terrorists themselves. And, you know, one of the things we've learned, whether it's with criminal recidivists or terrorist recidivists, the, the, the fact is you're never going to be 100% successful. But the fact that you're not going to be 100% successful is not a reason not to do it, right? Because if, you, if you're successful with one, then the program is worth doing. On the women and children, it's different, right? Because you are more likely to be successful. One of the things in, in the child soldier area that so impressed me, you know, we had a whole discussion here about listening. And one of the ways, one of the things we have not talked about is listening to children. I think we, we underestimate the importance of actually listening to children. And one of the ways you do that is giving them paper and crayons. Honestly, I mean, it sounds ridiculously simple, but you give a child a piece of paper and a crayon or a pencil, and you ask them just to draw. And it's a way for them to speak to you and to to actually articulate what their fear and what, what their trauma is. Um, that was my experience. I was a, pro a local prosecutor, um, and when a child was the victim of a sexual assault, you gave them dolls, and it was the way that they articulated their trauma to you. And so I would say to you that when we look at the reintegration of women and children, we have to think of ways of allowing them comfortably to articulate their trauma. It's the first step in any reintegration and rehabilitation process is they have to be able to articulate their trauma so that you can deal with it and you can begin to give them an access to the services that they need, that they require. There is not gonna be one size fits all. And yet, so you have to have an array of services medical, psychological, society, economic, a whole array of services that, a suite of services that will allow them to, to th this reintegration process. I also think you have to allow yourselves the flexibility. It's not, it, it's also not gonna be one size in terms of time, right? It's not gonna take, <clears throat> it may take one person a month, it may take another six months, depending on what their experience has been. And I think we're not very good. We, we have a program that has a particular lifespan. And I think we're not very good at being flexible. And that would be my other piece to this. I think we have to allow ourselves the flexibility to address the individual needs. Okay, and I know that you wanted to respond to that question as well. Yeah. Um, um, we have to look at the uh, current problem and the possible protracted issue that's gonna happen in the future. The current problem, I think we all spoke about it, it is early childhood development, early childhood education, and we start with the child today. This child most probably in these contexts that we're talking about will remain in these contexts for at least 15 to 20 years. So if, you, if we take care of these ch children, if we embed the right messages into the curriculum on what we teach them today, we can avoid a catastrophic issue in the future. So that is given and I think we all agree to that. Let's look into the current problem, which is the youth of today, basically. The youth of today in these contexts, what's happening with them? They're energized, they're spark, they, they wanna be heard. We were young one day as well, we were the same thing. Maybe because we were in normal settings, we had different activities. But this young guy or young girl, they are in a, in a camp, most probably, they're in a war zone, most probably. And, and whenever there's conflict, especially, and especially the geopolitical situation of that area, surrounded by militant groups and, and armed groups, uh, militias, whatever you're gonna call them, they become baits to these organizations. So what we have to give them, we have to empower them. We have to involve them into the community centers that are built into these uh, areas. And if you don't do, they're, they're a ticking bomb. They're a time bomb. They will explode because they go on YouTube and they see what's happening in the world. A Syrian boy who's 17 years old today was about, what, eight years old when the crisis happened? He, was, he didn't understand anything. There were hardly any iPhones at that time. 
The iPhone 1 came out in 2007, but anyways. So, so there was nothing. And then until these apps developed, and those children, the youth of today, they're looking into what's happening in the world, and they're, they're seeing what's happening in the West, in Asia, and the Middle East, everyone is happy, they're going to malls, shopping, exercises, sports, and driving, and racing, and, and doing whatever all people are doing, and they're not doing anything, and sitting there, and we're not providing with a single activity, and they're not heard, and they're not involved into any decision, of course they're going to explode. So that's what we have to tackle. That's today, and the ECD to avoid a future catastrophic issue. Okay, so preemptive action. Now we've got about four minutes left, and I want to squeeze in two other questions. Now, can we give the microphone to this gentleman here in the grey suit? Very, very quickly, please, because time is tight. I do want to, to fit in another question. Please, introduce yourself. Mi microphone problem, I'm afraid. There, working. بداية أود أن أشكر المتحدثين جميعا على ما قدموه لنا لأن هذا الهم الإنسان الذي نعمل فيه فيه منذ سنوات طويلة الحقيقة أنا أود أن أشير أو أوجه الانتمام إلى فئة من الفئات التي نحن بصدد الحديث عنها وهي السيدات الأرامل لعول الأطفال والمطلقات خاصة في حالات ما بعد النزاع المسلح هذه الفئة دكتور طارق تحدث عن أشياء تتعلق بالشراكات اللجنة الإسلامية الهلال الدولي مهتمة بهذه الفئة وتحتاج إلى أنها هناك مشروع أيضا يتعلق بالاهتمام بالسيدات في كسوفا وفي بلدان كثيرة الأطفال اللي يعينوا يحتاج إلى مساعدة ويحتاج إلى اهتمام فما هو البرنامج اللي يمكن نحن قمنا بدراسة تتعلق بهذا الموضوع ونحتاج إلى شراكة بهذا المجال ممكن الدكتور طارق يستطيع أن يفيد الجميع في هذا المجال شكرا متحدث الدكتور okay. محمد العسبلي من اللجنة الإسلامية الهلال الدولي أسف. Thank you so much for that. So very, very briefly, so that we can squeeze in one last question. I'll speak briefly. in Arabic. Sure. Marhaba, Akhi. Shuf, I have seen the conditions. 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 I have seen the أنا أتكلم من آسيا إلى الشرق الأوسط إلى أفريقيا إلى أمريكا اللاتينية جلست معهم كلهم أنا وصلت لين فنزويلا على المشكلة الفنزويلية في كولومبيا يعني لين هناك وصلت وجلست أكثر الناس أكثر الأشخاص أكثر الفئة اللي جلست معها هي الأمهات سواء أخذ رأيهم على الأطفال أو أخذ رأيهم على أوضاعهم هم كنساء وكأمهات سواء أرامل ولا مطلقات ولا زوجات في الحالات هاي احنا ايضا لازم نمكن المرأة وتمكين المرأة في اماكن مثل هاي المرأة ايضا يعني بالها مشغول على ابنها لا في غذاء لا في صحة لا في سكن ولا مأوى نظيف النظافة مش موجودة ودي ما تكلمت عن النظافة ومرافق غسل الأيدي والمرافق الصحية المعزولة بين الأولاد والبنات فأنا بوجهة نظري اللي شفته أن إذا نقدر نشغل المرأة بأكبر قدر مستطاع إحنا بنقدر نحل المشكلة كيف؟ كل مرأة عندها حرفة مهنية فعلق خلنا نمكن ونطور قدراتهم المهنية خياطة بطور الخياطة حرف بطور الحرف والله العظيم رحت مخيم الزعتري رحت في ورش عمل في الـ في الـ في الكوميونيتي سنترز هناك في مخيم الزعتري شفت جيش من الأمهات خياطة 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 قلت لهم شو تسوون في الثياب أنتم في مخيم معزول في آخر الدنيا في في الأردن في 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 الصحراء شو راح تعملون في الخياطة قالت كل بنت راح تتزوج بالمخيم راح تلبس فستان العرس من خياطتنا وهل فساتين يشترونها بمبالغ بسيطه جدا فانت شو قاعد تسوي 
قاعد تطور الذهن قاعد تنسي قاعد قاعد مثل ما تفضلت الدكتورة أمال على سامحني ما أعرف الكلمة بالعربية قاعدة تحل مشكلة السايكو سوشيال السايكو سوشيال مش فقط في الأطفال إذن إذن حتى في ال 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 في في عمر المراهقة وأيضا في العمر الأكبر فتشغلهم فتعطيهم تمكنهم في المهن والشغل والاحتراف في المواضيع فهاي اللي أنا أقدر أشوفه إن كيف نقدر ندخل الأم وأيضا الشيء الثاني إن ندخلها في مراكز المراكز المجتمعية على أساس تكون على أساس الناس يستمعون لما هي تقول تكلمت أيضا لخت بخصوص الموضوع إن لازم تكون المرأة والبنت على الطاولة لازم نتكلم لازم نسمع إحنا ما نريد رجل يجلس على الطاولة يتكلم شو المرأة تريد ما نريد ما نريد ناس كبار بالسن يتكلمون عن المراهقين أو الشباب شو الشباب يريدون لا نريد الشباب على الطاولة فهاي هي Right. Can I, can I jump in? Because again, we have to be very, very quick. But I know that um, again, there are two responses forthcoming to your question. So please, Dr. Habdan and Dr. Sali, I know that you want to respond. Well, who goes first? Who would like to go first? Okay, very, very quickly, please. Uh, I was, yes, uh, yes, as an answer to all the questions, uh, it's starting with early childhood and UNICEF, and UNICEF has, as UNICEF has, uh, community centers, as you mentioned, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 in Ivory Coast in Uganda, uh, after the after the war and after refugees came back, and it involved women and mothers, and empowerment of mothers and bringing so the children are bringing the mothers together, and a, a mother from the. And a mother from the Ivory Coast said, this center has helped me. The services with all the children, talking about inclusion, all children from all groups together, from different fighting groups are together. It has helped me to understand others. And we will not have war anymore. We will not fight each other anymore. We have to take care of the children and go to our fields and we are now secure that we will not have war. I wanted to give this example. Thank you very much. And Dr. Habtam, very briefly, please. يمكن أنا رحت المأرب ورحت اللبنان ورحت خبرتي يمكن أقل من أخوي طارق لكن بالفعل ما ذكروا الأخ طارق فإن الأمهات الأيتام يحتاجون إلى حرفة إلى توعية إحنا عملناها ووجدناها وعملت استدامة في عملية كفالة اليتيم وتعليم هؤلاء الأمهات بالحرف التي يحتاجها السوق في مناطق النزاع اللي موجودة فإحنا ندرس المنطقة إيش تحتاج وإيش عند هذه المرأة من حرفة والأولاد كيف ندخلهم بالتعليم والتوعية والتثقيف زي ما ذكر أخوي طارق ونشتغل معهم عندنا الكثير من البرامج عندنا في سوريا وعندنا في السوريين في لبنان وعندنا حتى في مارب وفي الزعتري وكلها نتائجها رائعة فبالعكس هذه من البرامج ترى الجميلة ولا تكرر في كل مكان Right, thank you very much and sadly time is the enemy and I, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm, I'm so sorry because it's, it's 11 o'clock and unfortunately um, I can't take on any other questions. But I do apologize, sir, because I know that you waved your hand furiously and you wanted to get a microphone to you. So please, 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 I do apologize. I'm so sorry. But look, time is the enemy, but I want to wrap up on a positive note. And these are really the final recommendations that we've gleaned from this panel. First, the increased investment and multi-sectoral support for young children and caregivers in crisis and displacement settings have immediate and lasting impact on the protection and advancement of child rights and the creation of future peaceful and stable societies. Beautifully eloquent. Uh, uh, referred to, in fact, eloquently referred to by our panel. And finally, investment in early childhood is imperative for the fulfillment of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, related obligations, as well as the attainment of multiple sustainable development goals, something I think we can all agree on. Can I thank the panel for their excellent contribution, the passion they brought to the debate, reflected, I think, with the audience that so many people wanted to contribute. Time went against us. So Dr. Rima Salah, His Excellency Dr. Tarek Al-Gurk, Dr. Amal Habdan, 
Dr. Padmina Murthy, the Honourable Francis Townsend, and Lina Ashik Omar Majoub. Thank you so much for your contribution and enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. And if you could please stay with us because there is another panel. And I'm just going to nip over to my perch. If you could stay with us, the stage is about to be cleared to make way for the next debate.
in one minute. Thank you. Can I ask you please to take your seats? The panel are here. The debate will begin very soon. I think my speakers are all here. Yeah. Yeah. The panel is about to begin, so please take your seats now. Thank you. Excellencies, dignitaries, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it's time now for the fourth of our five high-level sessions, the theme of which is evidence-based professional practice in humanitarian intervention. Let me introduce to you the panel. Could you please show your appreciation by welcoming Dominic Heinrich of the World Food Programme, Dr. Erfan Ali, head of the United Nations Human Settlements Programme, Trey Hicks, Director of Food for Peace at USAID, David Harden, who's the Managing Director of the Georgetown Strategy Group. Dr. Mohamed Abdikar, IOM Regional Director for East and Horn of Africa. Dr. Tangina Mercer, the Co-CEO Interim Chief Programs Officer at Plan International Canada. Dr. Hagazi Idris Ibrahim, who's the Regional Program Specialist in Basic Education at UNESCO. And Bogdan Dumitru, IMC Director of International Program. And finally, let me introduce you to the moderator of this panel, Mukesh Kapila, who's Professor of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of Manchester. He also has extensive experience in global health, humanitarian affairs, conflict and security, international development, human rights and diplomacy. He also has qualifications in medicine, public health and development from the, from the universities of Oxford and London. So please, Welcome the panel. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And uh, um, uh, firstly, I'm very, very conscious that we only have one lady in this uh, panel, but I'm comforted by the fact that in the previous panel, we had uh, a predominant of men, uh, sorry, of women. So taking the two together, I think we may be moving towards uh, uh, gender equality because uh, I think gender equality is such an important aspect of our work and everything we do must uh, be guided uh, by that wherever we are. Now, to our topic. This is, uh, session is about evidence-based uh, uh, humanitarian action and innovation. Why is this important? Well, we live in a world of multiple crises multiple fakeries, and multiple panics, if, if you like. So, you know, in a world where we have locusts and plagues, and in this case, a plague of uh, viruses, uh, and do we have uh, floods and droughts and wars and displacements, refugees and, and, uh, and uh, food insecurity, and so on and so forth, it's utterly vital that uh, we keep a cool head, that we only do what is right, and we only do what works. And, and being evidence-based in our work is not just an issue of making better use of our limited resources 
or making the, the dollar go further, but it is a moral duty. Because every time we work in a way that is ineffective, it costs lives. So the reason for having evidence-based action is because it is the best way, it is the only way where we can do the maximum good and we have a moral and ethical responsibility to do that. And our innovation, because we live in a world which is fast changing, where yesterday's solutions are, in, uh, un, are not totally able to solve today's problems, and because we, if we don't find new ways of ad addressing complexity, which is that different risks in different parts of the world are uh, uh, interconnecting, so the sum of two plus two doesn't make four, it makes five. Therefore, we have to actually find ways of uh, countering multiple risks, interconnected risks, and of course, in a globalized, changing, uh, changing world. Now, uh, uh, the, the approach we're going to take in this panel is that uh, we have got one uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dominic Heinrich, from the World Food Program in Rome, who will join us by Skype or video link and will talk to us first. And then subsequently, we will go from uh, in a different in, in order, in relevant order, not necessarily the order in which people are sitting. Uh, and each speaker will have about a couple of minutes to get their core point across. And then I will question them. And then, of course, I hope we will have time for some interactions towards the end. So the audience, my message to the audience is, get your questions ready right now. Otherwise, you know what will happen. We'll run out of time, and then I'll be forced to apologize to you. So, uh, so get your questions in time, get it written, and indeed, if, if they can be passed to the uh, case relief staff, they might even be brought to my early attention. So I can also integrate your questions, even as the panel is speaking, and interrupt the panel to ask those questions. So get ready. But let me start first by welcoming you, Dominic Heinrich, in, uh, in Rome, uh, and uh, uh, where he, you work on, uh, on innovation and uh, evidence-based approaches in, in uh, presumably food security. So I look forward to your remarks. Over to you. Dr. Kapila, thank you very much uh, for the introductions. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Super. Um, I apologize for not being there. I do that out of uh, respect to the audience and uh, I exercise a bit of restraint because I have a cold and, and with the coronavirus, Dr. Kabila, you know better than I, um, it, it's better that I uh, participate throughout the panel uh, from remote. Um, I, I thank you for the introductions and, and uh, um, two points I would like to make on, on evidence-based uh, innovation. Um, one, people-centered, and uh, I, I want to draw on the experience that uh, we had in Lebanon with the fantastic colleagues of uh, UNHCR, with UNICEF, and the World Food Program serving a million refugees there. It was uh, an operation where I had the honor to serve for three years, and uh, <clears throat> it was purely evidence-based. We, we had data on the beneficiaries. We were um, receiving input from shops on what they would be buying through the cash-based transfers. And all of that information allowed for a better programming in real time. So using the evidence of what we were doing in real time, together with all the other colleagues on the ground, in a situation where um, one person out of five in the country was a refugee. This allowed to treat people not only as beneficiaries, but treat them as uh, um, customers, treat them as uh, with, with a dignity that was uh, of a different kind. And uh, sometimes, you know, this, there is a hype on innovation. The term innovation is abused. And uh, basing ourselves on evidence and demonstrating that we're not doing innovation for the innovation's sake, but in service to the hungry poor or to the most affected populations, I think is, is a first cornerstone. The second point I, I wanted to make is in, in WFP, we have embarked in a digital transformation as a priority. And uh, there, if you think of tools like uh, the hunger map um, that harvests from various sources that are public, 
information on food security, on weather, on economic factors, on vulnerability, and in real time provides WFP with uh, the elements for a more modern programming, for a more modern design of its interventions. I think th those are um, elements that uh, simply don't put innovation there, but base ourselves on uh, facts, on uh, um, hard uh, data, and uh, uh, lead us towards data-based uh, decision-making. Uh, the last uh, point on uh, um, evidence-based uh, programming, um, we, in, again, in uh, um, Lebanon, we started a program, uh, at the time we called it di digital food, um, now we call it impact, where um, we taught beneficiaries digital skills, basic digital skills. And we basically uh, created through that the nexus between a humanitarian intervention and a social safety net or um, livelihoods creation. In a, in a, in a world where uh, there is a huge demand for um, digital um, machine learning based uh, um, activities, uh, associating a name to a street, associating a face to a name a million times, and at the same time having in many countries vulnerable people that have um, basic digital skills and, and bringing those to a next level and combining the offer and demand, this type of interventions allowed us to uh, bring uh, tens of thousands of people into the modern labor market. So I wanted to bring you these three examples that are either based on a humanitarian activity or based on the digital transformation and uh, having sophisticated um, methods of uh, uh, data gathering and data-based decision making. And the third one, creating a nexus between humanitarian and uh, development activities through, call it innovation, call it evidence-based, call it modernizing, the way we do the programming, always centered around people. This is something that at the World Food Program and together with other colleagues in the UN system and NGO world and of course host governments, we are passionate about, we are thriving to do every day better than the previous day. And um, I thank you again for having me on this panel. Over. Dominic, thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, I have been watching uh, WFP for many years, uh, initially as a funder, uh, give you a lot of money, plus then various programs. What you say is great. And uh, watching WFP's transformation, WFP is a very important organization as a humanitarian ecosystem. But, and all the examples you gave are great. However, do you have evidence, or are you collecting evidence to say that those activities are making you more efficient and that you are, in a sense, bringing greater nutrition security, food security, to marginalized and vulnerable people around the world? Can you measure them? I'm not saying I need the data now, but it's sense of, uh, uh, as you said, it's a very overhyped word, uh, you know, evidence-based and uh, innovation. Can you prove it that you're making a difference? Dr. Kapila, um, I think we prove it more and more. The, um, you have um, the executive director of WFP now has a dashboard uh, with which he elegantly follows each of our 83 country offices on key data. Those are not all the data, and uh, those key data um, inform how we adjust programs. And uh, it, the cycle of this improvement or this change or the, this um, adaptation of the programs is uh, still um, treasuring processes like evaluations, processes like performance metrics that are based on annual performance reports. But at the same time, the people on the ground, the colleagues, are able to adjust these programs in much uh, tighter iterations. Now, providing then this information to the external world as evidence 
that and in a distilled way, that is our challenge in not leading to a proliferation of endless KPIs that then again lead to confusion, to um, lack of transparency. You mentioned in the opening of, of your, in your opening remarks that you know, there's a lot of fake news and, and uh, um, in, a, in a world where there is a, a surplus of information, um, we internally in our work experience the same. So this is why I am giving you a bit of a, an ambivalent answer. On the one hand, we have a very tight focus on evidence-based decision-making, on data-based decision-making, and providing that evidence of efficiency possibly to the donors and, and to the uh, community in general. On the other hand, we have to have a intelligent and, and very rigorous way of um, identifying those key performance indicators that then allow us to, to have that serenity of decisions as opposed to um, a nebulous and overwhelming amount of information. Thank you Artificial very much. Artificial We'll come back to you, Dominic. Thank, thank but don't go away, stay with us. But I'm very, I'm very glad you brought the last point, and which is possibly the greatest challenge in the humanitarian sector is a crisis in trust and confidence. And I think this is why, this, I cannot think of a more important uh, 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 sort of example, of how do we regain that? so that we can regain the consensus around humanitarian action, which is vital if you have to address the most pro uh, promising, uh, most uh, terrible problems of the age. And to think more about that and other things, I, I have my second uh, uh, distinguished speaker, who is Trey Hicks, who is the director of the USAID Office of Food and uh, Peace. Trey, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, hosting uh, this conference and for moderating this this panel, this is actually a very uh, important priority for the U.S. government writ large, as well as my agency at USAID. Um, I think a common theme that's been coming out of this conference is that the needs and the funding, there's a, a, an increasing gap. The needs are increasing and the funding is just not keeping up with the needs. Um, over 200 million people are affected by some sort of humanitarian crises. Um, 70 million, million people are on the run from these crises. Um, it's, it's, uh, the challenges of today are not the same challenges of when the humanitarian systems were set up decades ago. And I think everyone recognizes that. And at USAID, we take it very seriously, and we're trying to do both structural innovation internally, but we're also trying to tap the innovation of the private sector externally. Internally, um, we're doing such things as um, uh, that we're going through a transformation or a reorganization. And one of the most uh, significant parts of that is we're combining our two separate offices that handle humanitarian assistance. We're combining them and creating a bureau which will elevate humanitarian assistance both within the agency as well as within the U.S. government um, to a higher status. Um, Another thing that we're doing internally is that um, Administrator Green, the Administrator of USAID, has uh, launched an official private sector engagement policy um, where at all levels of the agency, both in development and in humanitarian assistance, um, we are trying to find better solutions to the problems and the challenges of today by engaging more with the private sector. And frankly, you, governments in general are pretty horrible at finding new solutions. We're not the place you go when you want to find innovation and solutions. And we recognize that as, as the U.S. government, which is why we are pushing so hard to tap into the private sector. They have better solutions. There's better technology. There's better networks. There's better data. Um, there's just better solutions in the private sector. Um, so on, um, in one respect, we're, we're seeking greater collaboration with the private sector with design and implementation of our programs. Um, we have a, uh, a new um, donor policy where we're trying to bring in new, do um, not donors, new uh, uh, partners that aren't traditional um, USAID implementing partners that we're trying to expand our base within the private sector. Um, so that's one aspect internally, but we're also trying to engage even more externally 
Um, and one example is the, grant, the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. And it's something that's only been around for a couple of years, but in partnership with uh, the United Kingdom, Netherlands, and Canada, we have been, um, we, are, we, we have this grand challenge. And what we do is we put a set of problems out into the community, to the private sector, and say, here are a set of problems, um, whether it's access problems, whether it's delivery problems, um, whether it's sectoral-based problems, and we're, we're asking the private sector to pitch their ideas to us on how to, how to meet those challenges. And we take the top innovations, we fund it, we pilot it, and if the evidence comes back and shows that we're actually solving those problems, then we grow and expand those solutions and we pepper it into all of our programming. Um, and it's something we're really excited about. Um, we've only been a, f a few years. We've had about 1,500 applications from 86 different countries, um, and we're really excited about it, and we're already seeing the fruits of this um, being integrated into our programming, and, and the evidence has shown we are being more effective in our ability to meet these humanitarian challenges in the field. Great, thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, let me press you a little bit. I mean, you are a funder. And uh, uh, the examples you gave indicate that you're seriously thinking of how you can fund better and achieve greater impact and help your partners better. How do you, but thinking a little bit more broadly about your fellow donors, uh, a job that I used to do at one, one time, do you think that collectively the funders who, without whom I think we would not be able to pay the bills or the billions of dollars, are they really serious about this? Because what we see is very often very traditional approaches, project documents, very elaborate bureaucratic processes. I'm sure that a significant proportion of staff of the, of the receiving agencies, whether international organizations or NGOs, they, they, they are spending on writing reports and finding bureaucratic uh, solutions. Uh, how, uh, tell us whether or not we're actually seeing an, a kind of innovation movement going on in the funding community and how much uh, we can challenge them because you know for the receivers often they are at the receiving end it's not an equal power relationship but those who give money and those who receive money they are not on an equal relationship how can one we equalize that or the mutual respect and how can we actually make sure that the funders are held accountable for modernizing their practices which is a, a, a problem. And I'm not, I'm not speaking about USAID. I'm wanting you to reflect generally on the funding environment. So uh, I think that's a really good set of questions. Um, I, I think it all goes back to a couple of points. Number one, the challenges of today are not the same challenges when the humanitarian system was put in place. And number two, donors, AKA government, are really horrible at coming up with with good solutions and innovative solutions. Um, I think it's just gonna take time um, for USAID and, and other uh, like-minded partners. Our business model, um, we don't just write a check and walk away. We projectize, we go from project to project, we look at the evidence, we look at the data, we look at the proposal, we have technical um, staff on board to see whether it passes the smell test. Um, and we take it very seriously that we wanna make sure that our funding is targeted to the most vulnerable, and it's actually getting results. Um, you can't do that if, you're, if your business model is to write a check and walk away. Um, and I think that that is the direction that um, we're finding more and more donors. Um, for example, even the, the, um, the organization that's hosting this conference, KS Relief, they have a similar business model where it's data-driven, where there's accountability, where there's transparency. Those things demand innovation. If you have transparency and accountability and you're not getting results, you're gonna demand new solutions. So I think if having a more of a demand-driven approach or business model is going to be moving the community towards more of a innovative type of solution because again, the systems that were created that are currently in place are not meeting today's challenges and we need to find new, better ways to do it. Great, thank you very much indeed. Let me just uh, say to the audience, after the next speaker, I will invite one comment or question from the audience. So if you want to speak, uh, get ready. Otherwise, we'll just uh, uh, carry on. And also, by the way, there are some free business class seats at the front. 
So no, no charge for coming and sitting here. So if people at the back want to come forward, especially young people and, uh, and such like, then don't be shy. Let me turn now to our third speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ghazi Idris Ibrahim, who is uh, a program specialist, I think, with UNESCO yes. uh, in education. Yes. Please. Yes. Just uh, I want to share with you actually uh, three programs uh, running by UNESCO. Uh, I am in UNESCO regional office in Beirut, which is responsible for education in Arab states. So I want to get you back to the perspective of what's going on in the region without you know, going to the details. We all know what's going on. Uh, we work heavily actually in uh, Lebanon as a host country, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya. So there's the three programs that we are focusing, which uh, can be uh, evidence-based and best practices. Uh, what we call in development is building resilient uh, education system. And what we are doing in this, uh, supporting these countries uh, to build um, MS system and to include their national MS system with MS system just targeting uh, refugees. And we are doing um, a transition education plan, and here uh, we have His Excellency, the Minister of Education in Yemen, and we are supporting uh, Yemeni to develop their, uh, what we call TIP, transition education plan, which is a roadmap for them uh, to how they can work on, uh, uh, with the children, education, what are the problems, what are the challenges, and what are the suggested solutions. Our main program actually is what we call catch-up program. Uh, you can call it ALB, you can call it bridging. So uh, the diversifying the delivery of education, in particular uh, aiming to reintegrate uh, children who are out of school in, a in, 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 in these countries or in host countries. And uh, we start usually with what we call uh, a framework. We build a framework with the country. We have finished actually three frameworks with Lebanon, with Syria, and with Yemen, and launched uh, by the ministers of uh, these countries. And in order to let them understand what does it mean to, to cater for non-formal education and how non-formal education can be uh, recognized and validated and accredited by uh, the country in order to pave the road for to establish a catch-up program. Actually, with the help of King Salman in, in the, with the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, we have a, a successful program, uh, very close to what we call informal in, uh, installment uh, camps, and this has helped thousands of children to get back to schooling, and it is what we call King Salman and UNESCO schools, uh, three schools now we have in uh, area in Bika. In Yemen, we have a big program coming, and we have the, new, the minister will come to Beirut in order to uh, uh, yeah, put a plan to get uh, a strategy for Yemen in order to get millions of children to come back to schooling through catch a program. We finalize with them the TIB, we finalize with them the framework. Now is the time that we can come to, up together and uh, try to work uh, in order really to establish, to socialize a uh, catch-up program in order to really uh, uh, develop several kinds of pathways. Community schools, some are going to be second chance, some are going to be a retention program for uh, the children in order to let them to continue their education. Uh, our third program is actually about psychosocial. We, I think we hear Dan, from yesterday and today a lot about the importance of psychosocial uh, uh, education and social emotional learning for the children. Uh, uh, what we are doing in, in, in these countries, we, uh, we have a back in uh, training back for teachers at regional level, but we develop actually at the country level a booklet for the teachers uh, in order to understand psychosocial. We don't want the teacher to be a psychiatrist, but at least we want the teacher to know the situation, the, the trauma that the children are facing, and to be aware and to uh, 
uh, do some kind of, uh, uh, to listen to the children, to use extracurricular activities as one way of relieving the uh, pressure. So there are many kinds of programs, maybe in, later I can, I, can, I can just give some more detail. Thank you uh, very, very much indeed. Uh, I mean, you work in a very tough uh, neighborhood where uh, I think uh, sometimes wars appear hopeless and suddenly they go on for a very, very long time. Yes. And yet the purpose of education, as I see it, is uh, uh, to be resilient, but resilience is not just in the present, how to survive a conflict, whether it's Yemen or Syria or uh, anywhere yes. in the world. But how to actually prepare for the future? I must tell you uh, my own profound little experience. I was uh, uh, a year or two ago in, uh, in the Beka Valley in Lebanon, talking to Syrian refugees there. And I met this uh, uh, grandmother who had rescued her 10 grandchildren. Uh, she had lost other members of her family. And, uh, and, uh, and so, you know what she told me? That she wanted her 10 grandchildren, um, and she had plans for all of them. This one is going to be an engineer. That one is going to be a doctor. That one is going to be an architect. So she was very busy planning for the future. Yes. And she had absolutely no doubt that future was going, going to come. Yes. And that her children were going to be uh, the future. And that taught me a profound lesson on the importance of education in terms of mental resilience and to keep, uh, keep uh, hope uh, 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 alive. Let me um, just pause there. And uh, as I said earlier, is there anyone out there with a burning point of view? Yes, sir, right here. Uh, quickly, please bring the microphone or whatever to the gentleman here at the front. Run. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, very important, uh, I would say, topic uh, to be discussed today. Uh, I would give my opinion regarding evidence-based professional practice in humanitarian intervention. I think, I think our practice is, is too far away from evidence-based uh, work. Actually, what we see is scattered work, uh, probably some experiences uh, here and there, trying to uh, read their data and build sort of evidence-based uh, work. Uh, what I would say that I think we need society or institution that really uh, is aim and objective to build evidence-based professional practices in humanitarian intervention, like other specialty, like in medicine, like in dentistry and other profession. I don't see right now any society or an institute really devoted for this kind of work. I think there is a basic things could be done in that area, for example, uh, building a standard reporting in area of data, for example. Uh, we don't see a standard uh, uniform data reporting in, in, in different projects, actually. The data reporting is very confusing sometimes, and this is the first step, actually, to build sort of good analysis uh, for the data, and then you can go and build your evidences and build your practices upon, upon this. I think uh, also uh, the reporting sometimes by itself is sort of, uh, shall we say, uh, very def defective. Uh, sometimes you see some reports that is totally non-scientific actually. Uh, some of the agencies would like to keep their data for, for their own selves, uh, selves, you know. They don't share data with other, others. I think uh, reporting data in very scientific way, sharing data, analysis of data probably is, shall we say, the first step to build this kind of practices. But at the end, I would say we need an institute, an institute or society actually, to work together with all the organization to build this kind of practices, which we really we are in need right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for raising a very practical point. And I hope KS Relief will uh, kind of take a lead also in this, uh, in, in the, in this area. Let's come back to that very important uh, follow-on point. Let me turn next to uh, Arfan Ali, who is uh, uh, in the UN Human Settlements uh, Program. Thank you so much. 
I represent the United Nations and Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat, which is the organization responsible on urban areas and cities in the system, advocating together with other organizations for the implementation of SDG 11 and other relevant urban indicators under the different SDGs, knowing that more than two thirds of the SDGs have urban indicators or urban components. Um, the point that I want to address related to our region, related because I work for the Arab region, for this region, and uh, this region is facing huge challenges. Since, since 2011, conflicts in the Arab region have severely affected the cities in, in our region. This has resulted in huge human and financial losses, uh, uh, um, unprecedented destruction of infrastructure, uh, uh, housing, unprecedented also displacement into, into our cities and uh, uh, our urban areas. Municipal, municipal basic services in the region, in our cities in, in, in the Arab region have often broken, broken down, leading to, to interruption or disruption of, of the delivery of the basic services. Furthermore, in, in all, in most of these cities, conditions leading up to, to, to the conflict in our cities, uh, such as poverty, informal settlement, or unequal access to, to services in these cities have exacerbated the, 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 the impact of the conflict in, in our region. So through our work, through our role as, as a humanitarian and development agency at the, in, the UN, in the UN system, we have identified five main uh, uh, challenges uh, encountering us in, in the region. Uh, uh, with regard to our response in the urban in the urban context, first we are talking about non-functional municipal structure. This non-functional municipal structure creates uh, creates information gap in in, in, in to, to, to respond to to to, uh, to the needs. As the main processes for managing basic services have broken down, there is very little information coming out from from the government partners to, uh, uh, on, on the cities. And this, made, this makes it very difficult also for, for, uh, uh, for anyone initiating, initiating uh, projects, projects with, uh, uh, or, uh, that have sense, projects that do no harm, projects that have uh, best results for, uh, uh, for the response. Second, due to these uh, constraints, recovery and reconstruction later have happen at, at later stage or an, and also on an ad hoc uh, basis. It is difficult, it's very difficult for donors to identify the best ways to, to support on recovery and later on reconstruction. Because uh, as, as intervening in, um, in cities is not, as, is not as clear cut as intervening in the rural uh, areas. Uh, also, as mentioned, in, in almost all cities affected by, uh, by conflicts, there are, there are also long-term challenges such as uh, poverty, uh, uh, poor urban growth management, and unequal access to, to services such as housing. So uh, this, made, uh, this, made, uh, this is made worse during the conflict. And uh, uh, for, example, uh, for example, in areas where we have large uh, damage or destruction on the housing sector, and at the same time, this, this area where we had already uh, previously uh, uh, shortage in the housing, uh, uh, housing delivery or the housing stock, this, this is an, another cause for enduring conflict in these cities or in these uh, areas. Also, fourth, the coordination, coordination mechanisms and platforms focus mainly on a humanitarian response. These responses often, uh, uh, often have difficulties to appreciate the cities and neighborhood uh, scale as they are not uh, they are not designed to address response at uh, uh, or to coordinate response at this scale. But uh, or uh, how, however, the, our uh, the, the lived experience uh, experience of people is on the neighborhood is on the neighborhood level. So in order to return, in order to for for people to return to their cities and their no neighborhoods. IDPs or migrants or, or uh, uh, refugees, they are in dire need for a coherent response on this level that can address multiple, multiple sectors. 
So this is the, these are the challenges that we uh, uh, wanted to, to highlight and to address the, uh, 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 the, the, the next point on the innovative uh, uh, tool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Erfan. I think you make uh, a very uh, good point. Today, most people live in cities. Today, it is in the cities that, that uh, I think uh, wars are often decided. And it's very, very important to increase the resilience of urban populations so that they can actually uh, survive the particular forms of damage that take place in urban areas. So my question for you is, it's one thing to uh, kind of rebuild and reconstruct uh, and all those kind of things. But you know, in the, in, the, in the building profession, things take years and decades. You can destroy in minutes, but it'll take decades to re rebuild. What can you do in innovation terms to help people cope with living in the ruins of cities, even, even as destruction is taking place, and even, even if you're in the recovery phase, but it's going to take a lot of capital investment and a lot of urban infrastructure renewal, but people have to live. They have to live in the present, not in the future. Any ideas, innovative ideas? <coughs> Actually, it's very, it's very difficult to, to, to talk about innovative ideas uh, without showing things, without the visual help. So we, I should be innovative in explaining what are we doing to respond to, this, uh, to these challenges. So um, we try to, to uh, uh, develop an, 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 a new tool in, to help uh, uh, to respond to the needs in, in the urban context. So we developed what we call the urban profiling methodology. This, this methodology is planned to, to respond uh, uh, to enduring conflict in the, urban, in the urban areas, in the urban context. So to, to, address, uh, uh, to address the recovery, the urban recovery uh, needs using a three-pronged approach that consists of uh, analysis, monitoring, and planning for uh, uh, recovery. The urban profiling is a tool that, that provides the initial, initial analysis in this, uh, in this approach, which is followed by uh, monitoring through data platforms and to be complemented by comprehensive planning to help on the recovery of the damaged or destroyed uh, uh, areas. Um, so the urban profiling is a collaborative uh, process for, for collecting and analyzing data uh, on the conditions of the urban context and the, the neighborhood. Uh, it creates baseline, creates the, the, the baseline on the current urban context, providing insights on the, um, on the impact, on, or on the high impact of the conflict on the, uh, uh, on the, on the lives of people. Uh, help, it helps also to identify high impact interventions uh, that can accelerate the urban uh, recovery. In this region, we worked on in seven countries to produce the urban profile, uh, pro, the urban uh, uh, profile using the, the, the mentioned methodology, the three-pronged uh, uh, approach. Uh, the main component, the main component of the um, uh, of this is the common analysis framework, covering seven main seven main uh, uh, urban pillars, uh, uh, um, including uh, housing. Uh, uh, infrastructure, basic services, economy, governance, civil society, uh, environment, and uh, uh, cultural heritage. We analyze these pillars through a combination of literature review, consultation workshops, remote sensing tools, data collect, and data collection through, for example, key informant uh, interviews. Um, consultations also are extremely important in the process for the verification of the different products. So uh, I, I had prepared many examples to present from, uh, from Mosul when we developed the uh, 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 Mosul city in Iraq, when we developed the damage assessment using a drone and uh, remote sensing tool, then we did the consultation in order to, provide, to produce and to, to uh, the, the verified uh, um, damage maps and to make it available on the Mosul data uh, portal. Also consultation are extremely important to gain insights on the, uh, on the population movement because this was the population movement in the, in, the, in the urban conflict are mainly known to, to, to locals, so we have identified the movement of the people uh, uh, um, in the context of Musa that led, that led to the takeover in 2014 by, by I still have other examples I can return to these Thank examples you. in yeah. this context. Thanks a lot, very informative. 
Let me turn next to uh, Dr. Tanya, how do you pronounce it? Tanya. Tanya Mirza, who Tangina. is from uh, Tan Tanina. Tangina. Tangina. Tangina Mirza, who is uh, from uh, Flan, Canada. I thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank His Excellency for a very timely uh, humanitarian forum. And especially the organizers and Dr. Amal, I want to thank you for organizing a session on evidence and research. It's really a huge gap. And sir, you mentioned it earlier as well, the gap in research and evidence in humanitarian uh, sphere is enormous. So my big thanks to you. Uh, for my um, topic, I wanted to highlight a very special subgroup of population in humanitarian crisis that's not been addressed. Yesterday, we talked about youth bulge. The world has the largest cohort of young people entering in this world. It's the largest ever in humankind. Half of those youth are girls, are adolescents. Yet, very little study, very little literature, very little is said about the adolescent girls in crisis. And there are about more than 40 million of such girls who are in this space right now. So Plan International, we work with children, we work with girls and youth, and especially with adolescent girls. We decided to conduct a study about what are the special vulnerabilities, what are their experiences, what are the risks, and what can we do about it. So a study was conducted last two years in three crisis areas. Number one, uh, Lake Chad Basin, so the Sahel region. Number two, the South Sudanese refugees crisis uh, spilling over to uh, Uganda and Ethiopia. And thirdly, the Rohingya crisis of the Rohingyas coming in Bangladesh. So this study was a very well-structured study, uh, quantitative data as well as qualitatively and talking with the girls themselves to understand what are their risks, what are the problems and challenges, and what do they want to do? So I want to point a couple of key results from this study. Number one, there's a lot of fear among the girls in this age group. They are neglected because of the three vulnerabilities they face. First of all, they're female, they're young, and they're highly vulnerable to gender-based violence, to early forced marriage, to trafficking, exploitation, sexual and physical violence, and of course, being married off at very early age and then becoming pregnant as adolescent girls as young as 13. And we all know that adolescent motherhood has high death risk among these girls. So the first question that we ask, what are the challenges? The biggest challenge the girls notified is that they cannot go to school. Only 0.1% of the Rohingya girls were studying, 0.1%. Similar in the Sahel region and in South Sudanese refugees, majority of these girls are totally illiterate. So, and this is the reality of the picture. They're frightened, they stay within their homes, and their parents become overprotective because they're scared of sexual and physical violence. They're isolated, they stay home. Yet, almost all of them want to study, and I think you also highlighted, Dr. Mukesh, that there's an aspiration that they would like to continue the studies. The third point that came out of this study is that isolation and fear, it, there's a total loss of agency. These girls feel lack of empowerment, lack of agency, lack of decision making. As a result, they're very vulnerable within their communities. Almost 40% of these girls actually witness violence right in their homes. So not only outside in the camps or in the cities of where they live, but right in the homes, physical violence, sexual violence. In all of these three areas, early marriage is a very norm in almost all of these three regions of crisis. But in the refugee setup, in crisis setup, the whole issue of early forced marriage is highly exacerbated. And it, it makes sense for the parents because there's one less mouth to feed, there's one less headache for a girl to worry about. So I don't want to leave, uh, uh, conclude without giving some positivity. 
these girls can be hugely powerful. We talked in the last session about the change in breaking the cycle of poverty and marginalization. It's girls' education. If the girls can be kept in schools and studied, not only they become empowered themselves, they're em empowering their communities and families. And demographic studies in previously have shown that if there's one variable that can break the intergenerational cycle of poverty and violence, it's girls' education. So keeping the girls in refugee crisis situation, girls in school, is not only really important for her, but they are our champions of change and future leader. So I don't want to conclude as a making these girls just victim. They are powerful and huge champions of change in breaking the intergenerational cycle of violence and poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tangina. This is a, a very critical uh, topic. Now, I've got two challenging questions for you. Uh, not one, which is, you know, men are weaker, so they only got one question each. Women are stronger, they get two questions. My first uh, question is, you're surrounded by men here on this panel and elsewhere, I'm afraid, if we're still that kind of society globally. Women talking about the problems of women and girls isn't necessarily going to sort what is a human problem for the whole of humanity. So what do you want to say to the men in this room and the men beyond? What is their role in this and how can they do it innovatively and effectively? Number two, it needed an adolescent girl called Greta to suddenly disrupt the world on climate change and all the strikes that are going on. Now, you said at the end that uh, adolescent girls can be powerful. I don't see that. I don't see the adolescent girls being, being powerful in practice. It's a good to have that aspiration. When are we going to see more voices of the adolescent girls themselves? Now, I'm not advocating that they should all strike from school and start agitating on, on the streets, but maybe that is what is going to be, re going to be required. I don't know. So, Push yourself a little bit more and tell us what can men do and two, how can we actually empower uh, girls to find their voices and project it across the world? I didn't expect easy questions from you. So thank you for that question. Um, I think there is, um, I shouldn't say lack of understanding, but not an accurate understanding of what gender means. Gender is not just about girls and women. Gender is about balance between men and women, girls and boys, young boys and young men. So I just wanted to get that clear. And Plan International has done, is we, we do a lot of work on gender empowerment. And the last four or five years, we have invested heavily in engaging young men, young boys, and what we call champions of change model. This is not about girls only. When we are talking about empowerment of girls and women, men are equally at stake. It's not, just econ it's not just a social issue, it's the right thing to do economically. And places and studies where we have said, seen that men are engaged. Men means starting from young boys on masculinity, on social cohesion, etc. These are the engagement of men that are needed, not only for families and individual and community, but as well as society. We have so many examples of fathers' clubs, male engagement, boy, young champions of change, where men are equally invested in this. It's not about men or women or girls or boys separately. So I want that leave the message very clearly that the whole gender studies is now looking at male engagement with much more important. So it's not about us and them, it's how do we work together to empower both sides. And we have studies where the entire gender programming targeting adolescent girls was targeting young boys. And those 
traditional cultures where we have talked with religious leaders who often are men, religious village elders who are men, and, and household where father or the husband or the brother is the decision making. Those top programs that targeted the men had the highest, better outcome and results for gender empowerment. So I wanted to get that across. Thank you. Thank you and very much. The uh, second question you asked me. Oh yes, yeah. Yes, you had a double question for me. Uh, the second question is, how do we empower adolescent girls? There's um, enough evidence to say you don't need to go to strike. Yes, I really respect the environmental movement now, but the young girls we are talking about in Sahel, in Rohingya crisis, in all of this programming, even in South Ugandan refugees, we have seen that when adolescent girls are given the safe space, safe places to study and talk, they are amazing, powerful voices. So you don't need to go to the streets. These are ill-bent in our programming. They're not just planned international programs. There are many other agencies who are in building the uh, voices of girls and women. And this whole study was about the voices of girls. Yes, you are right. There's not enough of those studies. We are actually embarking a new study in Mali in the, for girls' education and uh, funded by Dubai Cares and INE. Uh, with the university to showcase what is actually happening to girls' empowerment. What are the trajectory of girls' empowerment and how can we give voice? So this will be a very good studies, but you're right, there's not enough evidence to showcase how exactly should be done their pilot studies. I would love at the end of this conference that we commit to adolescent girls and learn and decide how to scale it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing out uh, the point that there are many ways of doing empowerment. Uh, and uh, empowerment has to be culture specific. And there are many ways of doing innovation. And innovation is also culture specific. There isn't one method. However, at the same time, all these different cultures have to be empowered to address a common challenge in their own ways and to be able to connect across each other. And this is where evidence and so on comes in. Now, before I turn to my next speaker, again, I, after the next speaker, the floor will be open for one person who wants to say something, that gentleman in the front, but uh, any ladies are also welcome to speak. Um, so uh, get ready and get the microphone. My next uh, speaker is uh, David Harden, who is the managing director of the Georgetown Strategy Group. David, it must be a great thing to come in the morning, sit at the desk and strategize. So, uh, so uh, I'd love a job like that. Uh, so uh, tell us, uh, how are you working for uh, uh, better strategies, more innovative strategies, uh, for uh, more effective practice in the humanitarian sphere? Thank you. <clears throat> the audience, I have a quick question for you. Do you remember in March of 2018 when Elon Musk shot the rocket up in the air and brought it back down on the, on the pad? Do you remember that? It was a stunning, iconic moment. And uh, I was in government at that point. I was in Jeddah at the Yemen Affairs Unit looking at the Yemen crisis. And it was at that moment I decided to quit government. So Elon Musk was doing space. Space is government work. Space is publicly funded. And yet, he was doing all of this privately. And I decided that I wanted to disrupt the humanitarian system, because I think, actually, the, this, the humanitarian system is a dinosaur. I think it will be slayed, like every other industry in the last 50 years. I think it will be dramatically different in the next decade. You know, we sit around, and I became an entrepreneur. I have a tech team in Ramallah, and I'm building uh, products and applications that are designed for this space. But why do I say that the humanitarian system is antiquated, obsolete? I mean, I was in government for 22 years. I know the UN system. I know the World Bank system. I, I ran billions of dollars for USAID. 
And now as a private sector entrepreneur, I find it impossibly difficult to break through the regulations, the procurement process, the slowness. The government, the, the donors, they tend to buy process and projects. They don't buy results. They don't buy outcomes. They may get outcomes, but they're not buying results. And that's not what the future is going to be. So, so I decided that, uh, that the future is going to be run by entrepreneurs who can take these problems and produce the results in a way that will be more efficient and more impactful than the current big donor structure. And lastly, I'll just point out that with the advent of uh, decentralized technology and the massive rise of private capital, that's, a, that's something that's completely missing in this, in this uh, current humanitarian structure. Nobody here represents private capital. But when you get private capital aligned with talent and markets and skills and context, you can provide the results that will make a difference in Yemen or Syria or elsewhere in the world. Great. Thank you very much. So t tell me, what's the incentive? I mean, uh, you know, it's great to disrupt, but the disruptee, you know, which is uh, basically organizations and individuals who are having a very nice life, thank you very much. Things have been working quite well for them uh, as an institution or as individuals for the last uh, kind of lifetime. Uh, and I, spend, I speak as a person who's been in this business for 30 years. Well, I hope I still remain disruptive despite having uh, um, gray hair. But what I have learned is that actually the incentives are not there to be innovative and disruptive. And if you become in disruptive and innovative, then you're on your way out. So I don't know what kind of strategizing you have in terms of empowering the change makers through the processes of, uh, in a sense, policy making, strategizing, partnership building, getting, getting uh, private capital and public capital together in a way that is a win-win for all. Yes, that's a great point. So we have WFP here. How much would WFP pay to minimize the diversion of food aid in Yemen? Okay, so just take for a second, 30% of all food aid would be diverted. What if I could provide a solution that would reduce that from 30% to 10%? And what if that solution cost you 2%? Would WFP be interested? Would Trey Hicks be interested? Because Trey represents the American taxpayers. The American taxpayers don't want to have food diverted into bad actors' hands. And if I could convince Trey that I have a product that would make a difference, I think Trey would be interested as well. And you know what? The profit margin in all of this isn't a bad thing. The profit margin will fuel the innovation and the impact that could be transformative. So I don't make any bones about the fact that Look, I have, I have venture capital investors. At the end of the day, they want a, a result. And that means a monthly result, a quarterly result, a yearly result. And that means that if I can deliver a product to WFP that will reduce diversion from 30% to 10%, they would be interested in doing that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, one or two comments, please, sir. Dr. Kapila. Uh, yeah. May I come in as WFP? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, why don't you speak first, Dominic, while we get the microphone to the person in the audience. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you uh, so Dr. much. Dr. Kapila, you are moderating and you're steering this so elegantly. And I thank the gentleman in the audience that challenged the, the practices on evidence-based programming and now the entrepreneur here um, challenging and, and you said it, Dr. Kapila, when you innovate too much, you're probably already outside. And if you see my banner there in the back, uh, Innovation Accelerator, we wanted to create that space where venture capitalists, where research centers, where UN agencies, where the private sector, they come together and solve exactly the issues 
that the gentleman was raising so that we do not have the diversion, so that we do not have the complacency, so that we serve at best. We're not there yet, but 10 days ago, I was sitting in a room with a venture capitalist. He was talking about the, the wealth that you were describing, you know, trillions in wealth by um, in the private sector that through evidence-based interventions can lead to profit for them and uh, solutions for affected populations. I think we are on that journey. Um, the accelerator is only one of the things. We super treasure the work that we have done with USAID on humanitarian grand challenge. Um, probably we have a huge defect. We're not telling the story enough. So I will take from this panel here um, a commitment of working better and, and informing the public much more about the journey that we're doing. We're not at the levels that uh, the medical sector, the, uh, the, the health sector is, but certainly we're not at the complacency um, humanitarian um, public sector only. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for that uh, good uh, uh, reminder and for stooping to us. By the way, I'm very struck by a very good connection with Rome. It's good. I feel you're here in the room because usually my experience of these events is that the link breaks and we can't hear. So my compliments to the technical team both in Rome and in Riyadh to keep, Thank us, you. keep us on the same, uh, on the same wavelength. I think certainly we had... with the heart I am in the room. <laughs> yes, that's right. So I think the gentleman here wanted to uh, say something. Uh, thank you very much. Odd lady. Where are they? Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. I am Milati Mustafa from um, Case Relief in Monitoring and Evaluation Department. Yeah. Actually, I want to focus on this evidence-based humanitarian intervention, some challenges at micro level. The first of all, you know, if we go for any evidence-based intervention, what we need is data, qualitative and quantitative both. For the qualitative data, we need some smart indicators. But the big challenges that we face, and I'm sure if any I mean, specialists are here, they will also agree with me, is for the implementing, implementing partners, we have seen for the same type of project, in, even in the same area or different areas, they are using different types of indicators for the same type of project, first thing. Second is, even they are very reluctant to share some of the information with the donors because they said it is just like confidentiality, this and that, right? So when we just try to collect the data, we have to either trust on their presentation, we don't have any access to their documentations where we can just verify the data or the data quality, this is first thing. And then, for this evidence-based, I mean, as I said, this qualitative, quantitative data, we cannot maintain any standard. Because for the same type of project, we are getting uh, the data from, I mean, on, on different indicators. Okay. Actually, I had a chance to work for USAID in uh, three country, uh, two countries in Bangladesh and uh, in DRC in a platform project. What I found, they have got the best system uh, First of all, they have got their own performance management system where they have got some standard indicators. Any IP or implementing partner wanted to implement any particular project, they have to select the indicator from their list, standard indicators. They can have their own you know, custom indicators, no problem. So at Case Relief now, we are trying to establish some sort of things like that so that all our partners Whoever they just you know um, implement any project in a particular um, just sector, they have to select some of our, our core indicators, and they can have their own indicator. We don't mind. Now, second thing is regarding the innovation. I think you know there are lots of innovations happening in the field by the IPs themselves. They have their own system of research, own sort of even applied research with the universities and others, but. The big challenge is <laughs> these are not shared at appropriate level. They have their own sharing mechanism within the organization, but if we consider among the organizations, there is still, we find it missing. Like we need a learning platform where we can share inter-agency experiences so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. 
So this is my comments, and if anybody can just thank you. put in, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, especially I think those were very real and very practical examples. And I think one of the outcomes we want from this is to how to set up a system. I mean, I'm a little bit depressed because in 2016, uh, I was a special advisor to the UN for the World Humanitarian Summit, the world's first World Humanitarian Summit. And I remember discussing these issues and sessions and so on we had, and this is now three, four years ago, right? So in that sense, I think we really need to accelerate action in this particular uh, area and go away from here with some, uh, uh, not just awareness, but with a new, uh, new resolve. Let me turn now to our uh, final uh, couple of uh, speakers. So, uh, and uh, we have here then, uh, where is my list of here, yeah. So, uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Abdika, you are in, um, in IOM, in the office in, uh, in Nairobi. So, tell us. Thank you very much, uh, Mukesh. In 2016, we had the World Humanitarian Summit, and we all came up really excited about the new way of working, which I always say it's not new, because we've been talking about this for a long time. The last 20, 30 years, most of us have been talking about humanitarian development peace nexus. Where have we reached on that? We as an organization dealing with mobility, transition and recovery, development side, but also on the migration side. We work on both the humanitarian side and the development side. The bigger issue we always have in the field when you go to, let's say, South Sudan, or you go to Somalia, or even you go to Colombia or Turkey with the, with the Syrian refugees, is a question about how the problem we have in trying to implement the humanitarian principles the international humanitarian law, but at the same time, international human rights law, where you're going to have the humanitarian side of the organization saying, you cannot go deal with non-state actors. How do you deal with the middle ground where in Somalia you'll have maybe 100 or 20 or 300 ex-Al-Shabaab fighters who've left Al-Shabaab and have come to join the government side of the program? How do you reintegrate a violent extremism group in the middle of a humanitarian response. And the question has always been, you'll find the humanitarian partner saying, we do not want to be part of this discussion, while we al always continuously push for the humanitarian development and peace nexus coming together. You can't deal with the peace side, you can't deal with the development side if you don't deal with the issue with Al-Shabaab as an example. Exactly the same situation in Nigeria, where you have a large number of um, um, IDP is displaced, but the government does not have an IDP policy. How do you deal with an IDP policy? And at the same time, how do you deal with the situation where you have a large number of extremist groups, the Boko Haram, who are surrendering to the government, who require humanitarian assistance? How do you deal with that part of the um, um, extremist group? How do you deal with the part of the IDPs who require shelter, food, non-food assistance, and anything else that's required to deal with that? So the middle ground has become an issue where you have the humanitarian side saying, we only deal with humanitarian principles. Then you have the development part of the side which do not show up as we need them. Then you have the government side, the whole of government approach, the donors. The donors come in saying, we are from ECHO, so we'll deal only with the humanitarian side of the programming. Then you have OFDA in the US government which come and say, we only deal with the humanitarian principle side of the programming. But you also have in USA the transition recovery, the OTI group of, uh, of donors who come in and say, we need to work on the middle ground. We need to make sure that uh, we're able to build the capacity of the government. But all this coming together is coming in a different sector. It does not come as a joint whole of government approach to responding to crisis and new ways of working and how we do the humanitarian development peace nexus. So our question has always been, how do we work in Somalia, which is a, let's say, fragile country, 25 years of conflict. How do you bring the situation of Somalis on the ground when the African Union forces take over a village from Al-Shabaab, as an example? When does the humanitarian organizations come on the ground? The humanitarian organizations will say, we do not want to do that because we'll be seen to be supporting the offensive by the, Afri by the African Union and the Somali National Army. We've changed that now. We're saying because we need to work on the middle ground with the UNDP and UN Habitat, we've set up a mid nemo program, which means as soon as a village is taken over, you quickly come in and ask the community what is needed. Is it health? Is it education? Is it food? And with that programming, you do a planning together much quicker 
with other organizations say you need to provide food, shelter, and others required. But in a country like Somalia, it's very fragile. So it means the government doesn't have the coordination structures in place, the capacity to deal with that. How do you be able to work with a government that doesn't have that coordination structure, but we want the government to be in the lead of dealing with that. Our evidence has shown that we have to look for a way of building that capacity. And that's why we sometimes appreciate the programs that come from, for example, the, transition, the OTI kind of programming, which is build the capacity of the government to be seen in the front line. If you go to Colombia, it's a totally different story, where you have a large number of FARC rebels, but you have a very strong government that is coordinating the international community. And we are able to come up with strong reparations and victims reparations program. If you go to Turkey, as an example, they received 3.5 million refugees. But they have a strong government that was able to coordinate the international community. At the end of the day, just by doing a labor assessment survey with the government of uh, Turkey, they were able to come up very quickly with a policy of employment of Syrian refugees, how they can get um, employment jobs and um, other uh, support mechanisms for Syrian refugees. So we compare the upper income countries like Turkey and Colombia, dealing with humanitarian development peace nexus, very key in making it work. How you're going to deal with the humanitarian development peace nexus in a country like Somalia or South Sudan um, or even Mali right now because of the weak government capacity, it becomes a bigger issue because instead of having the government leading that response and trying to make sure that everyone is in, 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 in the train to be able to move this forward, what you have is the humanitarian side saying we only deal with humanitarian issues. Then you have the development side is able to deal with development issues and the whole middle ground is forgotten, which is very much what we are trying to talk to everybody is that the humanitarian development peace nexus can only work when you first you have a strong government, but how do you deal with the non-state actors like the Al-Shabaabs and the Boko Harams who are causing the displacement itself, and how do we strengthen the capacity of the whole of government approach, and how do we change the perception of the donors themselves, that they need to come with a whole of government approach as well. We don't want donors to come and say, we'll only do humanitarian, we don't want to worry about the, the middle ground, and we don't want to worry about the development side. Well, for that, we need a kind of innovation in the mindsets of people. But I think, well said, uh, but let me just challenge you on the core mandate of IOM, which is migration. Now, the world is on the move in a record numbers, internally, externally, uh, rural, urban, we talked a little about that, across countries, across continents, if you like. Uh, as a specialist, uh, in migration aspects of humanitarianism, peace, and development, where do you see the role of innovation? Are we, you know, going to see any different, any new ways of managing migration? Uh, I'm here, I'm not uh, speaking uh, in political terms, in terms of uh, whether to let in people or not let in people. I'm speaking more about, is there a way of uh, managing the flow of people in a, in a way that is both humane as well as effective and empowers the migrant to be able to look after themselves while respecting the, the, the host community as well, whether they're internally displaced or externally displaced. Thank you, Mukesh, that's a really good question. Just to give you an example, from um, the Horn of Africa, we, re we see about close to 200,000 migrants crossing Djibouti and Somalia and the Red Sea majority wanting to come to Saudi Arabia. This is an example. If you speak to them when we meet them in Djibouti, what they say is, I'm leaving my country because of I have no job. It's a poverty issue. Most of the migrants, it's not because they're running because of persecution. It's very much about jobs and poverty in their own countries. The same thing when you talk about those who are in the Mediterranean, you have a large number of refugees who obviously are going because of our persecution issues. They can't go back to their own countries. Uh, but you also have a large number of economic migrants from the um, West African countries. And you can see the same thing when you talk about the caravan from Mexico and Guatemala trying to go to the US. It's mostly about jobs, security, and violence. How are you going to deal with those issues? I think we need to rethink, when we talk about innovation, it's very much about can we think more like what we've done with the Comprehensive Refugee Response Plan, which is very much how do we give jobs to the refugees in the host country, but also make sure that um, the, the communities who are hosting the refugees have jobs as well. 
what we need to see in Ethiopia, where you have 150,000 um, migrants living in the country, is how do we create jobs in Ethiopia to avoid this large flow of migrants crossing the Red Sea to Yemen. Even in, in a conflict situation, we're getting about 150,000 every year crossing into the Red Sea. How do you create jobs? Very much about the poverty reduction, the SDGs that we need to work on, and we're having partnership with our agencies that we're also already talking to, the ICRCs, the WFPs, the UNHCRs, and the UNDPs, to look at the root causes of people leaving their countries. How do we deal with poverty? How do we all come together into this? And bring also the World Bank and the development donors into this discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mohammed. And before we come to the uh, last speaker, I'm conscious of time, but we did start late. We started, I think, 15 minutes late, so we will finish 10 minutes uh, late. Is that all right? Okay. So, uh, and then uh, as soon as our last colleague has spoken, again, the same uh, approach. Very good to take one or two comments before we round up and uh, finish. I know our friend in Rome has to go for his uh, mid-morning cappuccino. You know, in Rome, in Italy, they take this very seriously. At 10.30, they must have their cappuccino. Otherwise, their human rights uh, are, uh, are denied. And of course, we need our human rights for lunch as well. So, uh, so we'll do that. <laughs> on that, in, 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 later on, later on, in final word. So let me turn now to Bogdan. Bogdan Dimitri is uh, from uh, the uh, International Medical Corps, which I think, uh, having seen some of their work on the ground myself in uh, several continents, I can not, uh, I don't flatter them too much in case they get too big ahead. But I think, in my opinion, they are one of the most effective, solid organizations on the ground. You won't hear them very much from them. They're not singing their praises uh, all the time. But they're solid workers in many, many uh, countries in, uh, across uh, many continents. So Bogdan, really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Dr. Kapila. Uh, I wish first to thank KSR for inviting us here, as Dr. Kapila said. We're probably not as well known as uh, every other colleague that has speak before or the previous day. But uh, those of you who know us, they know where we operate and what we are doing. We're a medical frontline organization. Um, we have been operating in almost all the conflicts in the world in the last 30, 40 years. And we're providing an integrated package of emergency health, um, referral system from the frontline trauma centers, and we then continue rebuilding together with the authorities, ministries of health, or what is left of them following conflict, the um, backbone of the health system in the respective country or territory uh, where the conflict or disaster has occurred. So our specificity is that we try in as much as possible to work almost exclusively with local capacity while we're bringing in expertise from overseas only if and where it's necessary. Uh, that differentiates us also from other colleagues that are doing similar type of work in the sense that we're trying to build that sustainability right off the bat from the beginning and therefore contributing also to a solution to this peace uh, development and humanitarian nexus that is being mentioned lately in several forums. So we do believe in that continuum right from the beginning, right from the start of our emergency response, from our medical mobile teams which are providing that kind of immediate assistance on the front line or in the immediate areas that are affected by conflict or violence or disaster, we're building that element of sustainability right from the beginning. Uh, providing innovative solutions could be looked at in several ways, programmatically, technically, and here I would like to mention our specific work in mental health and psychosocial support. Obviously, we all know what the result of an explosive ordinance falling in a city is. We've seen that numerous times on TV. We've seen the physical effect. We've seen the damage. We've seen the infrastructure being obliterated. We've seen lives being shattered. What we are not seeing is another silent killer in today's world. We're talking about this coronavirus, which is in itself a silent killer. We talk about it, we know it exists, we don't know what it is, and we, don't, we do not see it. There is another silent killer out there, not necessarily only in conflict and disaster, but across our entire 
uh, world, and that's the mental health. That's our psychosocial state. That's our mental well-being. Uh, very rarely we see people talking about it, uh, particularly in, in, in our area of operation here in the Middle East, but also across many other geographical areas. There is a certain stigma associated with mental health. People do not easily open up about that, particularly, I would say, those responsible for their families or for their communities. Uh, we are stressed when we receive an email from our boss at 10 in the evening asking us where were we yesterday when we were to deliver a report, aren't we? Well, imagine how much more of a stress you are from having constantly been displaced and re-displaced, being a refugee, being an internally displaced person, fleeing constantly for the last nine years in a conflict like Syria. We have refugees in Turkey, 3.7 million plus. We have refugees in Iraq. We have refugees in Jordan. We have refugees in Lebanon. There are millions of people who are also displaced internally within Syria. Uh, all those categories of population, they certainly suffered a significant psychosocial and mental health impact. It is unfortunately almost exclusively negative and it is it has been identified through various studies run by WHO, by IMC, by the local health networks that were remaining operational as being one of the first and the most important support that needs to be provided to this type of population. This is part of human being, it's part of the needs, it's part of the rights, and we need to take it into account. And therefore, where the innovation comes from, you may ask yourself, is from the fact that by providing this medical emergency assistance on the front line and in, in the immediate proximity, we have associated mental health and psychosocial support interventions uh, together, and we have even included also elements of gender-based violence, clinical management of rape, and all that. That is because of the stigma that's associated with these issues. It is also because of the fact that people do not necessarily want to disclose that in an environment that's only set for that particular type of response, but through a visit to one of our clinics or through a visit by one of our mobile medical units, you can actually be made aware and have access to those services in full confidentiality and without anybody else needing to know what exactly is the real reason why you are there. Uh, and to socialize that within the communities that we work, obviously we have developed what we call a community health-based team that's going around either settlements of refugees, IDPs, communities, and so on, which are actually individually visiting every family in those locations and explaining them what kind of services are available at our facilities. Now, one of the reasons, Dr. Kapila, that we are not so well known is because we do not talk about what we are doing. Uh, we do not like to be on TV as much as others uh, because that negatively impacts our ability to operate across very sensitive and delicate and complex environments. And that is the reason why our work is so little known. But we certainly hope that you will help us change that in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bogdan. Uh, I think uh, you work in very difficult circumstances and you bring help and hope to people under most desperate conditions. That much is clear. Now, the difference between now and say 20 years ago, and I'm very kind of feel positive about that difference is that 20 years ago, people who were caught up in crisis and conflicts, you know, we waited for the conflict and crisis to pass so that they could resume their trajectory towards development. At least that was the kind of a, a, a simplistic idea one had of relief, development. Uh, it was not about a nexus. It was about a sequ sequence, in a way. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals, they talk about leaving no one behind. And the Sustainable Development Goal 3 talks about universal health coverage, which means universal health coverage for people directly the millions that you were uh, talking about, tens of millions. So let me ask you, uh, because you are a medical organization here, what's your thinking? If ever we need innovation, it is in the area 
of how to bring about universal coverage for the people who are inaccessible. And, and they need not just basic health care, they need the latest in science and technology to be brought to them. So this is where innovation comes in, because meanwhile, our uh, advances in science and technology, especially in the medical sciences, has advanced so much that things are possible now that were not possible before. And I'm reminded in this about, the, about soldiers and civilians. You know, today, for a soldier to die in a war is very rare, unless a bomb lands on their head and that's, you know, they die and no one can do anything. But today, if a soldier is uh, rescued by the medical services of the army concerned of that uh, country, they very rarely die. Survival is almost 100%. While in the case of civilians caught in conflicts, it's about at least 90% uh, uh, you know, likely to die if you happen to be injured, if you are very sick, etc., etc. And how did the armed forces, medical and health services do that? They innovated a lot in the way they organized their healthcare services in the moment of greatest crisis for them. Now, I don't want to use a military example too much, but in this case, it's an inspirational example, seeing just because civilians are caught up in wars, just because civ civilians are caught up in uh, disasters, it does not automatically follow that they have to suffer. It does not automatically follow that they have to die because we have the means and the capabilities at our disposal to do that. And that's where we need the innovation more than anything else. So, uh, sorry, I'm not the one giving speeches, but you are. So uh, tell me, how, how is IMC going to innovate to bring about universal health coverage to your uh, uh, most difficult to reach uh, populations? Any more challenges, Dr. Kapila, for me? <laughs> well, I, I think um, with respect to, to accessing almost impossible location, we call that uh, hard to reach areas um, in a very diplomatic way because they're actually active conflict area and sometimes even the participants to the conflict, they do not know who exactly it is that they are fighting against. Uh, so having access to those areas, for us, the, the only way in is the acceptance of the warring parties or combatants or groups engaged in armed, armed operations, but also particularly the local communities. You have to have the trust of those communities and of those actors if you are to access this area. And the innovation is your ability to negotiate, actually, uh, and to convince all these parties to the conflict or being affected by conflict that you are actually there to deliver the proper emergency services in a neutral and impartial way. So there is not much innovation in mentioning the principles of humanitarian assistance. They remain the same. How do you do it? And the capacity that you need also to actually make sure that you manage to save everybody that needs to be saved in an active conflict situation. That's more of a creativity, innovation, uh, building reputation, credibility, and being able to deliver that result uh, that one of my colleagues here was mentioning and proving it to the donors such as KSR, or USAID, or DFID, and to also the specialists in the sectors who are constantly monitoring us, such as yourself, Dr. Kapila, who hold us responsible for delivering that result. Uh, and that's where efficiency and effectiveness comes into play. Now, it is very difficult to invent something better than a rescue team on a helicopter covered by F-16. We do not have that. But what we have is road ambulances, we have dedicated drivers who speak multiple languages, we have doctors and nurses who are ready to go into the battlefield, ready to recover those immediate trauma casualties, bring them to a stabilization center that's usually as close as possible, if not on the front line itself, sometimes protected by those warring groups, and then following that, referring them to a, probably a field hospital that's again in the nearest place. Front lines today are, are, are very flexible. They can change overnight. Uh, there, is, there is quite a lot of hardware from a military perspective involved. And our capacity, unfortunately, remains somewhere in the area of 1980s and 1990s, where it is mostly our dedication as humanitarian workers that allows us to, to conduct those rapid emergency interventions. Great. Thank you very much. In fact, to stay flexible is itself an innovation in a world that is more and more 
rigid and in a world where there are too many boundaries. Now, we're about to finish, but uh, as promised, there is uh, maybe space for a couple of people, and we have some gentlemen in uniform, so at least I've got to let them s uh, speak, and then one or two others. So please, uh, no more than one minute each, if you possibly can, and then we will su uh, sum up and conclude. I think there was, a, there was someone there first. Microphones, please, please stand up. Oh, you got one, yeah. Good. And if you can, sorry, I should have said this at the, at the beginning, just give us your uh, name as well, if you can, and what you do. Another microphone? Okay. Well, why don't you come here? Right. All right. Shout. Thank you. My name is Yasser Tabara. I'm with the American Relief Coalition for Syria. I'm a Syrian American. It's an umbrella organization for 11 uh, Syrian-American organizations that provide relief and development aid in Syria. The, just throughout the discussion, and just going back to the, uh, the, the topic of the, of the session, you know, when, when we're talking evidence-based, the question of priority always came to my mind. What are the criteria? that are used to determine a, the, the priority of a humanitarian catastrophe. For example, right now we have the, uh, you know, the, the disaster, humanitarian disaster, biblically proportioned humanitarian disaster of IDPs in northern Syria. And at the same time, there are a number of other catastrophes that are taking place in the world. Has there been an attempt to um, have an international conference or a national treaty that actually sets the criteria to deal with these catastrophes from a, a, a point of view of priority. And obviously, political considerations are always there. Um, and having listened to, the, to Dave's uh, uh, intervention, which uh, was very impressive, actually, uh, from my perspective, and the innovation of the private sector, the introduction of private sector into the world of humanitarian uh, uh, assistance, uh, perhaps that could be the element that takes away the political considerations out of the, the setting the priorities of dealing with humanitarian disasters. I just wanted to put that question out there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And to one of our generals in the front. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is uh, Major General Abdullah Hudali. Uh, civil military operation in the Joint Command. Uh, my question based on the name of uh, the session, which is evidence-based practice. You know, uh, whereas uh, we all work in the man-made crisis, so the difficulty comes on the people in the field. Uh, the rules and regulation sits by the COs in the big office in the capitals. Uh, my question is, uh, now, you know, sharing experience in the field is not easy between companies, between a humanitarian organization. So nobody will give you his secret. Uh, so there will be, there should be a place which deal with everybody working in the humanitarian sector, like OCHA. My question, how do you evaluate the role of OCHA dealing to transfer and to have a mutual support between the humanitarian organization uh, in the field. My question to uh, Mr. Dave Harper. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, I think uh, it would be... Uh, okay, please. Speak. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. My, I think my question is quite complementary with the two other ones, and I'm very happy that a lawyer and then a military person took um, part of this 
conversation. Because you've been talking about collecting the data and you emphasize on the fact to get the study. So I'm very curious about what kind of profile the NGOs and the organization needs to work with them. Because it requires so many qualifications that are very cross-functional and also some capacity of understanding, empath empathy, and the fact to collect the data. So what kind of process and what kind of recruitment do you need? What kind of people do you need on the ground to work with you? Do you need local people? Do you need, because I see that you work on very different countries with different cultural backgrounds. So are you thinking about, in terms of human resources, how do you think about that? Okay, so in order to manage this, uh, um, uh, let's handle it this way. I'm going to give each person 30 seconds each. If I say 30 seconds, they'll take 45. So I have to go 30, 30 seconds each. For them to address any of the questions or to say anything they like, but that's your final word on this uh, subject. And let's start in reverse order. So the last person who spoke was, uh, uh, was uh, Bogner. So why don't we start with you? And then we'll work our way up and we'll end up with Rome. Thank I, you, I take you. these okay. questions on board. Don't have to ask, answer them if you don't know how to answer them. But uh, whichever question you can answer, answer. Thank you. I don't think anybody knows how to answer all of them, but I will do my best. Uh, to my colleagues that work in Northeastern Syria, I think there is a lot of uh, political efforts done currently within the structures that we have internationally, the United Nations and other working groups that are trying to actually put an end to what's going on as we speak in, in Northwestern Syria. I hope they will be more successful than the previous attempts. Um, but our role, our primary role as humanitarian organization is actually to deal with the effects of that while we're advocating, of course, for a long-lasting political uh, solution to a military confrontation. To uh, Your Excellency, the Major General, who's been obviously on the same front lines as, as many of us here, I think your approach to coordination, uh, something similar to command and control, is extremely important. We all have our own strengths, but we all have our own weaknesses as agencies. Some of us are better in emergencies, some of us are better in transitional, uh, some are better in building peace, some are better in protection and so on. I think that's a very essential point. I cannot speak on behalf of my OCHA colleagues, but I think they've been playing a wonderful role throughout the Middle East, at least uh, in the past few years since we experienced in this, this conflict. Uh, and with respect to the human resources, there is absolutely no difference between the capacity that you need, whether it's local or international, as, as you refer to it. It is a capacity you need, and I would say it's 99% local capacity that you need and that you want to ensure that there is that understanding, that there is that language skill, that there is that communication according to the local customs and traditions okay. and the community yeah. expectations. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bogdan. 30 seconds, Mohammed. Um, first, when we talk about a lot of data has come up, in the humanitarian context, we do have data and we share with everyone, including the military, if they're interested. And that is through our displacement tracking metrics, which is in almost every country that has a conflict right now or natural disasters, there is data available in the humanitarian context, which is how many people require shelter, how many people require food, working very close with WFP with their scope system itself. That is available, I think, on that. On, on, on the other ones, the humanitarian development piece is a different issue. The second very important point is about, we talk about evidence-based and research funding. The problem is there is no enough donors who will fund research in the field. So we'd like to look at the governments here and the donors. How much do you provide, just like the prevention strategy, how much do you provide for prevention, how much do you provide for research funding, and we to, to look at that. On that question about the scale of the crisis, I think we've talked about the last many years within the UN system, classifying a, a, an emergency as a level three or level two or level one, but we've realized it's even causing more problems as well. Because once we say crisis in Syria is level three, then all donors just are interested in Syria and everybody forgets about South Sudan, everybody forgets about other countries as well. How to balance that will always be a problem for us. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, David, 30 so, seconds. Thank you. So I'm deeply skeptical about the data that we currently collect. I think it could be done a lot better. Um, I, uh, I think, for instance, we're working on a, a data collection omni-channel communication product that will allow 
us to collect data at the 2G, 5G level, low literacy, high literacy, no internet, definite internet. I think big data needs to be collected at the crowdsource level, at the responder level, um, and, and kind of coupled with some remote sensing capabilities. On, uh, you had raised a question about civilians. I think that it's very easy now to set up a blockchain uh, target deconfliction mechanism that would make it um, uh, neutral and uh, unimpeachable on targeting and, uh, and re reduce civilian risks. Uh, that, that technology exists right now. It hasn't been applied in this context. Um, there was a question too about, but I just want to kind of highlight one additional point, and that's the trust gap, which came up, cr credibility gap. Listen, everybody in this room, they get in cars of people they don't know. They stay in houses of people that they've never met before, and they give them money in advance. That's Airbnb and Uber. You could envision kind of a crowdsourced, uh, NGO sourced, local sourced trust gap that would be able to conclude um, where there's vi verifiable good big data. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Maybe the time for crowdsourcing humanitarian action needs to be developed further. Uh, Tangina. 25 seconds. Yes, I'll only answer the question the lady raised about uh, data. I, I have actually very different views from what was shared. I think data has become a tool for upward accountability only. It goes to the donor, satisfies the donor for more money. I think this is not the right way. That could be one way. The most important accountability is sharing the data with the people we are serving. What do they want from this data? How can we share with the men and women and children in their terms, not in scientific, because it's about their lives, it's their, it's their point of view. So how to build local capacity to collect and share. I keep on emphasizing the word share to the people we serve, not to always the master of the money. And that mechanism is, does not exist, and we need to find, and it has to be in the sharing and development of local capacity, not somewhere in Washington, not in Canada, not in New York. It has to be local data collection shared in their terms, and for them it, it is about downwards accountability, not just upward. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Erfan. Uh, two comments on the point from the gentleman in the um, King Salman Center on the data, um, the monitoring of, of, um, of, of the data. I would like to invite you to, to refer to um, the Resilience and Recovery Data Platform in Iraq. It's public, it's open, it includes all projects from, uh, by, by NGOs, by UN agencies, by the government in both phases, in the humanitarian response and in recovery. This is a public and open now in Iraq. Five other platforms are open for Syria for Libya, for Lebanon, for Yemen, for Yemen it, will be, it, it will be functioning soon. We, I can also uh, have further discussion on this with you to, to respond to your question. The other point of, on, from, the, uh, uh, from the Syrian, from the Syrian uh, NGO, um, as Mohammed referred, there are very rigorous mechanisms in the UN system to, for, to, to, to set up the prioritization system of the humanitarian response and to continue, uh, uh, continue reviewing the, the, the response, the humanitarian response under the Interagency Standing Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Hajazi. Just I want to answer the question of our uh, colleague from Saudi Arabia, the military general. Uh, yes, we have a problem actually in sharing uh, information. And he's right of it's saying that there is a challenge. But OCHA is doing a good job, but it is not enough. I think we need to find uh, a way of really sharing information with the donor, with everybody. Um, I don't think the problem is with that, that we, you know, we hide the information on purpose. I don't think this is the reason. It may be lack of time. Uh, maybe our concern is to deliver, to help the people uh, without really giving uh, okay. Thanks. the time for good doc documentation of things. So, Trey, and uh, then uh, uh, to you, Dominic, uh, your time is even more compressed. Sure. So, just to answer from a donor perspective how we prioritize our responses, um, at USAID, we um, do it multiple ways, but um, in the Office of Food for Peace, we have the famine early war warning system, which uses satellite data, we use economic data, we use crop yields, 
rainfall, to look at food security, and we do this regularly and ongoing so we can target where the most needs are. Um, we also look at things like um, uh, we, we do projectized funding, so we don't do block grants, um, and we walk away for a few months and then come back. We do project by project, so if something comes up like the floods in South Sudan or the locusts, or some um, drought or weather condition that acerbates an area, we can shift quickly because we don't give money out in blocks, we give it out per project per project and it keeps us nimble. And we use zero-based budgeting every year. We look across the landscape, we use all the data, and we prioritize based on the Great. data and meeting thanks the needs. A, thanks a lot. A final sentence or two from you, uh, uh, Dominic in Rome. Thank you very much. A um, Couple of sentences, one, Thank you for all the inputs that were given. I have listened and we will factor them in. Second, the same passion that everyone has put into innovation, we need that same passion in the principle of collaboration. That will help us have the people, the resources, and, and the, the evidence for getting good programs. The third point, responsible use of data, involvement of the private sector. We need to be much more aggressive in pursuing the private sector that can solve challenges that the public sector or single institutions cannot. Thank, Thank you for having me on this panel, Dr. Kapila. Thank you very much. Three sentences in conclusion uh, to try and summarize. Number one, humanitarian action is an art, but it's also a science. And I think if we do not invest in the science of humanitarian action, then I think we are going to fail our clients. And that science is not a science of medicine or education, or uh, new, uh, new technologies, it is a science of, the, of humanitarian action. Second, a point made in different ways, we need institutional capacity building among organizations, whether it's institutes for data or, or whatever it is, and donors therefore have to invest in that. The number three point is, this is a matter of principle. We're all familiar with humanitarian principles, neutrality, impartiality, and so on. What about a new principle? that it is immoral and unethical to work in humanitarian area unless you're working scientifically and unless you're also working in a way where you are able to share your data so far we have for the collective, uh, collective group. Fourthly and finally, we need an enabling, enabling system-wide environment to do this. This cannot be done by an individual organization, an individual government, or an individual NGO. Therefore, it has to be a whole of system a response. And that may be the manifesto to take forward from here and, the, and in fact what we request the KS Relief to take on as part of their plan of actions, their work ahead in the, in the months and years ahead. Thank you very much, all very much. And thank you very much. If the microphone could be activated again. Can we activate the microphones? Excellent. Thank you all so much. Excellent discussions. And thank you to, to McCool Kapila. Now, lunch is being served downstairs. Can I ask you to return here at 2 o'clock for the panel, Health in the Humanitarian Context, Communicable Disease. It's going to be hosted by Elise Labat, who assures me that there will be references to the coronavirus, but it will not be about the coronavirus. 2 o'clock here. It's a date. I will see you later. Thank you.
as the next panel, the next high-level discussion, will begin in a minute. So please, ladies and gentlemen, dignitaries, ministers, excellencies, please take your seat. The next panel will begin very shortly. Thank you. Excellencies, dignitaries, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, could I please ask you to be seated as the next panel will begin in a few moments. I'm going to give you an extra minute, but that's about as generous as I can be. So please be seated. Our panel is ready, weared up for action. They've got lots to talk about and they want to share it with you. Do not deny yourselves a treat. You will be swamped with information, lots of information. They'll be here in a few moments, so please be seated. One final communications check and then the panel will begin. So please be seated and please be patient. We will be with you in a few moments. Okay, we are ready to go. I have been given the technology thumbs up. So, excellencies, dignitaries, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the last of our high-level sessions, the theme of which is health in the humanitarian context, communicable disease. I'm going to hand you over to the marvellous, the excellent Elise Labot. If you don't remember her, she moderated that brilliant panel on migration flows. So, please give her a very warm welcome. Elise, it's all yours. Thanks, Juliet, and thanks once again uh, to the King Salman Center. This has been an incredible two days. Um, I've learned so much, and I just want to express my appreciation and respect for everybody um, here at the forum for the work that you do. Um, helping them really the most needy um, populations around the world. Communicable diseases are a major cause of mortality and morbidity during humanitarian emergencies. Ensuring adequate shelter, water, sanitation, and food, and providing basic services are the most effective means of protecting the health affected by those emergencies. Protracted conflicts, Weak health systems mean that countries may not be able to deliver basic health, nutritional, and social services. Now, the outbreak of the Ebola virus in the Democratic Republic of Congo with a highly mobile population, a struggling health system, and a protracted conflict. Wild polio virus reemerged recently in Syria and northern Nigeria due to conflict, while Yemen has recently experienced the world's largest cholera outbreak. State fragility and dysfunctional health systems have led to multiple 
concurrent outbreaks during humanitarian crises in both Venezuela and Sudan. The number of high threat infectious hazards continue to rise. Some of these are re-emerging and some of them are new. What disease will emerge next or where is not known. But countries undergoing humanitarian emergencies are at greater risk. In extensive environmental degradation and climate change creates space for the emergence or re-emergence of diseases that could become academic or pandemic threats. Also, the patterns of disease transmission have changed due to increased migration and international travel with diseases now more commonly crossing borders. Displaced people are often cut out from accessing basic health services. Displacement often entails extreme stress, exposure to the elements, overcrowding, inadequate shelter, poor water and sanitation, all of which become more of a risk of communicable disease transmission and the threat of epidemics. Now I'm learning new lingo here myself, working through the cluster which we'll be discussing shows that collective action is key, including multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary action. Partnerships enable to scale up to prevent, detect, respond, and recover from health emergencies. A systematic approach to the control of communicable disease is a key component of humanitarian response and is crucial to protect the health of affected populations this requires cooperation among agencies working at local, national, and international levels, and collaboration among all sectors involved in the emergency response, health, food, and nutrition, shelter, water, and sanitation. And we should note that the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Health are all interrelated, but one of them is especially related to health, ensuring healthy, lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages, directly targets specific maternal and child health improvements and communicable disease control and elimination. So there's a recognized need to ensure stability and a paradigm shift to work through an integrated collective approach for a sustainable communicable disease elimination framework. Now you'll find that we have a smaller panel today. We have four wonderful panelists, but several, including your original moderator, had to pull out because of travel restrictions, because of the coronavirus. Now, I promise you, this is not going to be a panel on just the coronavirus. I think we've had enough of those. But at the same time, this is a panel on communicable disease, and, and obviously we're going to mention it, but, all, but really in, in the context of a humanitarian setting and how this affects and how this can be transmitted through the world's neediest populations. You know, look, this affected our conference, our little conference, a lot of people had to pull out. That's really a first world problem, right? But I think it really drives home the point that if we're affected, imagine how the neediest populations of the world, the, most, the people in most fragile states are affected by the outbreak of, of communicable diseases of all stripes. So we'll keep them in our minds and we'll also keep all the people that are worried about coronavirus because it is top of mind. So we'll discuss it, we won't obsess over it, we won't focus on it, um, but we'll put it in the, in the context of how we treat communicable diseases. And we have an excellent, really a, a first-rate panel um, to discuss this. Um, I have to get my notes of my panelists. Dr. Ibrahima Sashe Fall is w, the World Health Organization's Assistant Director General for Emergency Response. He will be joining us for keynote remarks. We'll also be joined by Mark Bryson Richardson, Director for Middle East and North Africa of the United Kingdom. Dr. Ki Lu, Chief Operating Officer at International Medical Corp. And Ambassador Carl Scow, Head of Department for Conflict 
and Humanitarian Affairs in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Sweden. So the panelists will take their seats, and Dr. Fall, the floor is yours. Thank you for this great opportunity to interact and communicate with this great audience about communicable diseases in the context of humanitarian crisis. I think talking about communicable diseases in an already complex humanitarian situation is adding complexity to an already complex situation. And uh, because of the risk, not only for health and for the family, but the social and economic disruption we can have when we have an epidemic in the context of humanitarian crisis. I have spent most of last year dealing with Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the context of insecurity, in the context of broken trust between the population and the central government, and uh, where arms groups are threatening the population on a daily basis. And coming to respond in a, to an outbreak in this context is even more challenging than anything else. But it's important, I think, to remind ourselves about the context because we are talking about humanitarian situation in general. The scale of complexity of humanitarian crisis is increasing over the year with interaction among many factors, including economic, environmental, political, security, and social factors. So that makes it difficult to provide essential health services to populations that are already vulnerable. And uh, we are seeing more and more humanitarian crises directly related to or caused by armed conflict, where we are seeing a more important prevalence of communicable diseases. Up to 70% of all communicable disease outbreaks are happening in fragile settings. So it's really important to keep it in mind while talking about prevention and responding to outbreaks and emergencies. And these populations are highly vulnerable with very limited access to health services and often experiencing the worst outcome of health services. Simple things like infection prevention and control are lacking both in the community but also in the health system. That's why you can see most of the time health workers being the first one even to be infected because they are operating in a very poor setting. And uh, you found health facility being the you know, amplifier of this outbreak like what we have seen in the Congo where more than you know, 200 health workers contracted the disease, Ebola disease. So to respond in a such complex, fragile, and rapidly changing setting, we have a number of challenges, both for local, regional, and international responders. So it's really important to put in place an efficient uh, system for information collection and management for rapid decision making, and also to have a sustainable supply chain management when you have to send supply to you know, through thousands of kilometers in the forest with very difficult access when you need plane, helicopter, and truck to access to the population. We also need to make sure that we can use the local capacity to increase the health workforce and uh, be able to address the most difficult needs. Um, so in emergencies, there is no one organization or institution that can respond to all the needs identified. That's why it is important to really put a clear, you know, comprehensive coordination mechanism, putting the country leadership first and all partners working together to strengthen that leadership. That's why for WHO, since the West Africa Ebola outbreak, through the reform, we are using the incident management system where we provide a platform for more cooperation with national government, but also with all partners based on the expertise and specific competitive advantage. So how this outbreak and unmet health needs disproportionately affect the most vulnerable countries and population. It's important to remind that two billion people live in countries with, you know, setting affecting fragility, conflict and violence, and 
at least half of the world population will be living in such setting by 2030. So this environment has the highest threat of child and maternal mortality, food and security, malnutrition, and the lowest immunization, immunization rate. We have seen measles outbreak, yellow fever outbreak happening in, you know, in mountain situation where we have a vaccine for prevention. But if you don't have the system in place, if you have low immunization coverage with a core of population not immunized, it's really important to know that the risk is high. It's a matter of risk and vulnerability. The risk in terms of population susceptibility, but vulnerability in terms of capacity to detect, to prevent, and to respond to those kind of situations. Because Doc Dr. Fall, I'm going to ask you to hold. Excuse me, everybody. Can we please keep it down in the back? Can we close the doors? Dr. Fall is extremely busy and is giving his precious time away from dealing with communicable diseases to address this conference. So if we could give him the respect of, of if you'd like to talk, just please step outside. Otherwise, let's keep the room quiet. Thank you for your understanding. Please continue. Thank you. So, um, so it's important also to really recognize that these challenges are compounded by lack of trust in public institutions and the presence of multiple often competing national region, and regional authorities. For this reason, it's really important to prioritize community engagement and ownership. We have seen some situation in the Lake Chad Basin with a polio campaign, where the population accepted you know, the responder because they were not identified as being part of one side or another. So this humanitarian principle is extremely important. In the opposite, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it was very challenging to get the community engagement because when they see responders coming together with the government, for them, it was really a, a, a reason for mistrust because they have been abandoned by the government for many years, exposed to armed group, and nobody was there even to fulfill their basic needs in terms of access to water, sanitation, and schooling. So coming to tell them I'm here because of Ebola and they don't know Ebola was extremely difficult. It took months and months to get the trust from the community and to convince them to work to protect the population. In the meantime, they have already lost you know, many people because of Ebola. And, uh, so it's really important for humanitarian development actors and development actors to ensure coherent long-term planning not only to respond to emergencies, but also for preparedness, prevention, and also for recovery and resilience building. Because we need to really do what we call evidence-based preparedness, because we know where we have the risk, where we have the ecological niche for specific infectious disease. So it's important taking the evidence from the risk and the vulnerability to be able to build capacity for preparedness and for community engagement to also work before we have the outbreak. Because if you wait for the outbreak to happen, to go to talk to the community, it's already too late. And uh, we need to strengthen the health system, of course, by providing essential health services. But where we don't have you know, the right information system, WHO is working with government and many partners to have what we call the early warning and responding system where we can have a more adapted information system, you know, to a specific context to be able to detect early enough to prevent and respond to, to this outbreak. So having this reliable source of information as we have seen in South Sudan, in Somalia, is really crucial for early detection of outbreak. So in terms of action, I think it's really important for partners to work in a very coherent manner at country level. It will start, as I said earlier, you know, by preparedness, working together to reinforce the health system, to make it more resilient and responsive to, to crisis. But it will also important taking into account the international health regulation core capacity setting and using the joint external evaluation to see where we have gaps in terms of detection, prevention, and rapid response to outbreak. And uh, we don't need to wait for an outbreak to happen to start doing this. And uh, defining a 
National Shell Package of Health Services in Fragile Context is also crucial. This includes mapping of available services and uh, partners to see exactly where we should prioritize our intervention. And that's why we work with partners to you know, implement what we call the HEROMS Health Resources and Service Availability Monitoring System, where we can identify priorities for action and you know, also prioritize the financing for impact. And, uh, so at global and at county level, when the outbreaks start, it's really important to act in a coherent manner using what we call the strategic response plan. One plan, one implementation plan, one monitoring system with some critical key performance indicators. Because most of the time, when you work in a humanitarian setting, you have some medium to long term objective. But when you have to stop a highly dangerous pathogen like Ebola, you need some short term key performance indicator in terms of stopping the transmission, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of case management to reduce the case fatality rate. So coordination between all these actors, the health cluster, making sure that we use the humanitarian you know, platform to provide all the essential health services at the same time providing the specific services you need to stop the outbreak is really important. And uh, we work with government to set up this platform and build the capacity for leadership and coordination to make sure that all actors are working together. So at regional level we, and global level, it's critically important to really strengthen multisectoral coordination mechanism to undertake joint analysis and planning and risk analysis and planning, need assessment also, having also a joint monitoring platform to make sure that we provide the best quality of support and care for the population in need. Information sharing throughout the humanitarian platform and uh, sharing information in real time with all stakeholders, making sure that we use all coordination mechanism is crucial, like the UN crisis management system and uh, using the competitive advantage of all agencies and partners. That's why for some high impact diseases like yellow fever, cholera, we have some you know, global mechanism to facilitate access to vaccine, access to technical support, and we also use what we call the GONS, the global you know, outbreak alert and response mechanism where we can mobilize specific expertise from hundreds of institutions. So we need to really also work more in terms of more predictable financing, not just waiting for an outbreak to happen to start mobilizing the sources. That's why as part of the WHO reform, it was important to have the contingency fund for emergencies that allow us within 24 hours to start deploying people, even to respond to the you know, COVID-19 outbreak, we started using the Contingency Fund for emergencies to, you know, deploy teams at regional level to countries to start working, building capacity for emergencies. So to conclude, I think it's really important to take into account all the determinants, not only in the health sector, but also outside the health sector to make sure that we have comprehensive approach for prevention, preparedness, but also for response. But being ready for response needs also simulation exercise based on the risk we know already in various countries. So joint accountability and working very closely with the communities before the outbreak happens is crucial for success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fall. And I, before we were um, getting together, um, I sat with Dr. Fall and he showed me on his phone a map of the world where he's dealing with outbreaks around the world as the World Health Organization's emergency response coordinator. What, what would Dr. Fall, were there like 200 different kind of outbreaks around the world? Um, that just shows you um, how, how wonderful it is to, for him to have us today. In fact, World Health Organization has a um, you know, working room here in the hotel where they're um, working on the coronavirus, the coronavirus in between meeting, having bilateral meetings, speaking to the conference, 
Um, and so the work that they do is, is so critical. And um, I just want to, again, on, on behalf of everybody here, express um, the appreciation for the World Health Organization's critical efforts. Um, and I think he really, uh, Dr. Fall, set, um, set the scene for the challenges and um, you know, the idea of, of dealing at, of a whole, you know, in the United States we call it a whole of government approach, but here um, we call it a cluster, which is making sure that all of the humanitarian uh, organizations, whether it's dealing with food, um, shelter, water, sanitation, all together um, for, for really a comprehensive approach. Um, so Carl, why don't you start where um, Dr. Fall left off on, the, on what do you see as the key operational challenges um, to managing disease outbreaks in humanitarian settings and, and some of the um, you know, key solutions that you think are, are necessary? Well, thank you. Uh, and first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me to this panel and for a very impressive uh, meeting throughout. Um, I just wanted to make two uh, maybe general points also uh, before getting into the question you said about the response. Uh, and that's um, first that um, outbreaks, there are two dimensions to outbreaks in an emergency. One is of course that it's having an impact on the population and that's you know, first and foremost uh, our concern. But secondly also that it puts a lot of strain on the humanitarian operation in itself. I mean if you have a cholera outbreak in uh, a refugee uh, camp, uh, that is a nightmare for the humanitarian operations. I think it's an important dimension to, to, to reflect on, that it's uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, uh, an issue for, for the population, but it's also a challenge for the humanitarian response uh, uh, trying to deal with the broader humanitarian crisis. Uh, the second is that uh, outbreaks in these contexts are unavoidable. I mean, that's, it's always going to happen. We're not going to be able to do away with them completely. But I think that what's important is that the impact of the outbreaks when they happen can vary and depend on whether there is capacity and preparedness in place. And here there are important lessons learned that need to be brought forward and, and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, put in place. Um, and that brings me to the response. I think from our perspective, there's, there's two things we focus on. Um, and it's really, um, you can, it, uh, you can summarize it in investing in the system. The first is that we put money up front so that the system has the money already in its bank. We do that through supporting uh, the UN agencies with core contributions that are flexible and that can be used in a way uh, over the year where it's needed the most. Uh, we also provide money to what's called the Central Emergency Relief Fund, which is coordinated by, by Mark Lokov, who was here yesterday and which is also a flexible fund that can be used uh, for immediate emergencies uh, up front. And so, as a donor, we invest early and we do that in a flexible manner so that the system itself has the money and can act uh, swiftly and flexibly where, where, where needed and, and when needed. The second is, um, and that's the design of the system, and you touched on that, uh, the, the cluster system. I mean, all since the reform years of 2005, we have invested in the cluster system, which is really about having a clearer, clearer uh, roles and uh, responsibility in these theaters and, and to make sure that accountability is there. And of course, WHO has the lead uh, on addressing uh, disease uh, and health in, in emergencies. And we have invested a lot in, in uh, making sure that WHO also has then the capacity. Uh, lots has been done since 2005, no doubt, but I think even more can be done in ensuring that uh, there is also the needed capacity and, comp and, and competencies in the field uh, uh, from, from uh, the WHO uh, side. I think reflecting on the role of WHO as well, um, uh, they have, uh, as we've mentioned, a lead role in emergencies, but they also have this lead role in addressing uh, epidemics and outbreaks uh, in non-humanitarian contexts. And I think those two roles are clearly, they are separate, but they are clearly uh, complementary. And I think more can uh, be done to support uh, the WHO in this leadership in both tracks, but also on how they complement and how they can, can work uh, together. And that actually brings me to, to coronavirus, although I know that's not the focus. Uh, 
I think it's, uh, it's, we for example, I mean, we strongly support WHO in their way of addressing the coronavirus now. Uh, we have, you know, put additional millions of euros uh, to uh, WHO, mainly to support um, countries with weak health system to be prepared should they be hit uh, by the virus. But I think, you know, it's important to remember here as well that so far at least coronavirus is not considered a humanitarian crisis. We're not funding this from a humanitarian window. And, and while the situation with the coronavirus is very grave and deserves all the attention and, and response that it gets now, we should not rem forget the diseases that in specific context kills way more people uh, in humanitarian emergencies. Uh, these are outbreaks of cholera, uh, of measles, uh, and, and uh, you know, diseases such as uh, HIV AIDS and, and, and malaria as well. And so I think that um, while uh, Corona deserves its attention, when it comes to humanitarian emergencies, uh, attention must really be given to these diseases that are, are far more deadly uh, and, and grave uh, than Corona so far. I think that's an important point. And we're gonna obviously speak about Corona a little while. And, the, and I think what we're really talking about is the differences in transmission. And when we're talking about cholera, um, malaria, um, these type of diseases, um, this is where humanitarian work um, and dealing with all of these different um, areas key, like malnutrition, food insecurity, water sanitation. Um, these are some of the um, kind of key um, challenges to managing an outbreak, I would think. Why don't you um, pick up where Carl um, was talking about and some of the um, key challenges to managing disease outbreaks in these humanitarian settings? Thanks for the question, Denise. And I'd also like to thank uh, our organizers for the conference and, and this panel in particular. It's extremely timely. I think that clearly the world is grappling right now with coronavirus. And as we heard from Dr. Pedros yesterday, there's still a lot of unknowns in terms of the disease and how to manage it. But I think there's one thing that we can guarantee that if we're responding to the coronavirus in a conflict setting, where we don't have access to the population, where the health infrastructure has been decimated, it's going to be exponentially more challenging. So with regard to challenges, um, you know, we can think of both external and internal uh, factors that uh, will challenge the ability for humanitarian organizations to be able to respond effectively to disease outbreaks in conflict settings. The uh, International Medical Corps is a frontline humanitarian organization and we operate in, in very complex settings where the interplay between conflicts and epidemics is an unfortunate reality. Uh, we can think of conflict uh, as public health in reverse where uh, all the safeguards uh, are limited or uh, non-existent for the affected community. Uh, and as you pointed out, Elise, uh, that's why we have uh, polio right in Syria. Uh, the cholera outbreak in Yemen, um, or the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I'll focus on a little bit just to explore and discuss these external and internal factors. Uh, August of 2018, the uh, DRC declared their 10th outbreak of Ebola. And with the number of confirmed cases now surpassing 3,000, it is the second largest Ebola epidemic on record. And the outbreak is, uh, the epicenter of the outbreak is in the city of Beni, which is in the eastern portion of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which for decades has endured violence and armed conflict. Uh, the result is we have a million internally displaced persons. We have a chronic failure to protect the civilian population. We have a decimated uh, health infrastructure. And it's against this backdrop that the uh, government of the DRC, uh, international uh, stakeholders like WHO, International Medical Corps, MSF, Alima, and others uh, are trying to fight the Ebola. And, uh, you know, Ebola response uh, requires a multifaceted control measures. It requires early detection, uh, the isolation of uh, patients, uh, specialized medical care, uh, vaccinations, tracing of contacts, all of this assumes that we have access to the population. It assumes that there's uh, the free 
movement and security of healthcare workers, cooperation um, uh, from the population itself. And all of these measures are challenged by both external and internal factors. So external factors include the violence and the armed conflict. Uh, I, uh, two weeks ago, the uh, Ugandan rebel groups that uh, they based their operations in, the, in and around Beni uh, moved into North Kivu and attacked uh, the cities of uh, Nangina and Makeke, where we have our Ebola treatment center. As a result of the attacks two weeks ago, almost 90% of the population moved towards security into the town of Beni, which actually left our Ebola treatment center as the largest, uh, highest concentration of people within the, the conflict zone. We have to evacuate our patients, we evacuate our staff, and only uh, this past week did we restart operations. So there's conflict, that's an external factor, there's also environmental issues in, in the DRC, where, as I pointed out, after decades of neglect, the health infrastructure is decimated. When we started setting up our Ebola treatment center back in uh, August and September of 2018, we were also doing the assessment of the surrounding areas uh, to um, stand up screening and referral units, right? And you would go into these clinics that have operating theaters, and they have no running water, there's no electricity. I mean, this is what we're dealing with, and even though this is the 10th Ebola outbreak in the DRC, it's the first time it's ever occurred in Eastern Congo. So awareness and understanding of the disease itself is also an issue that the uh, community faced when we went in to try to be able to mitigate uh, and to be able to respond effectively. Complementing external factors are internal factors, the way that humanitarian actors and organizations operate how we set up our operations, how we engage with the community, what we program affects how the community views us, the trust, the social capital uh, that has been pointed out here. And it's a critical factor. Um, the Harvard Humanitarian Institute has been collecting longitudinal data in Eastern Congo for years. Um, and you look at the data and, it, and, and there has been decreasing trust within government institutions with the humanitarian workers. So at the onset of this outbreak, we rushed in. I mean, we have a very effective, robust response. The community set up our Ebola treatment centers. We engaged in surveillance and early detection and vaccinations, right? But from the mindset of the affected community after decades of neglect, this was probably not what they were looking for in terms of assistance. Maternal child health care, water sanitation, nutrition activities, livelihood. And therefore, there's an imbalance between what we were delivering in response to the Ebola outbreak and what actually the community needed and desired. Um, and that mistrust, there, there was a very interesting uh, quantitative study that uh, was carried out in 2018 that linked, again, right, trust and social capital. And that showed that where there was higher levels of mistrust, the uh, ability for uh, compliance with uh, Ebola control measures uh, was not at the same level. Um, so again, these internal factors really do exacerbate the external factors that we have with regard to conflict and with the, the environment. Now, I will end by saying that the humanitarian community over the years has developed very solid operational framework to deal with external factors. Um, how we act in terms of being impartial, neutral, uh, independent, right? Uh, this classical model of humanitarianism uh, has been effective in terms of how we negotiate access. But with conflict occurring now at this rate where on average crises occur for more than seven years, it puts international workers within the community. And therefore there's been an emergence uh, of a perhaps a, uh, a separate operational mandate in terms of perhaps we can characterize that as resilient humanitarianism, where we put the community at the center and we elevate the voices of the affected community, not only to listen to them, but to make sure that they're driving the decisions that we're making and the types of programs that we're making. And I will say that this community uh, learned in real time within three or four months. Uh, we did expand the type of response from our Ebola activities to include maternal child health care, to reflect 
to include uh, water sanitation or wraparound uh, strategies, which then really brought in the affected community to be part of the Ebola response. And I think that that has helped us uh, to be able to be much more impactful, much more effective in terms of what we're doing uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So let me stop there. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to one, one more time kindly ask you, the acoustics in this room are not great. In fact, they're pretty bad, and we'll have to correct that for next year. But I know you don't think your whispering carries, but it's really hard to hear up on the stage. And if you could give the panelists the respect, if you want to have a conversation, take it outside. This is very technical and complex information, and we want all our um, audience to be able to hear what they're saying. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mark, why don't you pick up, um, talk about a little bit um, what um, Carl and um, Key were saying, and how can, you, how can these multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration be strengthened when you're dealing with some of these, you know, both internal and external factors? I mean, some of it is collaboration among sectors, some of it is collaboration with, um, you know, the government and the local actors. Um, and then you're dealing with all these kind of external factors which are, which are beyond your control. Uh, Elise, thank you very much. Once again, thanks to the King Salman Center for a fantastic couple of days. I think, I mean, very much to pick up on what uh, Carl and Dr. Key had said. I mean, firstly, definitely an emphasis has to be on investing the right way before outbreaks occur. And I think part of that is the pre-positioning that Carl referred to, whether that's pre-positioning funds and resources with WHO, uh, with the UN Central Emergency Response Fund. Um, but also I think it applies more broadly to our engagement, uh, thinking about immunization. And immunization is one of the sectors we should uh, perhaps come back to. Uh, thinking about our broader engagement in strengthening health systems uh, around the world. And Dr. Key talked about some of the challenges we see where health systems don't have inherent capacity, running water, electricity uh, in place. We can do all of that ahead of outbreaks to increase resilience. Uh, and then particularly in fragile and conflict affected states, as many people have spoken about, uh, we see these wider factors coming into bear. So alongside the health challenge, we have to think about addressing instability, addressing weaknesses in terms of resilience of basic services, uh, and sometimes weaknesses and lack of capacity and in infrastructure, uh, technical expertise, administrative expertise, to simply respond at scale in the way that is required uh, for these crises. And I think in terms of the internal coordination, that's what you're talking about amongst ourselves as the international community, the importance of the cluster system, the importance of uh, backing the, the leadership of WHO, for which we're all very grateful, uh, and making sure that we're acting as one and getting the most out of our engagements. But I think it's also important about the way we think about it. You talked about the different sectors, uh, health, nutrition, wash, water, sanitation, uh, and I think it's important to bring those all together, but I think there's more. Uh, in terms of how we respond. So we've seen that uh, thinking about conflict sensitivity, designing that into our programs from the start of them is really important. Thinking about safeguarding, uh, thinking about governance, exactly Dr. Key's points. How will communities respond to the government, sometimes turning up in a scale that it hasn't been present in those areas uh, for quite some time. This may be the first at scale interaction that citizens have with their government. How do they respond to that? How do uh, non-state actors respond to that happening in their areas? Uh, and at the same time, that conflict awareness means that uh, different factors think about health facilities in different ways. We all take it for granted that those aren't a target, they shouldn't be targeted. That's not how everyone is approaching that in a conflict setting on the ground. So I, th I think in addition to the sort of health and humanitarian advisors that we traditionally think about, uh, we need to think about social development, governance, conflict, uh, safeguarding advisors, and actually sort of expanding beyond the traditional health cluster to think about how all of these things come together uh, and shape our response. And particularly for fragile and conflict affected states, I think we've had a tendency to uh, underestimate the complexity of engaging in those contexts. And we're currently doing some lesson learning from uh, Eastern DRC that definitely brings that home to us in the context of the Ebola response that uh, the rest of the panel mentioned. And, and crudely, that lesson learning in Eastern DRC for me, me boils down to the fact we, we did quite well collectively working together through this coordination to make sure we made progress in the kind of research, developing vaccines and the tools that we needed on the ground. But frankly, we didn't make the progress we needed to roll out those tools on the ground, the implementation, the support that was needed to actually deliver that. 
uh, was perhaps more challenging and lacking for us. And that ability to engage across those different disciplines to think about community ownership, community buy-in, uh, and to, to bring people together in a complex security setting, I think that's probably one of our big challenges coming up. Um, thanks, Mark. Dr. Fall, one of the things that is becoming increasingly clear is that climate and environmental factors, drought, floods, you know, insects that are spreading disease are affecting not only land management, and which leads to food insecurity, but is affecting the spread of communicable diseases. Talk a little bit about how climate is going to affect disease, and particularly in these humanitarian settings where um, this could actually, we were talking earlier, that this could expand the areas of transmission. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, really important to for everybody to understand the impact of climate change in communicable diseases. We have a number of, you know, epidemic prone diseases we call vector borne diseases transmitted by insects and mainly mosquitoes. We can talk about yellow fever, we can talk about malaria, we can talk about dengue, chikungunya, and uh, many other diseases. So it's really important to see that the map of this vector borne disease is expanding because of, you know, um, climate change. If you look at some areas like even in you know, Northeast DRC, where you have the highland areas where malaria was not so prevalent. We had a malaria outbreak in the context of Ebola outbreak, and it was very challenging to, for the differential diagnostic and what to do with suspected cases. We had to organize a specific malaria response to make sure that we can prevent another communal transmission. For example, children going to the health facilities because of malaria, but getting Ebola because of the poor you know, infection prevention control condition. And uh, it means that uh, in areas where we are not seeing malaria transmission or yellow fever transmission or dengue, we can see now more transmission for these diseases. So we need to anticipate in terms of risk mapping and uh, prevention. And uh, it will be really important to see where we are seeing an increased number of uh, displaced population population with no immunity moving to areas where they can also be affected by all these vector borne diseases and to make sure that we can prevent, you know, big outbreak. At the same time, where we have flooding, like in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, last year, we are likely to have cholera outbreak. Having strong global mechanism like the ICG, you know, interagency coordination mechanism for access to vaccine, for cholera, meningitis, yellow fever is extremely important. And we need to invest more in this mechanism because uh, most of the time you are very concerned in terms of availability of vaccine to respond to multiple outbreaks in many countries. Thanks, Dr. Fall. Carl, also over the last few years we've been talking about the SDGs and how all of them are interrelated. Um, you know, the third one in, in terms of ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all directly targets, um, you know, health improvements. How do you use the SDGs as, uh, you know, a tool and an instrument to support collaboration approaches for um, communicable disease elimination framework to ensure um, sustainability and adaptation? Because when I'm looking at these SDGs, it's, a, it's about eliminating poverty, eliminating hunger, um, clean water and sanitation. I mean, so many of these are all interrelated. You would think that if you're um, fulfilling these SDGs, you're going to have, you're going to really mitigate the risk um, of, of outbreaks and, and you know, early, you know, you can have early detection. Yes. <laughs> no, but I think that's the short uh, answer. The, the SDGs is really the framework also for prevention when it comes to um, uh, emergencies uh, more broadly uh, and conflict and, uh, and what have you. I mean, um, <clears throat> we have now entered uh, what the Secretary General of the United Nations called a, a decade of action. We have 10 more years to go. 
and we really need to make use uh, of these, uh, this framework because it's a unique framework. It's comprehensive, as you said, it's integrated, um, but it's also agreed by all member states of the United Nations. So it is really the one legitimate framework we have to push forward on all of these uh, agendas. All of us have signed up to this, both as donors, but also as uh, member states and recipients of, of, of cooperation. And I think what's unique with SDGs is that it's not this old classic uh, donor recipient. We, it's recognizing that we're all one integrated global world and that we all need to partner really uh, to deliver our, uh, on these. So I think, as I said, the, the short answer is yes. I think uh, the SDGs is really the framework for not only uh, building a sustainable future, but also to prevent disease and disaster more, uh, more broadly. I wanted to pick up what you said before also on, on some of the, uh, the challenges and, 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 and lessons learned. I think, and, and uh, just to, to reiterate what, uh, what Key said about the lack of access uh, and, and the increasing challenges uh, when it comes to respect of international humanitarian law. I mean, this is a trend that we've seen over the past five, 10, maybe 15 years, that uh, the, the respect for these principles are eroding. And this is posing a massive challenge to uh, a humanitarian response system that is already under stress in terms of demands going through the roof and resources not following through. So here is, this is an issue not only for uh, the issue of health, but more broadly, that is uh, 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 of extreme concern. But I would say that what we have seen when it comes to health is that uh, over the past few years, and you know, particularly maybe in Syria, but also elsewhere, uh, health centers have been uh, attacked and deliberately attacked. And this is a trend that uh, is of course outrageous and that needs to, deserves attention uh, and needs a, a serious response. This was, by the way, something we uh, worked on quite actively while we were on the Security Council 1718 and that other members also continue to, to look at. Uh, one other challenge um, which I kind of mentioned, I would say, is that when we look at humanitarian situations, we really need to stay focused on actual needs uh, and be needs-based. And that includes for, uh, of course, the issue of health. And, and as I said before, that we really look at where the actual causes of death is the most, and that we are not carried away by, by what are potentially global uh, threats, uh, or where we see that we have a, you know, supply, if you will, uh, in our response, but that we really remain um, uh, needs-driven. Uh, and in terms of your question on lessons learned, I think one thing that has not been touched upon here yet is that in, in the area of sexual uh, uh, reproductive health and rights, we have seen progress in terms of the response over the past few years. There has been some setback in terms of some donors in some countries you know, changing their approach and policy to this, but in terms of the response and the work on the ground, there has been progress. And what we see in when this is done in a good way is that it has a, a massive multiplying uh, impact in terms of uh, a healthy population. And so I think this is an area that deserves attention and, and more investment, uh, both by donors, but also uh, by the partners on the ground. That's a great point, and that kind of goes into what we were talking about in the morning panel, um, about when you treat women whether it's health, whether it's um, women's rights. I mean, the more you can treat women and the, and the children, you're kind of building up, um, yeah. building up the whole society. But you brought up something um, in terms of um, health centers being attacked, and that kind of goes directly into um, how we improve community engagement and risk communications, especially when there is a lack of trust in government authorities and, and the international community. Um, and Key, I'm gonna throw this to you, but I think now, you know, we've all had a chance to speak. Let's get a free-flowing conversation so anybody just chime in. I mean, um, you know, one of the most famous examples we were talking earlier um, is how in Abbottabad, after one of the doctors was um, caught using um, vaccination um, to work with the, with the U.S. in terms of um, trying to find Osama bin Laden, that was like a, a very public example of how that you know affected trust, um, but we see that you know whether it's um, you know the World Health Organization, the UN, um, often humanitarian workers are targeted, and you know and then there's also the idea of um, 
you know, migrant populations don't want to go to the authorities, they're afraid they're going to get arrested, they're afraid they're going to get deported, um, and how do you, you know, and, and, you know, they don't have access to reporting, they don't have access to information. How do you improve that community engagement when there's a lack of trust in government? So I had mentioned previously, right, we, we have kind of the classical humanitarian model uh, based upon humanitarian principles of neutrality, independence, um, and impartiality. And the resilience agenda, I don't think, is at odds with the classic humanitarian principles. I think it's adding, perhaps, operational means that allows us, perhaps, to have more access to be able to provide for the safety and security of our staff. So I'll use as an example again the uh, our Ebola treatment center, where um, about six months into operations, we were starting to get uh, negative uh, uh, press coverage within a local newspaper from the youth groups um, that did not understand what we were doing because they saw us coming into the community. Um, we built our Ebola treatment center. We put the fences around them. Um, they saw patients coming in, and they saw body bags going out. And uh, as clinicians and focusing on the treatment and, and saving lives, right, community engagement is no longer or can no longer be an afterthought. It has to be part of our programs, and I, and I have to stress this, because without that community acceptance, without that communication, right, we cannot operate. We were at risk of having our bullet treatment center shut down by these youth groups. So it requires this added constant communication with the affected community to explain what we're doing, to be able to tie in that this is impacting them. They may not have a mother or father or brother or sister that has come down with Ebola, but to explain that the transmission of Ebola and how it can impact upon them and why we're doing what we're doing. So community engagement really is something that has to be at the forefront of our humanitarian principles of how we engage with communities. And, you know, when I think back again in terms of impartiality, independence, neutrality, we had 150 years to kind of put this into practice. Um, community engagement right now is something we're talking about. But I'm not so sure that we have proven mechanisms the feedback loops of the community. Are we collecting the data for the sake of collecting the data? Are we actually using this data in real time to be able to change the way that we are providing our assistance? We're doing it, but two or three months after the fact, perhaps it's too long. So there has to be a balance between kind of this rapid data assessment when we're starting up our programs, but in real time investing in the mechanisms so that we are truly providing care that is appropriate and that is needs and based and evidence driven. Thanks, Dr. Fall. Um, I think it's really important to understand the, the context of, of uh, Not Kivu or DRC. So we are operating, you know, you know, this was like 1,000 kilometers. Well, when you talk about community engagement, it's not just one community. Every community is very specific sometimes, and you need to know them and to understand them, and they need to trust them. That's why, you know, and also we have a lot of political manipulation from the opposition groups. For example, in December 2018, when the presidential election was cancelled in North Kivu, a lot of local politicians were Telling to the population, Ebola doesn't exist. They just wanted to exterminate the Nande group, the Nande group, the specific group, in the North Kivu. And it was really important for us to decentralize our operation to the lowest health areas level, meaning that taking the risk to send our people to the most dangerous, to set up community platform where we interact with the communities to understand them and to accept they proposition, you know, by identifying members of the community that should be part of the Ebola response. But before that, you need to educate them also to, for them to, to exactly know what is Ebola and why it's important for them to be involved. 
Unfortunately, for some of the communities, it's only when they started seeing their close rel you know, relative dying that they started trusting that Ebola does exist. And, uh, but we have made a lot of progress. That's why we were able to have impact in all these health areas. We are talking about more than 600 health areas and where we deploy teams. And most of the surveillance is performed now by the community. And we are investigating more than 4,000, you know, alerts a week, you know, to detect Ebola. So very challenging because of the mistrust. We have recorded more than 1,700 security incidents, and 60% of them are related to armed conflict and, and crimes. So we need to take this into account and making sure that the community leaders at the lowest level of the system are involved and are leading the operation there. There's, there's a danger we all violently agree with each other on this. I mean, I, I think it relates to some of the points we brought up earlier about the connectivity between these issues. So, uh, as Dr. Z was, uh, he was saying, you know, the political economy, the need to respond rapidly to what's happening on the ground, that's not just a health response, that's uh, informed by a broader understanding of conflict, of governance, of what's Emergency happening. preparedness, really. Uh, exactly, and this, this emphasis on collaboration and thinking about how communities perceive the international community and the response, again, is not health and isolation. It's about how they perceive their government, about how they perceive the international community as a whole. And we need to be approaching it in that mindset and, and willing to adapt uh, as we get, learn more about how communities are perceiving us. But if I could perhaps also pick up on something Carl said around collaboration, I mean, I think particularly in, in the health space, this is an area where we can't just see these activities in isolation. Uh, the outbreaks may be specific, but the, the threats are shared across all of us uh, and generic, and that's where we need to pull our efforts. Uh, I, I don't particularly want to talk about COVID either, but to put it into context, one of the, the UK's priorities in the health sector is uh, antimicrobial resistance and broader global health security. Uh, that kills around 700,000 people a year. Uh, by 2050, that will wipe $10 trillion off of global GDP and kill 10 million people a year if we don't make progress against it. So it sounds like what you're saying is donors need to prioritize funding or, or allocating resources for a more coherent approach um, in terms of you know, collective outcomes. Absolutely, and very much behind that kind of risk-managed approach uh, that Dr. Dean was talking about in the local context, but across all the different health challenges, let's take a risk-management approach to, to which ones matter. Uh, we in the UK put in about 1.3 billion pounds a year uh, bilaterally into health systems, uh, some of which is going on COVID this year, but a very small part of that is going on COVID. The rest is going on much bigger threats. Uh, and I think there's opportunities for us to collaborate uh, through a series of mechanisms. Uh, one we'll be championing this year is the Global Vaccines Alliance. Uh, we're hosting the next replenishment event in London in the summer. Um, but that's an example of where uh, countries can come together, pool our resources, get economies of scales in purchasing vaccines and deploying them at a level that's simply not replicable at an individual country level. Uh, and we hope we'll see 300 million children immunized as a, on the back of that and 7 million lives saved. And that's an example of just where that, that economy of scale and collective action is essential. Because if we do that on our own, we just simply can't achieve those kind of results in the international system. Okay, I'll, I think we're, get, we're gonna get a little technical now. Um, how are global strategies, and I'm gonna just throw it out there and let's just pick it up as we want. How are global strategies for cholera, malaria, dengue, measles, yellow fever, and other diseases being implemented currently in this humanitarian context? I know Dr. Fall knows all the answers. You wanna start there and then, and then we can um, have the rest of the panel pick up on how they're dealing with it. Um, thank you. Um, as I was saying, for some of the high impact diseases like malaria, yellow fever, cholera, we have a global strategy and global partnership mechanism and this is really important in terms of uh, mapping the burden of diseases, making sure that we prioritize where investment should go to prevent diseases and also to take care of people who are sick. For malaria, we have the global malaria elimination strategy and with uh, the, 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 the 10 plus one initiative, when you said 10 plus one is the 10 high burden countries in Africa, 
plus India. So if you look at the 10 high burden countries, you have countries like DRC again, like Nigeria, like Ethiopia, also where you have this complex humanitarian setting, but where you also need to implement specific disease prevention and control program like malaria. And uh, we have a number of partners, mainly the Global Fund and some bilateral like the US, UK, supporting this global elimination program. So what is important is really what we call stratification and uh, risk analysis based on the level of transmission, the level of prevalence to prioritize investment at local level. You should go at local level. Wait, huh? Show of hands here, um, Carl, Mark, Key. When you're looking to um, implement an operation in country, maybe there is an, an outbreak of disease, um, to what extent um, is you know, emergency preparedness prevention um, for these type of diseases, cholera, malaria, dengue, measles, top of mind? Um, Mark. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure how I show a hand to that. Yeah, it's, well, definitely, uh, it's definitely top of mind. I mean, uh, exactly as Dr. Ibrahima said, uh, I mentioned the, the Global Vaccines Alliance, but similarly the... the yeah, we're going to talk about for, um, new yeah. technologies and vaccines. Yeah, but the, the, the Global Fund for AIDS, Malaria, Tuberculosis, and Neglected Tropical Diseases, I mean, this has to be in a coordinated approach to develop research vaccines together. Um, it's simply not possible to do it on an ad hoc uh, separate bilateral basis. So we, we have to pull our resources to get the effects we're looking for. And that doesn't mean we don't all have a role to play, but we, we have to play it together. Otherwise, we just can't get the economies of scale and the advancements we need to see. I see Carl, I see you're well, nodding. No, just to say, I mean, what I said before, that for us, it's not, we don't do this country by country. I mean, we invest in the system. We are like a platform in, in the platform, I guess you can call it. I mean, uh, all of these funds that have been mentioned here, uh, Sweden is a top contributor. And so really that's what we believe in to make sure that we strengthen the system and make sure there is flexible and fast money um, should, um, should crisis arise and, 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 and that the systems itself can deal with it rather than we sitting in Stockholm choosing countries and, and, and modes of, of, of intervention. Uh, but I think when we're now you know, what I, what I didn't mention before, because I focus so much on the emerging response, is of course that we are also engaged in the health sector in our development partnerships. Um, and that is done also bilaterally uh, on occasion. And here, of course, I think, you know, just to underline what has been said, that the, what, what really needs to be done is to strengthen universal health coverage and, and to strengthen uh, the, the national health systems and the local health systems. And in doing so, of course, which has been also discussed here, in building long-term partnerships with local communities uh, so that trust is there uh, and, and, and the preparedness is then there should, should uh, emergencies, emergencies arise. So while we jump straight into the emergency side of the, of the, of the coin, I think it's important to just have that said, that what, what is really important here is, of course, to invest uh, in, in long-term in, in the health, national health systems and, 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 and to key, support the universal that, health system. Key, I guess that leads to you know, a more predictable and more preventable humanitarian health action. Yeah, I think just to get back to the, the measles, malaria, polio, right? I mean, these are treatable diseases. We know how to treat them. Uh, the issue here, as I pointed out here, is that in a conflict setting, right, it's like public health in reverse. The, the system isn't there, the preparedness isn't there, and, and an initiative that WHO is leading, I think, helps us in terms of being able to be quicker, be more mobilized, more systematic. So they are standing up emergency medical teams, they're verifying international teams to ensure that when there's a crisis, that if a team is going to mobilize, that the local Ministry of Health understands and knows who's coming in, and we know that they have capacity. So the International Medical Corps is currently going through the verification process, and it's helped us. It's helped us identify our systems to see where our gaps are. It requires us to be able to have surge capacity, not only in terms of personnel, but equipment and medicine supplies, and, and, and we sign on to the fact that if we're called to respond, we will be on the ground within 72 hours to start scaling effectivity. Mm -hmm. So there's innovation that's taking place, and I also want to tie in a comment 
to the panel uh, earlier today around evidence. You know, when we think about evidence and we think about Ebola, think about this. This is the first time in the DRC that we're fighting or managing an Ebola outbreak in a complex setting. So as pointed out here, the, the conflict, there's been armed and targeted attacks against Ebola workers. We've lost lives. It has uh, uh, caused us to be able to suspend activities. But in the midst of all of these external factors, the government uh, you know, has engaged in a clinical trial that the International Medical Corps has been part of, the, the POM trial. And for the first time in history, in terms of battling Ebola, we now have two therapies in a clinical trial that have been proven effective. So even in the midst right, of a conflict of dealing with an Ebola outbreak, there's innovation that's taking place that is allowing us now clear evidence as to something that will work and help us in terms of mitigating and respond to a future uh, uh, outbreak. So definitely there are things happening that we can look towards as positive influences that hopefully for the next outbreak will allow us to be quicker, timelier, and be more effective in our response. Okay, warning, coronavirus is going to come up soon. Um, Dr. Fall, picking up on that, what efforts, you know, there are specific strategies to deal with infectious hazards like cholera, malaria, dengue, we've talked about polio, yellow fever, um, and, and the recent outbreaks as we've been talking about have driven innovation with the de development of new di diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, but there are other high threat pathogens for which there are no medical countermeasures, the, the coronavirus, the and we'll talk about that a little in more detail, but what efforts are being made to accelerate the development and rollout of new diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics for uh, priority diseases? Uh, thank you. Um, two years ago, the, the WHO emergency program started a research and development program, the R&D blueprint, where we identify prior to disease around 10 diseases where we need to work with uh, our reference centers, with experts, the private sector. We have more than 50 institutions working with us, you know, for vaccine development, for therapeutics, a number of diseases like uh, most of the viral hemorrhagic diseases like Ebola, Marburg, Cayman Congo, Lassa fever are part of this blueprint. We are also the mask of the SARS, and we are using this platform now for the COVID-19. Right. If you didn't invest two years ago, with a lot of support from DFID, actually, if you didn't invest in R&D blueprint, we will not be in a position to quickly bring together all experts working on the COVID-19. That's an important point. I just want to repeat what he, what he said, that the platforms they're using um, to look at the coronavirus were used in MERS and, um, and others. So, so it's good that you had that platform in place. In fact, Dr. Lu was talking about the therapeutics in DRC for Ebola, the vaccine, the same. We use the same around the blueprint platform to accelerate the development of the vaccines against Ebola and the therapeutics. And now with this platform, we are having three teleconferences a week with experts around the world for vaccine and for therapeutics against the coronavirus. And we have had a meeting in Geneva early in February, bringing together experts physically, but also people from China and other countries who couldn't travel or virtually connected to contribute to the priority identification for research and development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here it comes, folks. Um, I, I think one of the, um, yesterday, there was a lot of discussion in the first panel about coronavirus, but I think it was talked about in more of um, a political context, whereas um, I think we didn't have a real opportunity, um, which is unfortunate, to talk about um, the virus itself. Talk to us a little bit, Dr. Fall, about the differences in transmission, okay, between a cholera and Ebola um, and a COVID, because you know, all these things we've been talking about, whether it's SDGs or climate or such, like, it, it seems as if diseases like um, cholera and Ebola are, are, are more, you know, you can, you can mitigate the, the risk. But it seems with COVID, it's a little bit difficult. Um, we have many groups 
of the type of disease depending on the mean of transmission most of the time. When we talk about waterborne diseases, for example, we have cholera, typhoid fever, hepatitis E, and uh, this type of outbreak happen almost simultaneously at the same place because people don't have access to safe water, the level of hygiene is very bad. So by drinking and safe water. Drinking contaminated water. Contaminated water or food, you can contact you know, this type of diseases. So when people are educated and provided with a mean to prevent this type of disease, you can have an impact. Unfortunately, sometimes we are obliged to have some emergency response using the OCVs, or oral cholera vaccine to respond to this type of outbreak. We have heard simultaneously in the leg chat bassin, you know, outbreak of hepatitis E, cholera in very vulnerable population. It was very challenging and with huge impact on pregnant women. We really need to invest more to prevent them. So when you talk about other diseases like vector-borne diseases, this is transmitted by mosquitoes. But if you wait until the population of mosquitoes is really active, it's also difficult to start preventing them. Investing on environment management, also on some specific intervention, depending on the type of mosquito for vector control is, is important. Now, coming to diseases like the coronavirus, where the transmission is through droplet, you need to be in a close contact with- It's not bodily fluids, it's breathing. It's, yeah, it's, so you need to be in close contact with the person who is sick, we, have, we know that there were reports of people without symptoms who transmitted the disease, but they were starting the disease with no symptoms at the stage, but the transmission is mainly driven by people who are symptomatic. So it's really important to keep you know, the distance between people to make sure that you have basic hygiene condition like hand washing, and, uh, and, but it's so important to prioritize protection for health workers because they are the most exposed. They need to have the required personal protective equipment. And for people who are sick also and, uh, to use the, the mask we require and everything we need to isolate people, but also to be able to quickly detect cases by close contact monitoring. So for Ebola, it's, it's different because uh, you know, the transmission is through also close contact, but through body fluids and uh, so on. So it's mainly family cluster transmission, and that's why educating the population for, you know, community surveillance and rapid detection isolation is crucial for impact. And I was mentioning the number of community alerts we are getting in DRC and to investigate them and to able to detect early enough and treat cases because now we have treatment. We have the vaccine, we can prevent more. We can vaccinate around cases, but also we have a chance to save life when people go early enough to the treatment center. Okay, I want to put this, I want to put Corona now in a humanitarian setting. And guys, jump in here. I know we're, you know, um, uh, at least 12 million refugees and IDPs are living between Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Turkey. Um, countries linked to Iran by travel. We're not talking about political or sanctions or anything. We're talking about the movement of people. Um, migration routes, shared borders, a lot of them porous. Um, you know, Iran is hosting um, one million refugees from Afghanistan, and hopefully, um, God willing, the peace process will go smoothly and, some, and a lot of them will return home. Um, so how can medical facilities and conflict zones cope with COVID and stop, contain and stop the spread. When people are coming in, people are going out, there's not a lot of reporting in these camps. I, I think it's fair to say that refugees are missing from this equation right now. I, I mean, I know we're on this panel thinking of it, but you know, we're hearing very little public discussion about how it's impacting refugees while a cruise liner with tourists you know, got more press and policy attention um, you know, through, through the international community. Um, you know, we talked about how cholera and others are transmitted through water and food, but we're talking of, with, with COVID about rapid detection and isolation. How, it seems like the idea of migrants and moving populations um, 
that's totally antithetical to how you mitigate the spread. So this is an additional challenge and even more complex. You have seen that even wealthy tourists are being affected by the coronavirus because they travel to high-risk areas. But we have seen also that all countries are at risk because this last Friday we upgraded our risk assessment that they showed to very high everywhere in the world. And when you have migrant population, first, we don't know before they move, you know, the level of exposure to the coronavirus uh, because we don't have the health services with them to be able to assess them. When they move also to areas where they can be exposed to additional risk, it's very challenging because you don't have the surveillance system in place, you don't have the health services to offer to them. So this is a very challenging situation and we need to make sure that in when countries prepare for their population, they take into account this specific population by providing, you know, what they need in terms of human rights and access to health services. He, um, um, Mr. Sita, the director of health and um, uh, the World Health Organization's special representative at UNRWA, said that, you know, he's worried that, um, you know, 5.5 million Palestinians are at risk. And that takes us directly back to the trust issue. Um, you know, that they're not trusting local authorities um, to be able to get that access, trust the reporting, trust what they should do. I mean, how do you break that cycle before you have an outbreak that you can't contain, that, that spreads? I, mean, I guess part of this, you know, the, the communication and ensuring that those voices are factored in and are driving how we program and how we make decisions. And, and this is an appeal here. There's a lot of donors in the room, right? Uh, you have DFID and OFDA, right? And, and, and others in the room here, um, is, is to build in that flexibility. And one of the things I would point out here is that as the humanitarian system has become more professionalized, and we talked about the cluster system, um, the specialization, right? Part of that movement of professionalism and, and systemizing things creates, in a way, a negative um, inflexibility into the system. So if we're dealing with an outbreak in terms of, of coronavirus here, there are agencies that are on the ground that are in the affected community. They may be programming nutrition. They may be working on gender-based violence. They may be in a shelter sector, but they may have the capacity to reprogram those funds in real time to be able to deal with the outbreak. So it's, it's using what is, is available, and it's not always international actors, it's also going to local organizations, local governments, and ensuring that they have the resources needed. So that trust factor you know, is built up over time. And one of the, I guess the, it's a long way of answering your question, is that use the organizations that are there, that have the trust of the community, and make sure that there's enough flexibility where if they have resources, they can reprogram that. Or if they don't, plus them up because it's better than bringing in another agency that's going to require three or four months in order to stand up their operations, get their people in, get their resources in, get the warehouse, get the logistics in place. Use what's there. I mean, it's first responder, it's local responders. Uh, Carl, you talked a little bit about this earlier, about the need to kind of give resource, immediate resources. Do you think that what he said, that organizations are nimble enough to be able to kind of reprogram, whether it's people, resources, or funding? No, because not enough donors are providing core support. Uh, the trend is rather the contrary. I mean, in 2015, there was a big meeting in Istanbul on humanitarian affairs where everyone agreed on what was called then uh, the grand bargain, where Donors would uh, provide more flexible, uh, predictable funding in return for a more coordinated and effective system. I mean, that's a simplification of, of what was quite a complex deal. But uh, we have not seen enough progress on there. Uh, on the contrary, I think over the past couple of years, uh, except for a few donors, uh, uh, many go in the, in the other direction of more earmarking and more projectification of, of their interventions. And so I think that 
this needs to be, um, you know, this needs to be brought back to the attention. Uh, we need to provide incentives and the trust needed for donors to go in the direction of, of more unearmarked and more flexible funding, more predictable funding. Uh, I mean, DFID is exemplary in this. Uh, Sweden has also um, uh, done a good job uh, in, in this regard. Uh, others are, uh, are, are, some are moving in the right direction, others are in the wrong direction. I think this needs to be uh, discussed because uh, it's only when organizations like WHO, NGOs, uh, but this is broader, WFP, I think it's the most critical here. It's only when these organizations have that kind of uh, uh, flexible funding base that they will be able to, be, to address quickly and be nimble and, and flexible, uh, uh, as you said. I think on, on, on Corona, though, I think it's important to, rem to remember here again that it's not considered um, a humanitarian emergency by the criteria established for humanitarian funding. I, I, I'm going to stop you. I understand what you're saying, but I think what we're asking here is could it become one? And is, does there a certain need to emergency preparedness to make sure um, that you're not you know, throwing money at the pro and resources at the yeah. problem to to stop it, as opposed to preventing it. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's a good point that you're making because WHO is basically leading on both, both on emergencies and on addressing these uh, non-humanitarian um, outbreaks like we Corona. And I think there is discussion to be had on how they actually uh, relate, uh, how they overlap, and how uh, you know capacity built for one can be used uh, for the other. Uh, and I'm, may, maybe Dr. Fall can comment on that, but I think that's uh, a discussion that we as uh, strong supporters of both legs of WHO, for example, would want to have a, a serious discussion and see how we can contribute towards. Um, Mark, and then Dr. Fall. I mean, uh, just, just to pick up, I think absolutely, uh, I mean, hopefully we do some of this, but I think there's a need for all of us to think about how we can do more kind of iterative, adaptive programming, enabling our partners to respond faster to events. But it, it does come back to this collaboration point and the risk management point. And right. The reason we're all backing uh, WHO to lead on COVID-19 response is so that they can target those countries and settings that require it more. Uh, those that are most at risk and most vulnerable uh, need the support, and we rely on WHO to help us identify who those are and channel our support to them. So where we're providing assistance, uh, DFID, for example, is providing assistance to WHO, uh, we're going to deploy some technical experts to Brazzaville. That's because that's what the WHO have told us is the most important bit of the response. Uh, to pick up on your, your, the second part, absolutely, I think for, for all of these uh, issues, we need to think about what it means in sort of conflict, fragile, emergency, and refugee context. But I think, uh, and Dr. Ibrahim will correct me if I'm wrong, so far, thankfully, we haven't seen COVID-19 in a right. refugee camp or a refugee camp. Uh, I mean, when it gets there, it'll be really bad, but there's some uh, element of isolation that is going to reduce the prospects of it getting there in the first place. But in the current context, and I thought Mark Lowcock spoke very well about this on the first day, I mean, the greatest threat to that uh, Syrian refugee population coming out of Idlib is not COVID-19. Uh, it's some very real uh, and unfortunate standard humanitarian responses, a lack of shelter, a lack of basic medical right. supplies, a lack of services. So we need to factor it into our response, and absolutely, if it gets there, uh, it will be really bad. Because as we said earlier, if you think about how much these people are suffering from lack of water, lack of sanitation, lack of shelter, to compound um, with, an out, with an outbreak of whether it's um, COVID or any communicable disease, the suffering will just be, uh, you'd think it's unimaginable now. It, it would become even worse. Dr. Fall. You're absolutely right. I was. I love it when the panelists say you're absolutely right. <laughs> now, I was mentioning the issue of risk and vulnerability. Is this really what we need to, to be able to identify those who are most at risk and living in a very fragile condition? That's why Dr. Tedros kept saying the impact in, you know, weak health system will be used if you have the COVID-19 in certain countries. And uh, that's why also the strategic response plan we have developed for preparedness and response is targeting those vulnerable countries for more resources, more technical assistance. And we started early enough by deploying you know, resources for diagnostic and 
sending team to build capacity for isolation and so on. It's really important also to look at the way we are coordinating with OCHA under the UN Crisis Management Group. And OCHA, OCHA is already releasing 15 million US dollars for the most vulnerable countries to make sure that they can start preparing and putting in place prevention system. Yeah, I want to go back to the trust question because there also needs to be trust between donors and their implementing partners. Um, I, I go back in time uh, a while ago, I was with the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance where many of you might remember the Good Humanitarian Donorship Initiative. So back in 05, 06, I, I co-chaired that with uh, counterparts within Sweden. And the whole purpose of, of the Good Humanitarian Donorship Initiative was how can donors streamline processes and procedures that allows partners to actually do the work. And we fast forward from that time to now, and I'm on the other side with the International Medical Court, and I have to tell you, the, the, the amount of, of, of work that our staff, that we hire and you want us to put on the ground, that our clinicians, that our emergency responders, not to be doing paperwork, you want them in the field, you want them to be in the clinics, you want them saving lives. And yet, it takes hours and weeks to be able to report back to be able to guarantee that we're delivering the work. That is a cost to, in terms of how much resources flow to the beneficiaries. So it's an appeal again here in terms of the trust as well for implementing partners to allow us to be able to do the work as a partner. And one last appeal here is that I've also seen a shift between accountability. When we're operating in a Syria context or in Yemen, things will happen. It's a conflict, it's a complex emergency, things go wrong. And with the movement these days around compliance, unfortunately, a lot of that has been shifted to the implementing partner to take all the risk. If there's something that happens, the disallowance is on us. And it's easier to take it out on them. So please, again, I mean, I would appeal again for trust and partnership with your implementing partner. We are in this together. That's a great point. Um, I'm going to open it up in a minute, but I think this is a panel on communicable diseases, but Dr. Fall and I were talking earlier that we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about non-communicable diseases. And Dr. Um, Sita, who um, was with UNRWA and unfortunately was unable to join us today because of uh, Canara virus restrictions made a point that it's non-communicable diseases like diabetes, um, hypertension, cardiovascular, cancer, and respiratory conditions um, are by far the largest health burden to, you know, Palestinian refugees, but also Dr. Fall and I were talking that, um, you know, this is really people in these high-risk, fragile situations um, you know, they may escape cholera, but then they're going to die of diabetes or, or hypertension. So, Dr. Fall, talk about that a little bit. Oh, I think this is a very important question because most of the time we are focusing on communicable diseases, but if you look at the double burden of communicable and non communicable diseases, including in, you know, humanitarian setting, many people are dying from non communicable diseases. I was WHO representative in Mali some years ago. When I just started, I realized that in the health clusters, they didn't accept an NGO that was called Sante Jabet because they were only working on diabetes. So I had to work hard to make them accept that diabetes should be part of you know, the health cluster. I, I would think that's Open. one of the really bad things because these people don't have access to you know, low sugar foods or you know, their, their diet, like beggars can't, really can't be choosers here. They don't have yeah. access to exercise or any, yeah. you know, kind of clean living. In fact, when we did the assessment in terms of access even to insulin, they can stay months, the displaced population without access to insulin. And when we assess the availability of basic health services, the most affected area was really related to non-communicable diseases and maternal health. So we end up organizing some kind of mobile team with, you know, experts from the capital to the most remote area. I think it's really, really important when we talk about investment, 
health cluster to take into account all type of risk. It's not about outbreak only, but we need to address non-communicable disease, including mental health. This is a big need in all humanitarian settings. Um, yes or no, Carl, do you think I, of that when you're... Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what uh, was said about mental health. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, that's a huge issue uh, in, in emergency context. Uh, uh, the Dutch government has taken leadership in, in drawing attention to this and also mobilized more resources. It's something we support and, and commend because uh, it's also something that has not been given uh, due attention in the past and, and, and it has a multiplying effect because it, uh, if mothers are affected uh, by mental health problems, that's something that is passed on to children and, and uh, has implications for the broader coping mechanisms of, of, of the family. And so, and there is also a stigma around this, which, you know, is not only for emergencies. I think that's something also in, in Sweden and other countries, but I think particularly in this context um, where uh, the share of the population uh, uh, having these kinds of problems are, are so large, it's something that really deserves uh, more attention. Um, okay, I think we're going to open it up um, to the audience. Um, I'd like you, it, when they bring a microphone around, we're going to bring a microphone to the front row here to Dr. Mahmoud Malik, who's the World Health Organization's representative in Somalia. His counterpart in Yemen um, said that um, the Yemen program um, compared to the uh, program in Somalia is far bigger, but Somalia really punches above his weight. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Malik, um, talk to us about your experience in Somalia um, in terms of, you know, containing outbreaks, managing health situations there, um, and, and talk about, you know, he's also a communicable disease expert. So, Dr. Malik, share with us um, some of your thoughts as we're closing our panel. Thank you very much. I think what we need to do in the settings like Somalia and other humanitarian contexts is to do things rightly, do things correctly, and be credible to our partners. Because unless we are transparent, I think we are always behind the curve. In the context of Somalia, in the last few years, we have managed, I think, massive outbreak of cholera, the measles, and also other communicable disease outbreaks. The key was for containing this outbreak or controlling the outbreak was to implement some evidence-based interventions. Because unless you follow the strategy that is working and that follows the best practices globally and that is contextualized on the situations, you will never be able to contain this outbreak. I think it is important to understand the context because we have talked about the mental health issues, NCD, non-communicable disease. If the context is different, then one size will not fit all. So you need to understand the burden of diseases in that context. What strategy will work well? And in humanitarian context, we also need to be sure that there is always a pressure from the donors. But you have to do things correctly. Maybe time is essence, but you have to also be sure that you have to do things correctly. And correctly means you put in place the right intervention and right strategy, making sure that intervention or strategy has the greatest and maximum public health benefit. So if you follow this strategy and if you are transparent, and one of the information that was I want to pick up from there is to sharing the information. You need to monitor the health situations. You need to monitor the impact of our intervention on a regular basis, seeing whether your intervention is having an impact in controlling the outbreak. If not, you change the strategy, you change the interventions. Often we are ignoring this sort of simple common sense issues because then you are always behind the curve. So given again the context of Somalia, I would say that when you have a weak governance, the weak management capacity, there is expectation that agencies like WHO and the uh, other UN agencies should be proactive in managing the outbreak because we have seen that the outbreaks can cause health security threats. Mm -hmm. And this is the situation what we are seeing in coronavirus. That's a great point about security. So that is the important thing, that there will be a cross-border uh, spread of the diseases because their neighboring countries are always guarding their border. And they will put their finger to you that you have not been able to contain this outbreak. So in order to achieve those things, I would say that during the peacetime, 
we need to build national institutions. And that's the only way forward that you can manage outbreaks effectively and efficiently during these wartime situations. So my appeal to the donor community would be to invest during the peacetime on building the national public health institution. That's a great, that's a great point. Talk to us about the trust issue, because particularly in Somalia, you know, we've talked in kind of general terms about trust, but particularly in Somalia, um, you know, health workers are targeted. Look, health workers have been targeted in some areas, not throughout the country. The reason is that you need to have the right messaging to the people, to the community at large, that health workers are not your enemy. They are here to serve you. They are here to serve the vulnerable populations. Again, I would like to highlight the fact and the word transparency. You have to be very transparent. You have to give the right messages at the right time to the community so that the trust is built. But this trust needs to be built during the peacetime, not during the wartime. So you need to have a system in place, a strategy in place, to make sure that that community engagement, that community perception towards the healthcare workers is perfect or correct as much as possible. So that's the way we need to work together. And this is a collective responsibility, not only for the agencies like WHO and other UN agencies. All donors have to understand this is a collective responsibility. Thanks, Dr. Malik. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, if you have a question, um, can you raise your hand and um, identify yourself? Thanks. Amr Muhammad Mazhari. Masa al khair. Dr. Faisal Al Awadi, Wazir of the Islam of Yemen. لدي بعض الأسئلة ربما بحكم عملي كصحفي وهو أن مصدر أهم مصدر الآن من مصادر الأمراض بسبب الصراعات والحروب فالسؤال هنا ما مدى التنسيق بين منظمة الصحة العالمية وبعض المنظمات الدولية العاملة في هذا المجال وأهمها منظمة الصليب الأحمر الدولية وأطباء بلا حدود هل تترك منظمة الصحة العالمية لوحدها أم تستعين بهؤلاء وتتكامل الجهود السؤال الثاني ذكر المتحدثون أن من أسباب عدم القضاء على بعض الأمراض في كثير من الدول وخاصة الأمراض المستوطنة مثل الملاريا وغيرها يرجع إلى ضعف الأداء في المرافق الصحية وهنا سؤال يعني سأطرحه عن حول شكوى قد لا تكون مسموعة ولكنها موجودة وهو أن هناك احتكار لبعض المستويات العلمية التي لا نحصل عليها من الدول المتقدمة حتى ولو ابتعثنا بعث الطلاب لا يحصلون على مستوى التعليم في بعض المجالات والسؤال هنا هل تمتلك منظمة الصحة العالمية رؤية لعمل ميثاق أخلاقي في أن الحقيقة العلمية يجب أن يتساوى فيها الجميع وسؤال أخير وهو هل Dr. Fall. Dr. Fall, why don't you just answer about your um, coordinate? The question was, um, does the World Health Organization coordinate with other organizations? I think the, the talks on the panel suggest that you do, but maybe you could fill that in. And about sharing science, a good point. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. In terms of coordination, I think it is important that, to know that when we have uh, an outbreak, it is not only WHO working to respond to the outbreak. We, we have what we call the strategic response plan with a number of pillars. In this pillar, you have the specific health expertise, where you have WHO, you have some NGOs like uh, Medicine Sans Frontières, or Dr. Wizard Border, like Alima, like uh, Dunk, uh, your organization. <laughs> I cannot miss you. 
And we have some even, you know, bilateral contract for case management, for example, for, for Ebola in, in Congo uh, with IMC and uh, Alima. And in addition to that, we have a number of pillars like community engagement where UNICEF is the lead. We, in the community engagement, we also have community engagement beyond the specific disease where you have the World Bank, you have the OCHA and all this. So WHO help to strengthen coordination by national authorities and to make sure that uh, we have the right plan, the right monitoring system, working with OCHA and other partners, but we never work alone to respond to emergencies. Is there an outbreak or disaster? We always make sure that this is done in partnership, not only at the county level, but also at global level. I mentioned the global outbreak alert and response mechanism where we work with so many institutions around the world to be deployed. We have the emergency medical team as well. So it's really a partnership and coordination work. In terms of knowledge of, and science, I will just share one concrete example. Within the WHO emergency program, we have what we call the Open WHO. This is a free platform where we have a number of courses and models accessible to everybody everywhere in the world. We have a number of people working in, in poor countries in the most remote districts who are accessing these courses. Only for the COVID-19, we already have more than 40,000 people who registered to this course. 40,000 people. Yeah. And this is very dynamic and interactive because anytime we have a new, you know, disease outbreak or priority, we work very quickly while developing guidelines also to update our platform for open access for learning. I think this is a concrete example on how we transfer knowledge as well. But you have all the mechanisms, of Thank course. Thank you. Okay, sir, right here. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. I'm Muhammad Mashali. I'm Mushrif al and Wuraid al-Baramij in the region of the Gaza region. أبغى أسأل عن الأمراض المعدية ما هي الأسباب لهذه الأمراض وهل في هناك أمراض يعني من صناعة البشر كحرب بيولوجية بس شكرا. Who wants to take that one? Man-made diseases. Dr. Fall, I think it's going to rely on you. Okay, I think even before the new technologies, we have seen. You know, in the past centuries, big uh, outbreak of infectious diseases without uh, necessary, you know, the action of, of, of the man. So, but right now we all know about the risk of bioterrorism and so on. So when we talk about preparedness, we need to take into account both, you know, natural outbreak, but also possible bioterrorism is important as part of the global health security and every country preparedness for, for health security. We cannot ignore the possibility of bioterrorism using the pathogen we already know at some manipulated pathogen. This is important. Good, good point. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, sir, I see you right there. I want to see if there's a woman first. Um, since we uh, have an all-male panel, too. Uh, let's go to this, this woman right here in the front, and then we'll go to you, sir. First of all, welcome in Saudi Arabia. We open our hearts before we shake hands with you. <laughs> and excuse Just me. Just wash them first. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. With respect and uh, love and peace. And excuse me, I would like to speak Arabic, the mother language. I thank all the efforts that have been made from the government of the Prime Minister of Salman to know myself. I am Noura Shaban, the President of the Human Rights of the Human Rights and the Human Rights and the Human Rights of the Saudi Arabia. I would like to thank you for joining me at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning بجلسة نقاش محددة توضح ما هي نسبة ما تحقق من توصيات المنتدى السابق وما هي خطتنا الاستراتيجية القادمة ما هي الأدوات الفاعلة التي توصلنا لإيجاد حلول عملية اثنين 
كنت أتمنى أن نستضيف في جلسة مخصصة لعدد من اللاجئين لعرض الصعوبات والعقبات والنجاحات كقصص واقعية لتكون قيمة مضافة للإنجازات الحقيقية التي توضح الجهود الحقيقية لمستقبل البشرية ليكون هذا المنتدى المنصة التي توصل صوتهم الحقيقي للعالم أنا شخصياً حبست دموعي عندما شاهدت معرض الفن الإنساني والذي فعلاً كان يوصل الكثير من الرسائل اللي أتمنى بعد نهاية هذه الجلسة والتوصيات أنهم يزوروه لأنه كان فعلاً رائع يتحدث عن قيم كثيرة أكرر شكري نحن دائماً في المملكة العربية السعودية نستقبلكم بكل الحب وكل الاحترام والتقدير والسلام وشكراً لإدارتك المتميزة You were really amazing moderator Thank you so much for the management of this session Thank you Thank you very much um, Carl, I'm going to throw it to you Um, talk about, you know, have, how, how have we done in the last year um, in terms of, you know, we have goals every year in terms of what we want to achieve in terms of, of huma the humanitarian space. Mm -hmm. um, talk about some of the progress in the last year um, and, and some of the challenges that you, you think need to be addressed in the year ahead. I'll, um, yeah. After you do that, I'll, I'll uh, talk about specifically um, some of the recommendations World Health Organization? Well, I think, the, like Mark Lowcock said yesterday as well, there is recognition that uh, the system is getting uh, better, uh, more effective, uh, and more accountable in terms of delivering uh, assistance, uh, and, and that that is increasing by the year. But at the same time, the challenges are, are also increasing, and the needs are increasing. So the gap between what can be addressed and the needs uh, remain, if you will, if not uh, increasing. So, but I think there needs to be this recognition that in terms of our preparedness, in terms of the effectiveness, in terms of the, um, the delivery of the system, there, there has been progress and there continues to be uh, progress. Looking at country context, unfortunately there isn't much good news out there. But maybe point to one uh, context where I know also we have representatives, if not, if not in the room at this forum, and that's Sudan. Uh, where we have seen important uh, positive developments over the past year. And I think here it is very important now that the international system steps up and really support the Sudanese in this effort. It's an impressive uh, transformation that is very much uh, Sudanese-led and Sudanese-owned, uh, but they have now uh, reached a phase where the international community needs to step up. And this is both in terms of addressing humanitarian needs, which are actually increasing, um, uh, and, and to ensure that this support is sustained in the humanitarian field. But even more importantly, of course, that uh, the development assistance uh, uh, in a significant fashion can move in uh, quickly uh, in order to support this transition. Um, sir, um, you want to raise your hand? I'm going to ask you to really keep it m like a mini question because we have to close exactly at four so that we go to the recommendations. Can someone run a, a microphone over this gentleman right here? Raise your hand, sir. Yep. Can we get a microphone? Shui, shui. Uh, I, as, as you uh, said, it will, it will be very short uh, question. So I worked in several epidemics uh, in uh, Horn of Africa, Middle East, and, nor and, and North African countries. And uh, one of the worst uh, points, actually, in all of these epidemics is uh, to have a very weak uh, uh, surveillance system because of lack of uh, 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 good laboratories for like bicep level two or three laboratories in, in, the, in our regions, and I mean in the Horn of Africa, but curly, and also uh, Middle East and North Africa. So also the lack of diagnostic tools to, uh, for, for tropical diseases in particular. Uh, I don't know um, uh, in the, the efforts for WHO, I know the whole university in the world so are developing this kind of tools, but uh, uh, what is the role of uh, WHO and other uh, UN institutions and other institutions 
to support this kind of uh, essential uh, tools to uh, early diagnosis and early response and to minimize the, uh, the epidemics uh, uh, outcome in, uh, either as in, in, in uh, uh, casualties or, I mean, or, or economy or politics. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fall. you're in the hot seat. Thank you. This is a very important point. The capacity in terms of lab diagnosis is a key component of the health security, but also of, the, of our health system. So we need really to bring together our investment in the general health system and what we need to do in terms of health security. If it is fragmented, it will be difficult to have all this capacity. And if you look at all the joint external evaluation of the international health regulation, you can see throughout Africa that the capacity to detect is, is weak. And uh, just to give you an example for yellow fever, if you go back three years ago, there was only one reference laboratory for the entire Africa in the Institute Pasteur of Data. And uh, under this uh, air strategy, eliminating yellow fever outbreak, we have a plan to have six reference laboratories. Now we have two additional in Uganda and another one in Cameroon. To just give you an example, even Nigeria, this big country, we don't have a reference laboratory for, for yellow fever, and we are investing a lot to build that capacity, not only for yellow fever, but for other diseases like Lassa in Nigeria. And uh, we can, I can say the same for other prior to diseases. So we need to make sure that while we are investing in the health security, every investment on primary health care and the health system also prioritize the laboratory, but because our capacity to control outbreak depends on the timely detection and rapid response. If you are missing detection because you have to send sample, you know, from one country to another, it's very difficult. For, when I was in Mali, we have to send sample for Ebola testing to Atlanta before we got the mobile laboratory. If you go to DRC, Two years ago, we were sending samples to, to, to Atlanta as well. Right now, they have 12 mobile laboratories in provinces detecting you know, Ebola. We need to continue doing that. I think it's important to continue investing in the laboratory. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank my panelists. Everyone here in the humanitarian space works so hard, but particularly the health professionals that are here and that are working on the coronavirus, as we said, you know, we've been affected in a small way by unfortunately some of our speakers and guests were unable to come. But the people on this stage, the people from the World Health Organization and um, other um, health organizations are leading um, the worldwide response. And we want to thank them. And it just shows how important um, the efforts of, of KS Relief are and how important they thought it was to come to you. So I want to thank all of my panelists, particularly um, Dr. Fall and the World Health Organization um, for, for what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you again to Chaos Relief. I just want to close by saying the World Health Organization has two recommendations um, that evidence indicates, and we'll be talking about them, but the, and we talked about this, the use of the SDGs to support a communicable disease elimination framework and sharing information. We talked about sharing the science. And now, um, you know, as we close the conference, they'll be talking about these fuller recommendations. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And many thanks there to Elise Labotte. As ever, an excellent debate, very well moderated with some intelligent, insightful comments from her panel. So, excellencies, dignitaries, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, we have been together now for two days at the Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum, and we have discussed many subjects surrounding the world of humanitarian development. There are many challenges happening around us and which lie ahead in the future. But what has come out of the time spent together are a series of recommendations. These recommendations are a roadmap for the future to tackle those challenges.
head on. We're going to reveal what the details of those recommendations are. And I'm now going to hand the microphone and the stage to my colleague in the media, the Arabic media, of course, the distinguished television anchor for Al Arabiya Television, Mohammed Tomei. Please, the stage is yours. Shukran, uh, Juliet uh, Foster. Sayyidat wa Sada, yasurun al-an an u'alina al-bayana al-khitami li muntada al-riyadi al-dawli al-insani al-than. Awala, fi majali ta'zizi al-rabd bayna al-amali al-insani wa al-tanmawi. Al-tawsiyat al-ula. التنفيذ الكامل لالتزامات قرار الجمعية العامة للأمم المتحدة 279 تقسيم 72 بشأن إعادة وضع نظام الأمم المتحدة الإنمائي بما في ذلك تنفيذ اتفاق التمويل وإطار المسألة الإدارية وإطار عمل الأمم المتحدة للتنمية المستدامة من أجل تعزيز التعاون بين التنمية الإنسانية والسلام والحد من احتياجات الناس والمخاطر على مدى عدة سنوات التوصية الثانية استمرار الدعوة إلى تعزيز التعاون بين الجهود التنموية والإنسانية والسلام للحد من الاحتياجات الإنسانية والمخاطر وأوجه الضعف على مدى عدة سنوات بالاستناد إلى الميزة النسبية لمجموعة متنوعة من الجهات الفاعلة ومن خلال نتائج جماعية واضحة وقابلة للقياس تسهم في تحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة وتستند إلى آليات المساءلة المعزلة التوصية الثالثة استمرار تعزيز التعاون الإنساني والتنموي لتحقيق اتساق وكفاءة أكبر في العمل الإنساني والتنموي في الأزمات والانتقال لتنمية مستدامة طويلة الأجل للحد من المخاطر وبناء القدرة على الصمود وذلك من خلال اللجنة التوجيهية المشتركة بقيادة مكتب الأمم المتحدة لتنسيق الشؤون الإنسانية وبرنامج الأمم المتحدة الإنمائي التوصية الرابعة إنشاء قنوات تواصل فعالة بين المنظمات والهيئات والمجتمعات المشاركة في العمل الإنساني ونظرائهم من الجهات التنموية لضمان بذل جهود فعالة وموحدة للوصول إلى المستفيدين ثانياً في مجال الصحة في السياق الإنساني التركيز على الأمراض المعدية التوصية الخامسة استخدام أهداف التنمية المستدامة أداة لدعم نهج تعاوني متكامل لوضع إطار مستدام للقضاء على الأمراض المعدية التوصية السادسة تبادل المعلومات الهامة المستمدة من أنظمة الإنذار المبكر لضمان التدخلات المبكرة ومكافحة الأمراض بطريقة أكثر فاعلية من جميع الجهات الفاعلة وأصحاب المصلحة وفي مجال الهجرات الجماعية عبر البحار من إفريقيا إلى دول الخليج وأوروبا في الحالات الإنسانية كان هناك التوصية السابعة فهم أشمل لنطاق مشكلة الهجرة بما في ذلك الدوافع المختلفة والمترابطة والاتجاهات ونقاط الضعف ومراعاة الممارسات الإيجابية في بلدان المنشأ والعبور والمقصد وذلك للتحكم بشكل أفضل في ديناميكية تدفقات الهجرة واسعة النطاق التوصية الثامنة الاستفادة من المناقشة في هذا المنتدى للمساهمة في تحقيق الميثاق العالمي للهجرة الآمنة والنظامية والمنتظمة جي سي أم وكذلك هدف التنمية المستدامة 10.7 لتيسير الهجرة وتنقل الأشخاص على نحو منظم وآمن ومنتظم ومتسم بالمسؤولية من خلال تنفيذ سياسات الهجرة المخطط لها التي تتسم بحسن الإدارة في مجال المرأة والطفل وذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة في مناطق النزاع والكوارث وتحديات العمل الإنساني جاءت التوصية التاسعة الاستثمار المتزايد والدعم المتعدد لقطاعات الأطفال الصغار ومقدمي الرعاية في حالات الأزمات والنزوح بما له من تأثير فوري ودائم 
على حماية حقوق الطفل والنهوض بها وإنشاء مجتمعات سلمية ومستقرة في المستقبل التوصية العاشرة الاستثمار في طفولة المبكرة أمر ضروري لتحقيق اتفاقية حقوق الطفل والالتزامات المتعلقة باتفاقية حقوق الأشخاص ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة وكذلك تحقيق العديد من أهداف التنمية المستدامة التوصية الحادية عشرة والأخيرة الاستثمار في تنفيذ وتطوير مشاريع التدخلات الإنسانية للأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة لضمان حيادية الاستجابة الإنسانية ومراعاة كرامة وحقوق جميع الأشخاص لأنها تمكنهم من بناء قدراتهم وتساهم في دعمهم وحمايتهم وإدماجهم في مجتمعاتهم في مناطق الصراع والكوارث منتدى الرياض الدول الإنساني الثاني الثاني من مارس عشرين عشرين شكرا لكم وأترك المجال الآن لزميلة جولييت بوستر لقراءة البيان باللغة الإنجليزية Thank you, Mohammed. This is the outcome statement in English from the second Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. Humanitarian Development Nexus, point one. Fully implement commitments of the UN General Assembly Resolution 72 stroke 279 on the repositioning of the UN development system, including delivery of the funding compact, the management accountability framework, and the UN Sustainable Development Framework in order to strengthen humanitarian development peace collaboration and reduce people's needs, risks and vulnerabilities over multiple years. Point two, continue to advocate for and strengthen humanitarian development peace collaboration in order to reduce people's needs, risks and vulnerabilities over multiple years, based on the comparative advantage of a diverse range of actors and through clear and measurable collective outcomes which contribute to the SDGs and are based on strengthened accountability mechanisms. Point three. Under the Joint Steering Committee led by OCHA and UNDP, continue to advance humanitarian and development collaboration to promote greater coherence and efficiency of humanitarian and development action in crises and transitions to long-term sustainable development and in reducing risks and vulnerabilities to building resilience. Point four, support strengthened and inclusive collaboration between humanitarian development and, where relevant, peace actors and communities to ensure the reduction of risks, vulnerability and overall levels of need of affected populations by working towards collective results. Health in humanitarian context, focus on communicable diseases. Point five, use of the SDGs as an instrument to support integrated collaborative approaches for sustainable communicable disease elimination framework. Point six, to share critical information generated through early warning systems to ensure early interventions and more effective disease control elimination by all actors and stakeholders. Large-scale migration flows from Africa across the seas to the Gulf states and Europe in humanitarian settings. Point seven, create more understanding on the scope of the migration problem, including the different and interconnected drivers, trends and vulnerabilities, and to consider positive practices in countries of origin, transit and destination in order to better control the dynamic of large-scale migration flows. Point eight, harness the discussion from this forum to contribute to the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, GCM, as well as the SDG 10.7 to facilitate orderly, safe and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through implementation of planned and well-managed migration policies. Women, children, and people with disabilities in humanitarian crisis and the challenges of humanitarian action. Point nine, 
the increased investment and multi-sectoral support for young children and caregivers in crisis and displacement settings have immediate and lasting impact on protection and advancement of child rights and the creation of future peaceful and stable societies. Point 10. Investment in early childhood is imperative for the fulfilment of Convention on the Rights of the Child, CRC, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD, related obligations, as well as the attainment of multiple SDGs. Point 11. Investing in the implementation and development of humanitarian intervention projects for persons with disabilities to ensure the neutrality of the humanitarian response and observance of the dignity and rights of all persons as it empowers them, builds their capabilities, support, protect and integrate them with their societies in conflict and disaster areas. Two days has produced a very powerful commitment, a pledge agreed by all of you here in this room. It is your roadmap for the future. You will face many challenges, but you know this. You will have the courage not to turn away, but to pursue what is right, to produce a better, responsible, kind, decent world. I wish you well on that journey. And as we reach the end of the 2020 Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum, one final reminder to show you what kindness, compassion achieves. Stay with us because there is a volunteer session. It starts in a few moments. You can hear what people on the front line do, the results that they achieve, and more important, why they do it, because they care. Compassion is never in short supply. I'd like to thank King Salman Relief, the United Nations agencies, and all of those who came here today who put this extraordinary event together. Thank you so much for the hospitality and the kindness that you have shown me personally, but also for your wonderful work. It's a powerful statement and one that will never be forgotten. One final, final piece before I retire from the microphone. I want to make a date with you. I want to see all of you here in 2022 for the third Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. Thank you so much and enjoy your day. Thank you.
تطوع ضمن خطة المملكة العربية السعودية عشرين ثلاثين وفي الواقع كنا نشكو من قلة إقبال المتطوعين ولكن عند البحث وجدنا أن عدم وجود التشريعات وعدم وجود قنوات استقطاب المتطوعين كانت سببا مؤثرا جدا أما بالنسبة لشبابنا فهم كغيرهم من شباب العالم بل إن تعاليمهم الدينية والأخلاقية خير محفز لهم للانخراط في الأعمال الإنسانية من خلال التطوع في البداية أود أن أرحب بمعالي الدكتور عبد الرحمن السويلم وهو قامة كبيرة في مجال العمل التطوعي وأستاذي عملت مساعدا له عندما كنت وكيلا مساعدا لوزارة الصحة وعملت نائبا له عندما كنت نائبا لرئيس الهلال الأحمر السعودي وعملت معه في جمعية الأطفال المعاقين وفي العشرات من اللجان والمؤسسات الخيرية التطوعية فأترك الورقة الأولى التي سوف يقدمها مع الدكتور عبد الرحمن السويل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شكرا دكتور صالح وأشاركك الشكر لمعالي الدكتور عبد الله الربيع وزملاه في مركز الملك سلمان للإغاثة الإنسانية على كريم دعوتهم للمشاركة في هذا المؤتمر والمنتدى المميز كلمتي في الحقيقة وبالأحرى ورقة هي ورقة جمعية عناية وسوف تتكلم عن موضوعين الموضوع الأول هو إسهامنا في الجمعية في تقديم المساعدات للأشقاء من اليمن ومن السوريين المهاجرين بسبب الظروف التي في بلادهم حرب والشيء الثاني حتكلم كلمات بسيطة عن التطوع وإسهامات الجمعية الفعلية والإنجازات التي عملناها بشكل مختصر الوقت لا يسمح لكن قبل أن أتحدث عن هذين أو هاتين النقطتين أود أن أعرف بشكل سريع بجمعية عناية جمعية عناية هي جمعية خيرية صحية متخصصة في تقديم الخدمات الصحية في المملكة العربية السعودية مقرها في الرياض وأجيزت من وسجلت بوزارة العمل والتنمية الاجتماعية وصار مدتها أو عمرها الآن 12 عاما وهي تجلج تجلج إلى العام الثالث عشر الجمعية تقدم العديد من البرامج فيها طبعا برامج وقائيه وعلاجيه وتاهيليه وكذلك عندنا المستودع الخيري الذي يقدم الادويه للمرضى المزمنين وكذلك الاجهزه التعويضيه والكراسي المتحركه والاسره السماعات الاذان النظارات الى المحتاجين خاصة الفقراء لأن الجمعية تركز على الفقراء طبعا الجمعية لها رؤية ولها رسالة ولها استراتيجية وعندها خطط وأعمال الوقت لا يسمح الحقيقة أن يعني أمر عليها لكن لعل في الشرائح يعني يبين فيها بعض من هذه بالذات عندما نتكلم عن ما هي المميزات في هذه الجمعية ونحن نحرص جدا في قيمنا على الالتزام بأخلاقيات المهنة الصحية سواء من حقوق المريض أو حقوق المجتمع أو حقوق المؤسسة الصحية أو حقوق الجمعية نفسها وهذه القيم كلها قد أعدت من الهيئة السعودية للتخصص الصحية ونحن ملتزمون بها الحقيقة جمعية عناية قدمت العديد من البرامج 
خاصة العلاجية في تخصصات متعددة وبلغ عدد الذين استفادوا من هذه الخدمة في خلال 12 عاما أكثر من 422 أو 23 أو 39 ألف مريض بلغت التكلفة الفعلية اللي احنا دفعناها أكثر من 200 و 23 مليون لكن القيمة السوقية لهذه أكثر من 500 مليون بمعنى أن احنا وفرنا على الدولة أكثر من 55 إلى 60% من التكلفة بسبب تبرعات المستشفيات والأطباء المتطوعين وهذه أحد إنجازات التطوع وكذلك المشاركة المجتمعية الجمعية الحقيقة لها يعني اهتمام في قضية الحوكمة والشفافية جدا ونالت الجمعية تقدير الوزارة لمدة ثلاث سنوات متتالية تأخذ مئة بالمئة من شروط الشفافية والحوكمة وبعد تقييمها وهذا من فضل الله كما نالت العديد من الجوائز منها رابيز في الجودة في البريطانية وكذلك التميز الأوروبي وكذلك الاستدامة المالية والأيزو والعديد من يعني الشهادات التي تؤكد على شفافية وحوكمة العمل في الجمعية بالنسبة للسوريين الحقيقة إحنا لما حصلت الحرب وكثر الجرحى الذين نزحوا إلى المملكة العربية السعودية أو بالأحرى المملكة استقبلتهم حتى فرغت لهم ثلاثة مستشفيات مستشفى شرورة ونجران وظهران الجنوب والحقيقة لما زاد أعداد الحالات تقدمنا للمسؤولين عن إمكانية المساهمة في ذلك وبالفعل دعمت للدولة بمبالغ من المال وأخذنا هذه الحالات وزعناهم على الرياض وساعدنا في تخفيف معاناة إخوتنا اليمنيين في تلك الفترة ثم بعد ذلك أنشأنا صندوقين صندوق للإخوة اليمنيين وصندوق الأخوة الأشقاء من سوريا تقديرا لظروفهم ولعلكم تشاهدون في الشريحة أن عدد المستفيدين من اليمنيين وعدد المستفيدين من السوريين وكذلك القيمة الفعلية كانت حوالي 15 مليون لليمنيين و17 مليون للسوريين والأعداد اليمنيين أكثر من 2000 والسوريين أكثر من 3000 مريض استفاد من خدمات جمعية عناية طبعا نحن نقدم الرعاية الكاملة ليست فقط العلاجية وإنما نتابع المريض حتى بعد يعني شفائه ومتابعته في داخل المستشفى ونهتم في أوضاعهم الإنسانية بعد ذلك أعود مرة أخرى إلى موضوع أو الموضوع الأخير وهو التطوع في الجمعية التطوع في الجمعية الحقيقة قامت على أساس التطوع سواء أعضاء مجلس الإدارة أو الأطباء الذين تطوعوا وبدأوا هذا المشوار نحن عندنا طبعا نقدم خدماتنا في المركز الصحي في جنوب الرياض السويدي في 30 عيادة وفي المرضى العلاج الخيري اللي نرسلهم إلى المستشفيات ونتعامل مع حوالي 60 مستشفى ومجمع طبي نحول لهم الحالات لعلاجها وعندنا في الحقيقة أعداد المرضى اللي عالجناهم نعم دقيقتين نحن الحقيقة التطوع انطلقنا من ثلاثة منطلقات المنطلقة الأول الحقيقة هي رؤية المملكة 2030 والمنطلق الثاني طموحات سمو ولي العهد بإيجاد مليون متطوع والمنطلق الثالث هو النظام الذي صدر نظام التطوع في المملكة نظام العمل التطوعي احنا في حراكنا في الجمعية أول شيء أنشأنا إدارة متخصصة لها خطة ولها استراتيجية وعمل دؤوب الحقيقة في هذا الموضوع وضعت الحقيقة أخلاقيات للتطوع ولائحة كاملة للتطوع 
ونحن نطبق يعني نظام او التطوع الوطني الان الذي اقرته وزاره التنميه الاجتماعيه التطوع عندنا في الحقيقه عدد المتطوعين زاد على 4000 متطوع منهم 122 طبيب استشاري يعالجون في المركز الصحي وبلغت عدد الساعات التي تطوعوا فيها اكثر من 48 الف ساعه والقيمه الاقتصاديه في البرامج مالتهم اكثر من 343 برنامج اللي عملوا فيها وكذلك القيمه الاقتصاديه لهذه اكثر من 5 ملايين ريال الحقيقة عندنا نادي في التطوع النادي التطوع هذا مركز لتدريب المتطوعين ومركز لتأهيلهم ولقاءاتهم حتى ما نرسلهم لأي برنامج من البرامج اللي ذكرناها 343 إلا بعد أن يمروا على هذا المركز يعني معرفة الحقوق والواجبات والمهمة والرسالة ثم بعد ذلك البرنامج الذي سوف ينخرطون فيه وثم بعد ذلك نستفيد من خبراتهم وانطباعاتهم وتقييمهم لهذه البرامج احنا طموحنا ان نكون جمعيه متميزه جمعيه طموحه نموذج احتذى به في العمل الصحي المتخصص للعمل الخيري في بلادنا ونتطلع الى الاخوه الموجودين في الرياض ان يزورونا ونستقبل من عندهم طبعا افكارهم وارائهم فهي جمعيه وطن وهي تطمح لان تكون عضدا ومساعدا للخدمات الصحيه في مملكتنا الحبيبه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته شكرا معالي الدكتور الحقيقه لان الوقت ضيق معنا فسوف ننتقل الى المتحدث الثاني وهو نائب المدير التنفيذي لمنظمة الأمم المتحدة السيد تويلي كربانوف بليز Thank you very much بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to start out by applauding the organizers of this forum for adding a special session on volunteering and I'd like to uh, also thank the organizers for inviting United Nations to share some general reflections as to what would be the role of the volunteers, how we see it from the global perspective. And I'd like to extend special thanks and congratulations to the panelists on my left. She's the only female panelist uh, here with us today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you, but also learning from you, madam. I'm happy to see there's much more gender diversity in the room, and I think it's important that we of these discussions with different perspectives in mind. Particularly, if I may, uh, also have uh, the discussions with the uh, perspective and with the view of listening to the youth. Uh, here we're talking about recommendations for the future. And these recommendations for the future will change the lives of today's youth. But let me ask, how many of us in the room are younger than 20? Is there anybody who is uh, in their 20s younger than 30? Or we have few hands. Is there anybody, I mean, 40 is the new 30. Is there anybody who's younger than 40? So I think this gives us just an indication that we're already engaging the younger population, but we hopefully will be able to do much more. If, uh, Chair, you will allow me, I'd like to compensate the absence of uh, youth participation by sharing some general reflections about the role of the youth today and the role of the volunteers. And let me try to do so by imagining what today's youth, when they will be in the 50s and 60s, and they will be sitting here, inshallah, at the 17th Riyadh International Humanitarian Forum. 17th, right, if we keep biannual cycle. In the year 2050, what would they say then? At the year of 2050, we will mark the, mid the middle of this century. So the next generation, therefore, when they will be sitting uh, at the panel, inshallah, at the Riyadh International Forum in 2050, they will be talking about not only their role, but about the identity that they will have casted for the new century. It is that next generation who has a tough job for them to cast the identity of the 21st generation, the 21st century rather. I would hope 
that when the youth of today, when they're in 50s, 60s, our age more or less, when they sit here, they will reflect proudly about what they have done to improve the world. I would hope that they would say, look, now we sit in the year 2050 when there is no inequality, no poverty, but, but back in 2020, what a funny world it was. When we had hundreds of millions of people going with empty stomach to bed every night. And yet at the same time, we had restaurants in our major cities disposing tons of tiramisu every night as well. I hope that the youth will also speak, talking about humanitarian development nexus, but also speak about how they manage to uh, resolve the issues of climate change. They would say back in 2020, we lived in a scary world when the climate induced disasters were happening everywhere and they had profound magnitude. But that generation would have taken charge and would have led the green revolution that the world so desperately needs today. And coming closer to the subject of our panel, I do hope as well that the youth in the 25th, today's youth, when they're sitting in the 2050 panel, they would say, back in 2020, we lived in a bizarre world when a virus that had started in China was locking down the cities across the Europe and across the world indeed. So these are the big issues that the next generation is expected to deliver on. We hope that they will accomplish. We hope they will accomplish on those uh, challenges. We hope they will reflect at the panel in such a positive way. And I do hope that after sitting on the panel, they will go on a weekend trip to Hodeida because by that time Hodeida would have become the world's capital of modern art. Today it sounds fantastic, but as Nelson Mandela taught us some years back, it, is, it always seems impossible until it's done. So inshallah, all of these issues are, uh, however complex they seem, they are still within the reach and definitely the next generation will play important role in resolving these big, big challenges. I mean, they would be also sitting on the panel to talk about the future priorities as well, not only reflecting back. Perhaps they will be talking about issues such as, you know, uh, colonizing, establishing human settlements beyond the solar system. But that's a very hypothetical situation. They might be talking about artificial intelligence, which might even become, take some forms of emotional intelligence as well, although I doubt, and I hope that will never happen. But what I do hope, Mr. Chair, and my distinguished panelists, I do hope that whenever that panel takes place, they will also speak about the values that matter at any time in any culture. The matters, the values such as kindness, care, compassion, as you eloquently put it at the beginning, Mr. Chair, these values are embedded in the DNA of the Islamic culture. But so they're also embedded in the DNA of Christian culture, the Buddhist culture. This is very close to the DNA of the human race. So I do hope at that time they will talk about these values, they will pass on this wisdom to the next generation, and in that context, they will also talk about the issues of volunteering. Because volunteering is where compassion meets solidarity. And if good things happen today in today's world, they happen largely because of the volunteers in our own communities, in our own societies. Whenever a disaster hits any community, floods or droughts, who is the first first there to provide response. It's the local volunteers. We don't call them volunteers, but they're volunteers. In the large cities today, where the family support systems are so weak, who is providing elderly care? Again, it's volunteers mostly. The volunteers are everywhere. Uh, we in the United Nations estimate that every year, up to one billion people volunteer around the planet, one in every seven. Of course, this volunteering happens on a part-time basis, a few hours a day, sometimes a few days a month. But even then, if you translate into full-time equivalents, it's 109 million full-time equivalent people that are the global volunteer workforce. They would be one of the largest countries in the world, one of the larger industrial sectors of the world. We in the United Nations, Mr. Chair, were also humbly trying to create space for volunteering activity in the United Nations. As I speak, there is 8,000 volunteers within the United Nations system. They serve in 119 countries. We have them even in Arab states region, 1,000. We have been discussing this morning the role of the UN volunteers uh, with my colleagues in um, urban planning, urban development of East Jerusalem. We have volunteers today who are providing support to the refugees and migrants, UN volunteers in Egypt, we have today 
ten, dozens of UN volunteers who are working at the community level in, level in Lebanon on climate change projects. We have many, many more, even on the issue of uh, health. As of today, we have 200 UN volunteers in more than 30 countries that are working on issues of public health and, med and medical volunteers. To give you a couple of examples, last year, Pakistan had conducted a major campaign on measles survey. They were supported by WHO colleagues. And WHO had mobilized 200 United Nations volunteers to conduct the measles survey in places as hard to reach as uh, Northwest Frontier, Peshawar, all the way down to Balochistan. In uh, South Sudan, UNFPA is uh, using, deploying United Nations volunteers to run that country's only medical college. And they're also providing 40 midwives with the UNFPA, our United Nations volunteers, who are providing direct service on reproductive health in that, uh, in that country. So this is the general overview, uh, Your Excellency, about these issues. I do hope that today we'll learn more perspectives about the medical volunteering. I do hope that we will make it a habit of not discussing the future without the future. And youth is not just without future. It's, youth is not just the future. Youth is the present as well. So let's hope that we will be able during this panel to understand better what are the women and the youth perspective. Thank you very much. So am I. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurbanov. And uh, just in, in comparison between volunteers in the developing world and the developed world, there is a very high gap. And in my view, people in, in the West are not more humane than, or, or people in the developed world are, are not more humane than the people in the developing world. But it has to do with legislations, regulations, and incentives. Uh, and this issue, I think, has to be tackled and dealt with at a very large scale, and maybe at the political level, making sure that developing countries are adopting legislations and regulations in order to attract more youth volunteers and volunteers from all walks of life. Thank you very much, Mr. Kabran. Al Mutahadith al Thani, or Thalith, Mana, Hua Doctor Ziad Swedan, Lana Ladena Adad Kabir Mutahadithin, for Arjo Lentizam Bilwak. Shukran. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين كلامنا اليوم على نموذج من نماذج التطوع في طب العيون في مجال طب العيون مثال حي إن شاء الله يتمثل في مؤسسة البصر الخيرية العالمية هذه المؤسسة وقبلها طب العيون والتطوع في مجال طب العيون ليس حديثا نعم التطوع يعني احنا دائما نبدا بهذه الصوره صوره تعطي يعني تسال عن الزمان والمكان هذا الطفل عمل عمليه في احد الاماكن وهذا المكان او الزمان قبل اكثر من 100 عام هذه الصوره والمكان هو في المستشفى الأمريكي في أحد دول الخليج فالتطوع في مجال طب العيون ليس حديثاً 
وهناك كثير من المنظمات التطوعية في مجال طب العيون أكثر من 280 منظمة أكثر من نصفها في أمريكا هذه المنظمات العالمية التي تعمل في هذا المجال لها جهد مشكور تساعد وتخفف هذه من وطأة مشاكل العمى أما الهيئات العالمية فهي منظمة الصحة العالمية والهيئة العالمية لمكافحة العمى والمجلس العالمي لطب العيون والبنك الإسلامي والمجلس الأعلى لطب العيون أو العالم وصندوق التضامن الإسلامي وبعد أين نحن يعني هذه هذه أشياء يعني التساؤلات يجب أن يعني يجاب عليها لذلك برزت منظمة مؤسسة البصر الخيرية العالمية في هذا المجال وانبرى مجموعة من المتخصصين في مجال طب العيون إلى تأسيس هذه المؤسسة التي انطلقت من المملكة العربية السعودية وباشرت أعمالها في البلاد الإسلامية في عام 1411 أو 1989 كأول انطلاقة في باكستان مشكلة العمى مشكلة كبيرة وحقيقية ومؤرقة لكثير من المجتمعات نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى من علينا بنظام صحي لا نعاني من هذه الإشكالات لكن كثير من إخواننا في كثير من الدول الفقيرة يعانون من هذه المشكلة هذه منظمة الصحة العالمية تذكر أن في كل خمس ثواني يفقد شخص بصرة وكل دقيقة يصير طفل أعمى عدد قدرت منظمة الصحة العالمية عدد اللي يعانون من العمى في البلاد الإسلامية في البلاد بشكل عام في العالم 36 مليون أعمى وفيه 217 مليون معاق بصريا يضاف لهذا العدد ما يستحدث في كل عام من واحد إلى اثنين مليون يضاف إلى هذا العمل إلى هذا العدد ثمانين في المية من هؤلاء يعيشون في ما يسمى بدول العالم الثالث من أسباب العمى وأكبر سبب وسبب رئيسي للعمى هو المياه البيضاء أو الساد أو الكتراكت هذا المرض اللي قابل للعلاج هو أكثر مسبب لأمراض العمى في البلاد الإسلامي في البلاد الفقيرة أو الدول العالم الثالث هناك أسباب أخرى تكون أكثر تعقيدا منها المياه الزرقاء ومنها اعتلال الشبكية وعتامة القرنية والعيوب الانكسارية من هنا بدأ مشوار مؤسسة البصر العالمية ثلاثين عام من العطاء بدأت أعمالها من خلال أربعة محاور للعمل المحور الأول هو إقامة المخيمات أو قوافل النور أو الحملات الطبية المؤقتة وهذه تتم عن طريق إقامة مخيم ونكشف على المرضى ويتجمعون ثم نعمل عمليات وفي غالب المخيمات يتم الكشف من على من أربعة آلاف إلى خمسة آلاف مريض 
وتعمل أو تجرى في المخيم الواحد من 400 إلى 500 عملية ويوزع فيها ما يقارب ال 1500 نظارة الحمد لله إلى الآن عملنا أكثر من 1600 مخيم أو حملة طبية غطت 45 دولة في آسيا وأفريقيا وبلغ اللي استفادوا من هذه المخيمات أكثر من 5 مليون أو قرابة 6 مليون مريض عينوا أو تم الكشف عليهم أو تلقوا العلاج وتم إجراء عمليات أكثر من نصف مليون عملية طبعا غالي بها المياه البيضاء أو الكترات وأغلب العمليات الآن اللي تجرى تجرى بزراعة عدسة داخل العين وتم توزيع أكثر من ألف وأربعمية مليون وأربعمية ألف نظارة في هذه الحملات في هذه الحملات دائما نستخدم المتاح ما يتاح لنا من إمكانيات إن كانت سواء خيام أو بيوت من القش أو مدارس أو مستشفيات وإن كان الآن في غالب الحملات تتم في المستشفيات وسائل التنقل أيضا تستخدم المتاح هذه بعض اللقطات من مخيماتنا والمحور الثاني الذي تقوم عليه أو تقوم فيه المؤسسة اللي هو المستشفيات والحمد لله تم إقامة أكثر من 29 مستشفى في باكستان خمس مستشفيات وفي السودان تسع مستشفيات وفي اليمن أربع مستشفيات وبنجلاديش أربع مستشفيات والبقية المدن في هذه المستشفيات إلى الآن تم علاج 20 مليون مريض وتم عمل إجراء مليون وأربعمائة وثلاثين ألف عملية المحور الثالث إحنا الوقت أدركنا المحور الثالث اللي هو تنمية تنمية الموارد البشرية بعدين طيب. أرجو الدكتور زياد الحقيقة أنها أرقام مذهلة وأنا تفاجأت بهذا العدد المهول من المستفيدين من خدماتكم وأشد على يديكم وبارك الله فيكم وكثر الله من أمثالكم ولكن الوقت الحقيقة ضيق عدد المتحدثين لدينا كبير والوقت المتاح محدود جدا فننتقل إلى جميل الدكتور جميل العطا رئيس جمعية فلذات فليتفضل وأرجو الالتزام بالوقت ثمان دقائق شكرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشكر لمكس الملك سلمان للإغاثة وعمال الإنسانية هذه الاستضافة وهذه المشاركة وصلى الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يخرج من هذا المنتدى الفائدة الكبرى للمرضى المحتاجين في كل أنحاء العالم فهذا واجب لابد أن نقوم به تجاههم جمعية فلذات أو جمعية الرعاية الصحية للأطفال هي جمعية ناشئة نشأت قبل ثلاث سنوات في المملكة العربية السعودية في منطقة مكة المكرمة الجمعية متخصصة في علاج المرضى الأطفال بجميع أمراضهم سواء القلب أو الكلى أو الصدرية أو السرطان الجمعية تستهدف أو تعمل بنهج جديد ألا وهو نهج الشراكات ونهج أداء النقص الموجود في الخدمات وليس تكرار تجارب السابقة مثال الجمعية تعمل الآن على 
إصدار بطاقات تأمين صحي لجميع الأطفال أي الأيتام والفقراء المحتاجين في منطقة مكة المكرمة وبدأنا بألف طفل بحيث يتوفر لهم العلاج الدائم طوال السنة دون الحاجة لمراجعة الجمعية أو طلب المتبرعين نستطيع أن نؤمن ألف طفل مع الشركات بمبالغ أقل بكثير أقل يمكن ب 90% من تكلفة علاجهم لو اضطر لو اضطررنا إلى علاجهم. أيضا نعقد شراكات مع المستشفيات الكبرى بحيث نفتح فيها أسرة للأطفال الفقراء والمحتاجين. سرير الطوارئ يمكن أن يخدم ألفي طفل أو ألفي مراجعة طوارئ للأطفال المحتاجين في حين لو احتاجت الجمعية أن أن تعالج ألفي طفل بمبالغ لن تستطيع السرير يكلفنا تقريبا مئة ألف ريال سنويا تمريض وغير ذلك وتقوم هذه المستشفيات بتوفير الأطباء والعلاج والأدوية والتحاليل وما إلى ذلك بحيث فعلا الشراكة وتعظيم أثر التبرع يكون هو الهدف الأكبر هذا هو هذه النبدة البسيطة عن جمعية فلذات لكن حقيقة كلمتي هي عن مشروع قلوب من أجل القلوب وهو فريق عمره الآن 12 سنة يعمل في مجال التطوع في مجال قلب الأطفال جراحة وقسطرة وعلاجا خارج المملكة العربية السعودية منذ العام 2008 إلى هذا اليوم نحن الآن في شراكة استراتيجية مع مركز الملك سلمان للإغاثة في هذا المجال آه الحمد لله وفضل من الله سبحانه وتعالى تم تغطية ثلاث قارات وعشر دول في الاثنى عشر سنة الماضية تم علاج أكثر من أربعة آلاف ومئتين طفل جراحة وقسطرة بعمليات قلب متقدمة ومستويات هي نفس المستوى الذي يقدم يقدم هنا في المملكة العربية السعودية للأطفال. وهنا يجدر الذكر أن المملكة العربية السعودية قد هباها الله سبحانه وتعالى بتقدم كبير جدا في المجال الصحي والعلاج الطبي ومن ذلك قلب الأطفال ومن هذا كان هذا الفريق الفريق تقريبا يؤدي ما يؤديه مركز قلب متكامل سنويا نحن نعالج بفضل الله سبحانه وتعالى ما يقارب 400 طفل في السنة آه لو أردنا أن نعمل لهم مركز قلب دائم لكلفنا ذلك ما يفوق المئة مليون ريال إنشاء والعشرين مليون ريال آه تشغيلا نحن نقوم بذلك بفضل الله سبحانه وتعالى بميزانية لا تتعدى الستة ملايين ريال في السنة تقيم من نقيم من خلالها خمس إلى ستة حملات قلب الحملة تستمر لمدة أسبوع الفريق متطوع تماما كله والفريق متخصص تماما ففيه استشارية القلب والجراحة والعناية المركزة والتروية والتخدير وغير ذلك والتمريض بحيث نذهب ونؤدي العمل بكامل القدرة من فضل الله سبحانه وتعالى نسبة الوفيات والمرضى في هذا الفريق للمرضى أقل من 4% في حين أن النسبة العالمية المقبولة هي 4% الفريق لا يعتمد فقط على إيصال العلاج وتقديم الخدمات بل يعتمد على وسائل الاستدامة المهمة جدا ومن أهمها أن أغلب الفريق متطوع تماما وهذا حقيقة يؤثر في المبالغ المطلوبة للقيام بهذا العلاج أقمنا من فضل الله سبحانه وتعالى مركزين دائمين لأمراض القلب للأطفال واحد في بنجلاديش والآخر في اليمن هذه الآن تدار بأيدي وطنية في بنجلاديش وفي اليمن فقد تحتاج منا أحيانا الدعم اللوجستي أو الفني بين الحين والآخر وهذا مثال أيضا على استدامة العمل ليس ذلك فقط بل نحن ندرب الكوادر التي توجد في هذه المراكز وأيضا نأخذ معنا الكوادر من المملكة العربية السعودية 
وأنتم تعرفون أن المملكة العربية السعودية هي بلد مرحب بكل الجنسيات والأعراق وبالتالي مستشفياتنا تحتوي على كل المتطوعين ليسوا فقط سعوديين وليسوا فقط مسلمين والفريق كما يعني نحب أن يكون هو فريق عالمي يرحب بكل من يستطيع أن يقدم وندرب هؤلاء وندرب أيضا الآخرين في المراكز من فضل الله سبحانه وتعالى رأينا في بداية التجربة كيف أن أغلب الأطفال الذين يأتوننا كانوا يأتون في مراحل متأخرة متقدمة وبجميع المضاعفات واليوم نذهب ونجد أن أغلب هؤلاء الأطفال هم الأطفال حديثي التشخيص وهذا يدل على أن هنالك أثر حقيقي تم في هذه الدول بحيث تم تخفيف أو التقليل من أغلب الحالات المزمنة وال وغير الممكن علاجها إلى الحالات الحديثة التي يمكن علاجها ويمكن أن تعطي نتائج كبيرة قوية لنا تعاون دولي مع عدة منظمات دولية وهنالك مجلس كامل بورد كامل لقلب الأطفال إن شاء الله سنرى ثماره قريبا برنامج قلب الأطفال هذا هارتس فور هارتس أو قلوب من أجل القلوب حصد جائزة المملكة المتحدة بريطانيا لأفضل مشاركة قطاع ثالث ما بين 200 مؤسسة تقدمت لهذا الجائزة في العام 2016 وأيضا كتب عنه أحد أكبر استشاري القلب في العالم واسمه الدكتور جاري ويب أنه أحد إنجازات قلب الأطفال في هذا المجال لا أريد أن أتحدث عن البرنامج لكونه برنامج لكن حقيقة ما أريد أن أتحدث عنه هو أن كيف يمكن لبرنامج صغير متطوع متخصص أن يحدث أثر كبير جدا وهذا الأثر كما قلت هو بسبب التطوع هو بسبب الشراكات هو بسبب التخصص نحن حين نذهب للدول التي نتعاون معها نشترط تعاون وزارة الصحة تعاون المنظمات الصحية الأخرى معنا داخل البلاد تعاون المنظمات الاجتماعية والخيرية داخل البلاد لا نتبنى العمل لوحدنا أبدا الشراكات لدينا مبدأ رئيس جدا وهذا فعلا يغير كثيرا في طريقة التطوع في طريقة العمل لكم أن تتصوروا المحيط الذي نأخذ منه المتطوعين لا يتعدى ستين متطوع وهذا أثرهم 12 سنة عمل حوالي 4200 مريض نتكلم عن تقريبا 500 400 مريض في السنة من 60 شخص تطوعوا لو كان مركز قلب ما كان يستطيع فعلا يقيم هذا لكن حقيقة التطوع والتخصص والشراكات يؤدي إلى أفضل من هذه النتائج ولا شك كما قيل أن التطوع والعمل الخيري هو في دمنا دمنا كلنا كبشر وكل صاحب نعمة لا بد أن يعطي منها يقول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من كان له ظهر فليعد على من لا ظهر له من كان له فضل ظهر فليعد على من لا ظهر له ومن كان له فضل طعام وفضل بيت فليعد كل إنسان لديه نعمة يتميز بها أو فيها فائض يستطيع أن يقدم للعالم كله من المحتاجين الشيء الكثير وأختم بقولي أنه لا يجوز للإنسان أن يبيت وجاره جائع ولا يجوز للطبيب أن يبيت وآخرين مرضى يستطيع أن يصلهم ولا يجوز للمعلم أن يبيت وفي أمة جاهلة أو أمية وقل ذلك للمهندس وقل ذلك للفني ولكل شخص كل شخص يستطيع أن يقدم أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يتقبل منا جميعا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله بارك الله فيكم دكتور الحقيقة تجارب مشرقة جدا من مجتمع ولله الحمد فيه الخير والعطاء ويمتد خيره الحمد لله إلى العالم أجمع إلى المحتاج أينما كان بغض النظر عن لونه أو جنسه أو دينه أو عقيدته فلكم منا الحقيقة الشكر والتقدير على هذه المبادرات المتميزة وهي فعلا يعني واجهات مشرقة لمجتمعنا وأمتنا 
فلكم منا الشكر الجزيل ننتقل نظرا لضيق الوقت انا لا اريد ان اوقف احد فيرجو ارجو ان ان يحدد هو وقته ال- ال- الذي سبق واتفقنا على تحديده الدكتور عبد الله المطرفي وهو باحث ومؤلف في مجال الاعمال التطوعيه فيتفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله شكرا دكتور صالح وشكرا لمنظمي هذا المنتدى على إتاحة الفرصة لنتحدث عن بعض التجربة في أفريقيا ونظرا لضيق الوقت أنا أضطر أتجاوز كثير من التعاريف و معليش يمكن ما في بطارية ولا حاجة يا إخوان إذا كان الدعم الفني على أساس كيف نغير السلايدات. أي لا هذا على قدام هذا ولا إيش؟ لو سمحتوا طيب أظن أشتغل أظن أشتغل التقنية في الصالة أظن أشتغل مسؤول التقنية طيب أقول يا أخوتي الكرام نتجاوز عن هذه التعريفات ونتحدث في الواقع عن تجربتنا في المخيمات الطبية في أفريقيا في التابعة للجنة الدعوة في أفريقيا وهذه اللجنة رأسها سمو الأمير بندر بن سلمان بن محمد ويعني رجل معطي كثير من عنايته وجهده لهذه القارة والمخيمات الطبية ما هي إلا واحدة من هذه البرامج التي تقوم بها اللجنة المباركة هذه اللجنة لها أكثر من ثلاثة من ثلاثين سنة تعمل في أفريقيا والمخيمات الطبية بدأت من عام 2002 أو بداية 1400 و 1423 اللجنة طبعا يمكن يتسارون عن أهدافها أهداف هذه اللجنة هو مساعدة ذوي الاحتياج الطبي وتقديم خدمات صحية ذات مستوى عالي من المهنية وتدخل لإنقاذ أنفس أو تحسين جودة حياة أو تعزيز وكذلك تعزيز دور المملكة الإنساني وإبراز المستوى أيضا العلمي والمهني والأخلاقي للطبيب السعودي وتقديم توعية صحية وإقامة محاضرات علمية ونشر ثقافة التطوع المخيمات كما ذكرت بدأت في عام 1423 بدأت من مخيمات أطفال وإلى حد الآن أقمنا حوالي 35 مخيم طبي في أفريقيا وأضفنا بعد ذلك تخصص الأنفس دون الحنجرة ثم أطباء الأسرة والمجتمع ثم الجلدية وشاركنا أيضا بعض الأطباء مثل أطباء الامتياز لعلنا يعني نريكم بعض الأمور اللي هذه النموذج أو بعض اللوحات المخيمات بتجاوزها لنصل إلى كما ايضا اشار الدكتور زياد ان المخيم اين نقيم المخيم؟ ممكن يكون الشيء لمثل في المستشفى للدعم اللي نجده سواء من مختبر او عمليات او غيرها ولكن ممكن ان يقام في الصرادق وما بين ذلك. طبعا هذه النموذج كيف انه من في صاله بخشب نحولها ونقسمها الى عيادات او نقيمها في صاله عاديه واحيانا طبعا في المخيم او في الخيمه نفسها وعندنا قدره على أن نسوي ستاب حقنا في خلال ساعات ونبدأ العمل هذه كميات نأخذها معنا من الأدوية وبمجرد أن نعلن عن المخيم حقيقة ويعرفون الناس أن هذا مخيم طبي الكشف والعلاج المجاني وأنه لا يفرق بين أحد لا ينظر لا 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 للون ولا الجنس ولا القبيلة ولا العقيدة ولا الدين هو لمن يحتاج فتأتي لنا جموع من البشر كما ترون يعني على مد البصر تاتي جموع وانا لعلي مجرد الصور تحكي عن نفسها ونضطر ان احيانا نستعين 
بالشرطه لتنظيم الحالات فاقول هذه نماذج من البشر الذين ياتون طبعا انا لضيق الوقت لعلنا يعني ما هو الناتج او ما هو الاثر الذي تحققه مثل هذه المخيمات نحن نتحدث عن ان هناك اهداف كما اشرت لها قبل قليل وضربت امثله لكل واحد من هذه الاهداف او مثال او مثالين ماذا نقدم هذه المخيمات الاعداد اللي رايناها معدل المخيم يعني يتجاوز 2500 مريض نشوف في الطلعه الواحده اللي هي تقريبا بحوالي ثمانية أيام أو سبعة إلى ثمانية أيام بمعدل خمسة أطباء طبعا عدد كبير ولكن إذا نظرنا ما هو الأثر في إنقاذ حياة هذه الأخت صوروا الأثر اللي بنتكلم عنها الآن لهم مثل هذه المخيمات وأعتقد هذا هو العنوان الذي أردت أن يكون في هذه الكلمة هذه الأخت عمرها 31 سنة يعني حامل في الشهر الأخير 39 أسبوع طبعا الاشكاليه انه كان عندها الطفل غير وضعه الطبيعي ما هو نزع على راسه وحبل السري ملتف على العنق طبعا مثل هذه الحاله البعض قد يرى انها ما هي مره مشكله وان كانت هي مشكله حتى في مثل البلاد المتقدمه عند الامكانات لكن اذا عرفنا في تلك السنه انه في امريكا كانت نسبه الممار او الوفيات حول الحمل او النفاسيه وما ادري ترجمتها بالعربي انه لكل 100 الف في امريكا 12 شخص او واحده وفي السعوديه 18 وفي مدينه هذه المراه 400 حاله نعرف خطوره اللي ممكن تتعرض ان هذه المراه انه في غالب امرها ممكن تتوفى هي او ابنها الحمد لله استطعنا ان نحيلها وتعمل لها عمليه قيصريه وزرتها بعد عشر ساعات اطمن عليهم فوجدتهم وهذه من اللطائف مسمين الطفل الدكتور عبد الله طبعا هم هم هناك يحبون البلد هنا وكثير شفت الشيخ عبد الرحمن السديس يعني مره الشيخ ما شاء الله له شعبيه فقلت لا سموه ولدي طبيب واسمه عمر سموه الدكتور عمر وهذا اسمه ابو عيسى بالو طبعا هذه حاله اخرى المهم شوف الحاله الحمد لله انقذنا حالتين هناك وام وابنها هذه حاله اخرى كما رايت من الجموع عادة ناخذ عدد اللي نتحمله وبالتالي نقف التسجيل فجاءني المنظم قال لي فيهم امراه جات من خارج المدينه تمشي على رجليها ووصلت الان لا نستطيع نردها لانها خارجه ممكن تشوفها جيبوها ما القصه قالت هذا الطفل له ست اسابيع منذ شهر وهو مجرد اعطيها الرضعه ويرجعها كامله طبعا كشفت بطنه بهذه الصوره احنا كاطباء اطفال هذا تشخيص كلينيكي واضح يعني ما ادري لكن ايش ترجمته انسداد في الاثنى عشر ونحتاج تدخل علاجي بسيط لانقاذ هذه الحياه طبعا على طول حولته للمستشفى لتعديل بعض الاملاح وطلبت كم تكلفه كم تتصورون يا اخوه انقاذ حياه طفل مثل هذا 100 دولار 100 دولار والحمد لله وهو اليوم ان شاء الله زي زينا في صحه وعافيه هذه نماذج حقيقة من الأثر لإنقاذ حياة لحالات والحالات والأمثلة كثيرة. هذه أخت أيضا كيف في تحسين جودة الحياة؟ المريضة هذه عمرها 23 سنة، جات على العكاكيز، لو لاحظتوا في الأشعة اللي جنبها الفقدة مكسورة والعظمة يعني هكذا ما أدري الصورة واضحة؟ أيوه لعلها واضحة في الشاشة منذ أكثر من أربع سنوات. وهي تمشي على العكاز على العكاز وطبعا صارت عندها هذه السمنه، الحمد لله ايضا استطعنا ان ندبر لها من يعالجها ويعمل العمليه، فهذه الاشعه بعد اجراء العمليه وهذه تقف لاول مره تحط رجلها ثم تقف على نفسها ثم تمشي، وعندي لبعض الحالات فيديوهات يعني الواحد يشوف الفرق بين او الاثر بين حاله كانت معاقه تماما وتحولت الى انسان عادي. حستعجل طبعا هذه ايضا نموذج لاعاقه وهذا نموذج لاعاقه والدكتور صالح يقول بسرعه طبعا كنا في هذه المخيمات نحرص على ان نعمل من خ... ونحن بالزي السعودي لانه انت معك اطباء واستشاريين وفي نفس الوقت تقدى ادويه وشغل كل مجاني فنحاول نوجد الصوره الذهنيه لهذا ال... في المكان اللي نشتغل فيه الطبيب الذي اتى من المملكه العربيه السعوديه من ارض الحرمين وما هو الاثر وما هو التعامل الذي كان يقوم به فهذه نماذج العمل اللي كنا نقوم به ايضا اتجاوز في هذا الصور 
طبعا كما ذكرت انه احيانا ومن باب ايضا العمل التطوعي كان يشاركنا حتى اطباء الامتياز هو اليوم رجع استاذ يعني في الجامعه فكان ايضا يشارك معنا بعض الاطباء الامتياز هناك ايضا في التوعيه الصحيه والتثقيف الصحي سواء في المستشفيات او في التجمعات سواء وبالذات فيما يتعلق ويهم البيئه الافريقيه مثل التحكم في الامراض او العدوى وقضيه الايدز والملاريا ففيه محاضرات تعمل لتحقيق يعني التوعيه الصحيه المصاحبه للمخيم الطبي طبعا كما ذكرت ولتعزيز واظهار الدور الانساني اللي تقوم بها الجهود في جهود المملكه العربيه السعوديه ونحن جزء منها انه كيف في الصحافه وفي الاذاعه والتلفزيون هناك جهود كبيره وهذا نموذج انه طاقم سعودي يقدم خدمات صحيه مجانيه طبعا اقول هذه الاعداد وهذه الاعمال يعني انا حاولت فقط ابين انه كم الحاجه للناس وما هو الاثر الذي نحدثه وحقيقة أقول كل إنسان يستطيع أن يقدم ويحدث أثرا وشكرا لكم شكرا دكتور عبد الله وهذه تجربة أخرى مشرقة ولله الحمد نشكركم على أعمالكم الخيرة ونرجو لكم إن شاء الله المزيد والتطوع ننتقل للدكتور علي المسعود وهو استشاري امراض القلب والقسطره فتفضل دكتور بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اولا احب ان اشكر القائمين على هذا المؤتمر على هذه الدعوه الكريمه وعلى اتاحه الفرصه ل يعني المشاركه في تجارب بضع سنوات في امراض القلب اولا احب ان اشير الى ان امراض القلب تختلف نوعا ما عن باقي الامراض فهي تعتبر الرقم أو السبب الرئيس للوفيات في العالم وإذا نظرنا إلى الشعوب الفقيرة والبلدان متوسطة أو محدودة الدخل تكون كلفة علاج هذه الأمراض عالية جدا وينعكس المرض ليس فقط على المريض بل على المريض وأقارب المريض والمجتمع الصغير المحيط المريض وقد ينقل عوائل مستقرة الدخل إلى تحت خط الفقر أو الى الى يعني انعدام الموارد بسبب الكلفه العاليه لهذه الامراض من من 2011 الى الى الوقت الحاضر ونحن يعني تقريبا ومع مجموعه من المتطوعين نقوم بتسيير حملات متخصصه لامراض القلب للكبار تحديدا قساطر القلب التي تتعامل مع الازمات القلبيه والجلطات القلبيه التي فيها باذن الله انقاذ لحياه الناس ومن احياها فكان ما احيا الناس جميعا. تعلمت خلال هذه السنوات ان ليس المستفيد فقط هو المريض الذي يعالج بل ينبغي ان يكون في حساباتنا كذلك تعليم الطبيب ذلك الذي سوف يبقى في هذا المجتمع ويعالج المرضى ليلا ونهارا. كنت في زيارة استكشافية أو تحضيرية لتنزانيا لتحضير لحملة أمراض علاج مرضى القلب وهذه كانت لي أول زيارة لذلك البلد فما كنت مستعدا للعمل فقط لاستطلاع المستشفى والإمكانيات في يوم الزيارة ذكروا أن بين يديهم مريض يحتاج قسطرة قلبية لكن الأطباء كانوا عاجزين عن إجراء القسطرة بسبب بسيط أن المواد التي بين أيديهم تستعمل عن طريق الفخذ والمريض يشتكي من توسع شديد في الشريان في الأورطي فكان غير ممكن للأطباء فذكرت لهم أمر بسيط يعني يعتبر عمل يومي لنا في بلدنا أو في بعض البلدان المتقدمة وهو إجراء القسطرة عن طريق اليد فقالوا اذا سوف نجري العمليه في الغد، فانا جيت الغد حتى يعني اساهم معهم لاني لم احصل على تصاريح بعد. ففوجئت مدير المستشفى يستقبلني بلباس غرفه العمليات ويقول تفضل. وقعت في حرج لكن ما كان لي بد الا من تقديم يد المساعده، وتم اجراء تلك العمليه بنجاح وكنت سعيد جدا والحمد لله يعني تيسر الامر وكان جميع العاملين في يعني بغبطه بهذا الموضوع. فعقدت العزم 
أن يكون المؤتمر الذي يعد له ليس فقط لعلاج المرضى وإن كان هذا هدف سامي وكبير ولكن كذلك لنقل التقنية, التقنية وللتعليم الطبي ولرفع مستوى الأطباء وفعلا في ذلك في المخيم التالي كان هدفي الأول المريض والهدف الذي لا يقل أهمية عنه زميلي الطبيب الذي يقف بجانبي فكنت أعمل بجد في اليوم الأول والثاني والثالث في اليوم الرابع أصبحت أنا المساعد وطبيب التنزاني هو هو الطبيب الأول تركت هذا البلد بشعور لا أستطيع أن أصف أن أجد زملائي استمروا في خدمة المرضى بخدمات جيدة بسبب إن شئ تسمها ورشة عمل أو دورة دورة بضعة أيام تكررت هذه التجربة في موريتانيا واليمن فأنا أريد أن أشير أن أو أدعو زملائي لأن يحملوا كما أن نحمل هم المريض كذلك تكون نظرتنا أبعد كيف نساهم أو نساعد تلك البلدان لأن تنتقل من مستوى إلى مستوى أعلى منه وكيف نساهم في ديمومة واستمرارية هذا العمل وأنا بهذا الخصوص بأمراض القلب أود كذلك أن يعني أزف إليكم بشرة تأسيس جمعية رعاية مرضى للقلب في مدينة الرياض اسمها جمعية قلبي أرجو أن تكون مظلة لجميع أطباء القلب المتطوعين أطباء وجراحي وفني وفني ومتخصصي أمراض القلب حتى يكونوا يعني شجرة مثمرة تخدم هذا البلد المعطاء ويكون أثرها خارج هذا البلد وشكرا لكم مرة أخرى على إتاحة الفرصة والصلاة على محمد شكرا دكتور علي وعلى مساهماتكم الحقيقة الجليلة والتزامك كذلك بالوقت ومثل ما ذكر نحن في حاجة إلى المتبرعين وليس بالضرورة بالمال إنما بالوقت بالجهد ومن جميع شرائح المجتمع وفي كل الأعمار ومن كل التخصصات ولكن أعتقد أن من أهم التخصصات التي تحتاج تحتاج إليها المجتمعات الفقيرة هي التخصصات الطبية وذلك لندرتها وغلاء تكلفتها أو صعوبة الحصول عليها ثقافة التطوع الحقيقة يعني نستمدها من ديننا ومن أخلاقنا ويجب أن تنتشر بشكل أوسع إلى جميع فئات المجتمع وشرائح المجتمع شكرا دكتور علي ننتقل الآن إلى الدكتور خالد العتيبي وهو استشاري جراحة القلب المفتوح رغم صغر سنه إلا أنه استشاري جراحة قلب مفتوح ما شاء الله تفضل الدكتور خالد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في البداية أحب أن أوصل شكري لجميع القائمين على هذا المنتدى العالمي ولمركز الملك سلمان لغاتة على هذه الاستضافه الكريمة قد تختلف الألقاب وتتفاوت المسميات ويبقى التطوع خير ما يمكن أن نعرف به أنفسنا ونصف به ذواتنا فأنا جراح قلب متطوع كما نعلم أن التطوع هو ممارس تتطلب ثقافة ووعيا كما نعلم أن التطوع هو ممارسة تتطلب ثقافة ووعيا بما يقدم لنا وللآخرين فهو منا ولأجلنا ينبع عن خلق العطاء العظيم وينم عن هدفه السام والدليل وصدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حيث قال أحب الناس إلى الله أنفعهم للناس فالتطوع يحدث أثرا على المتطوع قبل أن يحدث أثره على الآخرين فهو يغير من نمط الحياة الروتيني ويجعلها ذات بعد إنساني مليء بالتفاؤل والمحبة كما أنه يسهم, يسهم في تعزيز الثقة بالنفس ويرفع من مهارات التواصل لدى المتطوع ليكون منسجما مع محيطه قادرا على التعامل مع كافة الظروف التطوع أيضا يطور من مهارات المتطوع الشخصية ويشارك في بناء, المعرف في بناء معرفته ويساهم في اكتساب الخبرة كما أنه يبني شبكة من العلاقات المميزة بين الأفراد سواء على المستوى المحلي أو العالمي مسهلا سبل التواصل فيما بينهم مما يعود نفعه على الفرد والمجتمع على الجانب الآخر 
فتطوعهم المنطلق الإنساني وواجبه الاجتماعي ينعكس بآثاره المتعددة على رفع معاناة الشعوب المتضررة وتوفير السبل العلاجية التي تنوء بحملها الدول ذات الموارد المحدودة فتطوع يستثمر في تطوير القوى العاملة عبر تنمية المعارف للفرد العامل في المجال الصحي ليكون مستقبلا عاملا مساهما في تنمية مجتمعه ولعل هذا من أسمى أهداف التطوع لخلق بيئة عمل مستدامة معتمدة على أيدي أبنائها ومحققة الاكتفاء الذاتي لتلك المجتمعات كما أنه أيضا يعزز روابط الألفة ويمد جسور التعاون بين المجتمعات المختلفة انطلاقا من مبادئنا الحنيف وشريعتنا السمحة التي لا تميز بين عرق أو لون أو دين ففي كل كبد رطبة أجر وليس هذا فحسب فبالإضافة للدور العلاجي الذي يقوم به المتطوع فنقل عن الأدوار الوقائية قبل العلاج وبعده عبر التثقيف الصحي ورفع مستويات الوعي وتلمسا لهذا وتلمسا لهذا الاثر حرصت حكوماتنا الرشيده استشعارا لدورها المحوري وتحقيقا لاهداف رؤيتها الطموحه على على تاسيس عمل مؤسسي مستدام يلم شتات الجهود ويوجه ويوحد منصات العمل التطوعي من خلال انشاء مركز الملك سلمان للاغاثه والاعمال التطوعيه وهذا ما ظهر جليا في احصائيات المركز فخلال العام المنصرم قام مركز الملك سلمان بدعم أكثر من ثلاثين حملة تطوعية في أكثر من أربعة عشر دولة حول العالم استفاد منها أكثر من أربعة وسبعين ألف مريض وتم إجراء أكثر من تسعة آلاف عملية جراحية ويرتفع سقف, ويرتفع سقف الطموح فخلال هذا العام من المقرر دعم أكثر من مئة وستين حملة تطوعية في ستة وخمسين دولة مختلفة حول العالم وفي الختام يبقى التطوع لذة عطاء يعيشها أصحاب الأيد البيضاء والقلوب التي استنارت فأنارت السلام عليكم شكرا دكتور خالد الحقيقة بأعمال جبارة وإنجازات تذكر فتشكر وأشكرك كذلك الالتزام بالوقت الآن الدكتورة الجوهرة حمزة وهي استشارية تخدير القلب فتفضل يا دكتورة الجوهرة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد اللهم صل وسلم عليه أبدأ محاضرتي هذه عن أثر التطوع الطبي في المجتمعات المتضررة سأتحدث عن المحتوى سيكون عن أهداف هذه الحملات التطوعية وسأركز على مركز الملك سلمان وخاصة في جراحة القلب ما شاء الله مركز الملك سلمان له حملات كثيرة ولكن هذه البرزنتيشن سأتكلم فيها عن جراحة القلب وسأتكلم عن الإنجازات التي قامت فيها مركز الملك سلمان في حملات وجراحة القلب إلى جانب ما هو أثر هذه الحملات التطوعية على المجتمعات المتضررة وعلى المتطوع نفسه ابتداء أهداف الحملات التطوعية أولا تعزيز الدور الريادي للمملكة العربية السعودية للأعمال الإنسانية تعزيز مبدأ التكافل الاجتماعي بين الدول علاج أمراض القلب حيث أنها أكثر أسباب الوفيات في العالم وعلى تكلفة كما قال زميلي الدكتور علي مسعود فعلا أكثر الوفيات في العالم كله يكون بسبب أمراض القلب والعمليات هذه مكلفة كثيرة فهذا أهم سبب في القيام وهذا أهم هدف في القيام في هذه الحملات الحملات الطبية إلى جانب أن إلى تحسين الخدمات الطبية لدى كثير من الدول المتضررة نأتي منذ أن بدأ مركز الملك سلمان في عمليات القلب بدأ من 2019 إلى الآن 
قمنا ب 11 عملية ما بين جراحة قلب وقسطرة للأطفال والكبار. مقتطفات سأريكم مقتطفات أو نبدات من الإنجازات التي قامت فيها مركز الملك سلمان والتي شاركت فيها. فكانت أول حملة لمركز الملك سلمان في المكلة اليمن. أول أول حملة أول حملة للمتطوعين في مستشفى مستشفى المكلة في المكلة حيث قمنا في خلال أسبوع كامل بعمل 99 حالة منها عمليات للأطفال وقسطرة. في نواكشوط موريتانيا قمنا بعمل في 120 عملية جراحية ما بين قسطرة وعمليات كوبار. ونشكر مركز الملك سلمان حيث أننا حين كنا في هذه الحملة حملة التطوعات لجراحة الكبار الأطباء في المستشفى طلبوا وقالوا أنهم محتاجين إلى إجراء حملة أخرى للأطفال فقامت مركز الملك سلمان بتكوين حملة أخرى لعمل الجراحة الأطفال وسوف أتحدث عنها قريبا هنا الحملة التطوعية في تنزانيا دار السلام حيث قمنا ب 63 عملية قلب مفتوح للأطفال و للأطفال بين جراحة وقسطرة. هذه حملة تطوعية قمنا فيها في السودان حيث عملنا 100 عملية قلب ما بين جراحة وقسطرة. هذه الحملة التي قلت لكم نشكر مركز الملك سلمان عندما علمنا بحاجة المستشفى وحاجة المكان موريتانيا نوكشوت أنهم يريدون أن يعملوا حملة تطوعية للأطفال قمنا بإجراء في 2020 في يناير قمنا بحملة تطوعية للأطفال حيث قمنا في 66 عملية ما بين جراحة قلب مفتوح وقسطرة وأشعة و210 استشارات طبية ما هو أثر الحملات الطبية التطوعية على المجتمعات المتضررة اقتصاديا واجتماعيا وأثر على المتطوع؟ سنتحدث أول شيء أثرها على المجتمعات. هذه صورة أخذت في رواندا حيث قمنا بزيارة زيارة المكان لنرى هل نستطيع أن نعمل عمليات. فترى ما أهميتها على المجتمعات حيث قامت بتعزيز تعزيز العلاقات الثنائية بيننا وبين الدول. قاموا بدعوتنا في أماكن حتى نرى ما هم ما يعملون ومدى فرحتهم بوجودنا في بلدهم فاستضافونا فمن من الآثار الإيجابية أيضا أن مساندة الدول المتضررة لرفع مستوى الخدمات الطبية لمواطنيها كما دعم الشعوب ندعم الشعوب هؤلاء حتى أنهم يكونوا فعالين لينفعوا وينفعوا مجتمعهم وينموها ناتي على الأثر الإيجابي على المرضى فقد ترى هنا الأثر الإيجابي على المرضى التفاعل والتواصل مع المرضى وذويهم سعادة أهالي المرضى لا تدري مرة مدى سعادة المرضى وأهليهم عندما يعلمون أن هناك حملة آتية إلى بلدهم وسأريكم مقطع آخر مدى انتظار هؤلاء المرضى عندما يعلمون أن هناك حملات تطوعية لمساعدة هؤلاء المرضى نظرا الى اننا كما قلنا انه اكبر سبب للوفيات هي امراض القلب فالاثر الايجابي الكبير لهؤلاء المرضى هو ماذا هو انقاذ حياه المرضى انقاذ حياه المرضى وخاصه المرضى الذين لا يستطيعون تحمل تكاليف هذه العمليه ناتي على اثارها على المستشفيات تبادل الخبرات بين المستشفيات فاحنا في هذه الحملات لا ليس فقط اننا نعطي نعمل العمليات ولكن هناك يكون تبادل بين الخبرات فما فنحن كاطباء نساعد ونعطي الاطباء فيستفيدوا من خبراتنا ويستفيدوا من اشيائنا فتكون لهم اثر ايجابي يتعلمون مهارات جديده يتعلمون اشياء يستطيعون ان يفيدوا فيها مرضتهم اهم شيء في الموضوع نعرف انه معروف ندره الاطباء جراحه وتخدير القلب للصغار فكثير من المستشفيات او في المجتمعات المتضرره ليس لديهم اطباء جراحه اطفال وليس لديهم تخدير جراحه اطفال فتجدهم لا يقومون بهذه العمليات فلذلك 
اثرها الايجابي على المستشفيات انهم ينتظرون هذا الفريق الطبي المكون من اطباء وفنيين وتمريض وعنايه مركزه الاطباء جراحين قلب وتخدير والى جانب اطباء القلب للقسطره فينتظرون لنا فهذه الندره يجعلهم سعداء ويدينا اثر ايجابي للمستشفيات ومن الاثار الايجابيه مساعده المستشفيات والمراكز الصحيه بجلب الادوات والمعدات فحيث ان هذه المستشفيات ينقصهم اشياء كثيره فيقوم مركز الملك سلمان وجميع الحملات التطوعيه بمساعدتهم بالامكانيات بالاجهزه بالادوات الى جانب ان التعاون المستمر بين الطاقم الطبي نحن لا نتعاون فقط في اثناء الحمله ولكن حتى بعد ان ننهي الحمله التواصل يكون مستمر فتلاقي الاطباء بيننا في تواصل حتى اذا جتهم عمليات يستشيرون يقولون ماذا نفعل فالاستمراريه في التعاون بيننا وبينهم ليس فقط في الحمله ولكن ما بعد الحملات اذا احتاجوا اي مساعده من استشارات طبيه من اشياء فانهم يتعاونوا معنا وأهم شيء في الموضوع يحرص المرك سرمان إلى اختيار الفريق الطبي له فإنه يختار الفريق الطبي الملائم في هذه الحملات الأثر الإيجابي على المتطوع أهم شيء هو استشعار لذة العطاء بخدمة الآخرين فما تدري مدى سعادتنا إحنا كأطباء عندما نساعد هؤلاء المرضى فإننا سعادة لا توصف فهذا الأثر على الطبي ومن الأثر الآخر اكتساب خبرات جديدة نحن ليس فقط أننا نعالج المرضى ولكن في نفس الوقت احنا كاطباء نكتسب خبرات جديده لان ما شاء الله هنا العمليات او مستشفيانا كل الامكانيات متواجده ولكن عندما نعمل في المستشفيات عندهم وفي اقل الامكانيات فهذه تعطينا وتكسبنا خبرات نستفيد منها الى جانب ان تعلمنا العمل وروح التعاون فهو فريق تعاون فريق طبي كلنا متشاركين فيها واهم شيء اهم شيء الاثر الايجابي على المتطوع اعتبرها زكاه علم المتطوع وعمله هذه صور تذكاريه فهنا صوره تذكاريه مع سفير الملك هنا سفير المملكه العربيه السعوديه في موريتانيا مع وزير الصحه وهنا صورة تذكارية مع سفير المملكة العربية السعودية في السودان. لحظة. هذا فيديو صغير. أحب أن أوضح لكم هذا الفيديو. أم المريضة علمت ب جاءت الحملة قبلها بثلاثة شهور. فتكلفت بأنها طلعت من المكان إلى نواكشوط. حيث يتم العملية لطفلها شاهر الله شاهر الملك سيما لعبور تشير والمقطع الآخر واحدة من أمهات هذا مريض عمل العملية أشكر الله على هذه المساعدة وأشكر الملك سلمان على مساعدته وإرسال طاقم طبي لعلاج طفلي مريض القلب وفي النهاية أشكر لكم حضوركم وأشكر مركز الملك سلمان لتاحته الفرصة لجعلنا نشارك في هذه الحملات التي تؤدي إلى سعادة كل متطوع شكرا جزيلا ونحن ونحن بدورنا نشكرك الدكتور الجوهره وانت الحقيقه واجهه مشرقه مضيئه للمراه السعوديه المؤهله والمتفانيه التي تذهب الى اماكن الخطر في مناطق سرعات مسلحه والى الادغال والى والى المناطق الفقيره لتقديم يد العون والمساعده طبعا كل ذلك بدعم الحقيقه الحكومه السعوديه وعلى راس الملك سلمان الله يحفظه ومركز الملك سلمان الذي تبنى مثل هذه المبادرات فالحقيقه يعني استعرضنا 
العديد من الحقيقة التجارب المضيئة المشرقة فنرجو لكم الحقيقة العون والتوفيق إن شاء الله وإلى المزيد المتحدث الأخير وليس الآخر هو الدكتور خالد العبد الرحمن وهو رئيس مجلس إدارة جمعية التطوع الصحية فأرجو معك عشر دقائق أرجو الالتزام بالتزام شكرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين شكرا دكتور صالح شكرا ايضا للمنظمين لهذا المنتدى الكبير واتاحه الفرصه لي للتحدث عن موضوع اعتقد انه مهم جدا يهم كل التجارب يمكن اللي طرحت وايضا ال يعني المحور الرئيسي في هذا المؤتمر هو عن الاستثمار الامثل للكوادر الصحيه في العمل التطوعي واثاره الايجابيه على الفرد والمجتمع احاول بقدر الامكان ان اختصر سوف اتحدث عن حجم الكوادر الصحيه بالمملكه بالارقام ومدى استعداد الممارسين الصحيين للمشاركه والفرص المتاحه لمساهمه الكوادر الصحيه في الأعمال التطوعية ثم التحديات أو بعض التحديات التي تواجههم ثم الآثار الإيجابية وأختم ببعض التوصيات حقيقة قبل ما نروح للحجم الكوادر الصحية أبعطيكم حجم القطاع غير الربحي في بلد زي الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لأنه حقيقة يوثق كل أعمال وأنشطته ولن أطيل في هذه الشريحة لكن لاحظوا كم عدد المؤسسات غير الربحية الموجودة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية في هذه الشريحة مليون وفاصلة اثنين مؤسسة ثم عدد المتطوعين كبير جدا يعني 109 مليون متطوع في السنة وكذلك العائد حقيقة على الاستثمار أرقام حقيقة مهولة توضح أن القطاع الثالث هو مكون رئيس في التنمية بل يجب أن يوضع في الخطط ولا يمكن حقيقة إغفاله بل هو مكمل للقطاعين الأول والثاني لذلك جاءت رؤية المملكة العربية السعودية 2030 لتعزيز هذا القطاع ولو تلاحظون في ركائز المحاور الرؤية مجتمع حيوي اقتصاد مزدهر وطن طموح يوثل حقيقة وطن الطموح هو المحور اللي يحمل حقيقة المواطن المسؤولية مسؤولية المواطن تجاه مجتمعه من خلال تمكين ثقافة العمل التطوعي لذلك ايضا تتطلع الرؤيه لان يرتفع عدد المتطوعين من 11000 الى مليون متطوع ورفع نسبه مساهمه القطاع غير الربحي في الناتج المحلي الاجمالي من 1% الى 5% لذلك مجلس الوزراء مؤخرا وتحديدا في 27 5 من هذا العام اقر النظام او نظام العمل التطوعي الذي هو يهدف حقيقة إلى تقنين وتطوير وتمكين المتطوعين وكذلك تعزيز قيمة الانتماء الوطني من خلال العمل الإنساني والاجتماعي أيضا الوزارة المسؤولة حقيقة عن المؤسسات غير الربحية اللي هي وزارة الموارد البشرية والخدمة والتنمية الاجتماعية وضعت حقيقة واعتمدت المعيار السعودي للعمل التطوعي وهذا إنجاز حقيقة جيد لجعل الأعمال التطوعية يمكن قياسها ويمكن قياس أثرها على الاقتصاد وعلى التنمية وعلى المجتمع الأعمال التطوعية حتى تكون ناجحة يبد لها من سمات من أهمها أن تكون هناك خطط استراتيجية مبنية على منهجية علمية وأن يكون لها استدامة مالية وشفافية وأن تكون هناك شراكات فاعلة حقيقة وأن يكون لها مصداقية ويكون لها أثر تنموي ومجتمعي 
الحقيقة المملكة رائدة في العمل التطوعي والإنساني منذ القدم وأكبر حقيقة شاهد وخدمة الحرمين الشريفين فدائما المتطوعين يبرزون في مواسم الحج والعمرة وأيضا في مناسبات هذه الشريحة حقيقة أردت أن نحضرها لكم وهي أثناء زيارة سمو الأمير محمد بن سلمان إلى الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية مر على منطقة في هيوستن لما تعرضوا إلى عصار هارفي ووجد مجموعة من المبتعثين السعوديين دون توجيه ما أحد وجههم قاموا ببناء أو إعادة بناء منزل تضرر بالإعصار فشكر هؤلاء وقال الفزعة بدمكم وهذه حقيقة كانت يعني فعلا العبارة شعار توضح أن يعني فعلا الأعمال التطوعية والإنسانية في دم الإنسان السعودي وفي دم كل مسلم حقيقة هذه بعض المشاركات حقيقة أنا هذه الشريحة ربما تبدو معقدة لكنها توضح حجم الكوادر الصحية في المملكة العربية السعودية الرقم الشامل 317509 مجموعة الممارسين الآن اللي يعملون على رأس العمل بالمملكة العربية السعودية شكل الأطباء منهم 20% لكن أكبر قطاع هو التمريض وزارة الصحة تشكل تقريبا 71% من الممارسين الصحيين اللي يقدمون خدمة في المملكة العربية السعودية أنا أحضرت هذه الشريحة بقصد أني أوضح لكم كيف نستثمر هؤلاء في العمل التطوعي لا ننسى هؤلاء فقط هم اللي على رأس العمل لكن ماذا عن المتدربين والطلاب أيضا هناك إحصائيات كبيرة توضح حجم المتدربين في كليات الصحية وأيضا في برامج الزمالات وهم أعداد حقيقة كبيرة وفي زيادة لأن هناك توسع في الكليات الصحية مدى استعداد الممارسين حقيقة الدافع الإنساني والدافع الديني هو أكبر محفز للممارس الصحي ثم أيضا وجود المؤسسات والجمعيات والمبادرات الممكنة لهم تجعلهم يتقدمون مثل مركز الملك سلمان للإغاثة وجود مراكز تدريب لبناء قدرات المتطوعين البيئة المحفزة الأنظمة المحفزة المردود الإيجابي على الفرد والمجتمع هذه كلها محفزات أنا حقيقة عملت دراسة قبل يومين دراسة سريعة وهي ما زالت وبدي لكم يعني البريلمينري ريزلتس أو النتائج الأولية لهذه الدراسة حتى تبين إيش انطباعات الممارسين الصحيين في العمل التطوعي طبعا الدراسة شملت حتى الآن 155 أكثرهم من الأطباء الاستشاريين أيضا ثم المتخصصين الذكور كانوا هم الأعلى Have you ever volunteered in the past six months? شوف لاحظوا النسبة أكثر من ستة وخمسين في المئة شاركوا في أعمال تطوعية خلال الستة أشهر الماضية. هذول كل الممارسين. أنا متأكد أن هذا الرقم ربما زاد لو زادت العينة. سألناهم إيش أنواع المشاركات التطوعية؟ كانت حقيقة. في التعزيز الصحة شكل كبير health promotion والpatient education وأيضا في direct patient contact services الخدمات اللي مباشرة للمرضى من خلال القوافل الطبية أو العيادات الخيرية كيف الامباكت عليك هل هل فعلا وجدت أثر من المشاركة حقيقة الأغلبية يروا هناك أثر مباشر على أداءهم وعلى نفسياتهم وكيف هل وجدت صعوبة في الالتحاق ببرامج تطوعية كلهم أكدوا أنها بسهولة ما في تعقيدات أن تشارك في أعمال تطوعية هل أنت راضي عن المشاركة الرضا ستسفايد وستسفايد هي الأعلى كيف ممكن هل ممكن تواصل وتستمر في الأعمال التطوعية أكثرهم عندهم الاستعداد للمشاركة في الشهر في شهر كم تقريبا تشارك كم ساعة من 
من الأعمال التطوعية ممكن أن تشارك لو تلاحظوا من أقل من خمسة إلى عشرة هي الأغلب نعم هل ممكن تنصح أخ أو إنسان ممارس صحي يشارك معك الأغلبية يعني ودهم ينصحون الآخرين هل ممكن أن تسجل في جمعية تطوعية لاحظوا الأغلبية يرون هذا حقيقة الفرص المتاحة المتاحة لمساهمة الكوادر الصحية في الأعمال التطوعية كثيرة جدا أنا أعتقد من, من, من ضمنها المؤسسات الموجودة القائمة والمظلات سواء في الداخل أو الخارج كلها أعمال متاحة الوقت المتاح لمساهمة هذا في حقيقة نقطة مهمة جدا كثير يشتكي من ضيق الوقت بالنسبة للممارسين بالذات الأطباء أنا أقول الوقت متاح وممكن وهناك حقيقة طرق كثيرة جدا غير خارج الدوام أو نهاية الأسبوع أو في الإجازات النظام أيضا هناك 45 يوم متاحة حسب النظام لأي واحد يريد أن يشارك في أعمال تطوعية لكن للأسف كثير من الممارسين ما يعرفون هذا الحق يحق لك أن تطلب 45 يوم في السنة لتشارك في الأعمال التطوعية أنا أبرزته لأنه مهم التحديات حقيقة ليست مستحيلة بل هي ممكنة ممكن تجاوزها زي ضعف الإمكانات الطبية في بعض الأماكن قلة الفرص في تخصص الممارس بعض الممارسين يقول أنا تخصصي دقيق جدا ولا يستطيع أن أشارك أقول نعم بإمكانك أن تشارك لكن اذهب إلى الجمعية المناسبة فستجد الفرص بإذن الله تعالى الآثار الإيجابية حقيقة كثيرة ذكر ذكروا الإخوان قبلي والدكتور الجوهرة أن الشعور بالسعادة والراحة النفسية هو أكبر شعور ثم أن الاستثمار العطاء في مجال التخصص من أعظم الاستثمار في الدارين في الدنيا والآخرة لذلك يعني الآثار حقيقة كثيرة أهم توصيات حقيقة تحديث الخطط الاستراتيجية للجمعية الصحية استحداث مقرر للعمل الصحي التطوعي ضمن مناهج الكليات الصحية في المرحلتين حتى في المرحلة مرحلة الزمالات وعقد مؤتمر دولي يعقد كل سنتين لعرض التجارب غير المنتديات والملتقيات أحتاج حقيقة أن يكون هناك عندنا دراسات مبنية على براهين تعرض في مؤتمر دولي يشارك فيه ناس من الخارج ومن الداخل وأسأل الله للجميع التوفيق ونسأل الله لك التوفيق دكتور خالد الحقيقة بحث مستفيض ومفيد أنا شخصيا أستفدت منه والحقيقة في السنوات الأخيرة مع ازدياد الكوارث الطبيعية والكوارث التي هي من صنع الإنسان والصراعات المسلحة وسمعنا يوم أمس في أحد أحد المتحدثين يتكلم عن الدونر فتيك أن المتبرعين سواء من دول أو أو من أشخاص أو مؤسسات أصيبوا بالإرهاق بسبب أن الحاجة لتبرعاتهم في ازدياد كبير. تحدث زميلي كوربانوف عن الكلايمت تشينج، عن التغير المناخي وهذا ينذر كذلك بالمزيد من الكوارث الطبيعية. فمعنى ذلك أننا في حاجة أكبر إلى المتطوعين والحقيقة التطوع صار الآن تقاس مدى تحضر المجتمع بين الدول المتحضرة والدول غير المتحضرة تنظر إلى أعداد المتطوعين لديها ومن ينخرط في الأعمال التطوعية الإنسانية وأصبح في الدول المتقدمة يعتبر قطاع ثالث بعد بعد القطاع الحكومي والقطاع الخاص هو هو القطاع الثالث فالتطوع ليس ترفا انما حاجه للمجتمع وحق للمحتاج لصون كرامته من قبل افراد مجتمع الاخرين من يتطوع بوقته او بجهده او بماله هو صاحب فضل بدون شك ولكن كذلك هو من يحتاج ويقدم إليه هذا الجهد هو صاحب حق 
فمن صاحب فضل الى الى صاحب حق فنرجو من الله سبحانه وتعالى لكم العون والتوفيق والحقيقه الحقيقه كلها تجارب مشرقه ولكن بقي ان لم يتبقى الا حوالي عشر دقائق فاترك الاسئله الى الزملاء او الى الاخوه الحضور اذا كان في مداخلات او اسئله لاحيلها الى المتحدثين صالح الى ان ياتي الميكروفون ثلاث تعليقات يعني لها علاقه بالعمل التطوعي اولا انه معروف انه وزاره الصحه وزاره الموارد البشريه والتنميه الاجتماعيه قد قد انشات المنصه الوطنيه للتطوع وهذه موجوده واغلب الجمعيات الان لها منصات الكترونيه تستطيع التطوع هذه واحده مركز الملك سلمان للاغاثه اطلق ايضا المنصه الوطنيه للتطوع الخارجي وهذه موجوده وميسره للتسجيل إن شاء الله قريبا سيتاح للجمعيات الصحية في المملكة العربية السعودية بالتعامل مع مركز الملك سلمان للتسجيل ونقل نفس الخدمات إلى خارج المملكة العربية السعودية وهذا تطور كبير سيكون في جانب التطوع أخيرا ما ذكره زميلي الأستاذ الدكتور خالد العبد الرحمن لاستحقاق الموظف الحكومي السعودي للأجازة الاضطرارية أنا أنقلها لكم بالرقم المادة رقم 23 في لائحة نظام إجازات الموظفين الرسميين تنص على ذلك وتنص على أنها داخلية أو خارجية 45 يوم وتستطيع ترجع لها شكرا بس تعقيب بسيط على كلامك وأنا معي طبعا مع الدكتور عبد الرحمن السويلم كنا نعمل معا في الهلال الأحمر السعودي وكنا نستفيد من المتطوعين ولكن مع عدم وجود نظام حقوق وواجبات المتطوع في الحقيقة أن استفادتنا من المتطوعين محدودة بسبب حذرنا وخوفنا الشديد لو لا قدر الله متطوع من المتطوعين المسعفين أخطأ أو أنتهك حرمات أحد أو سرق من شخص مصاب من جيبة من ساعة ساعتها أو أي شيء ثاني من يحمينا نحن كمؤسسة من من إذا كنا في انتظار هذا التشريع الذي صدر مؤخرا وهو في الحقيقة يعني طال انتظاره ولكن بالحقيقة برؤية المملكة العربية السعودية عشرين ثلاثين وحاجة المملكة إلى مليون متطوع الحقيقة هو التشريعات التي صدرت مؤخرا كل هذه يعني ادوات في غايه الاهميه تشجع على التطوع والتسجيل في المنصات التي ذكرتها دكتور. الدكتور انور الحساوي نائب رئيس الهلال الاحمر الكويتي، تفضل. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، اول شيء طبعا نشكر مركز الملك سلمان على حسن الضيافه وحسن الاستقبال، جزاكم الله خير وطبعا المحاضرات اللي سمعناها كثير فادتنا في المنتدى احنا عندنا بالكويت صاحب السمو الامير حفظه الله طبعا ابدى رغبه في ادخال موضوع او تدريس تطوع في المناهج الدراسيه وتم طرح هذا الموضوع على في اجتماع جمعيات الاهل الخليجيه اللي عقد في البحرين قبل سنتين فطبعا الكل مثل ما سمعنا يعرف اهميه التطوع فإن شاء الله يتم تطبيق تدريس هذه المادة شكرا لكم شكرا الحقيقة والكويت قيادة وحكومة وشعبا يعني لها أيادي بيضاء في مجال التطوع بشكل عام والتطوع الطبي بشكل خاص فالحقيقة نرى الأطباء الكويتيين في العديد من دول العالم يجرون العمليات والدكتور معالي الدكتور هلال الساير رئيس الهلال الاحمر الكويتي وهو اصلا 
جراح ووزير صحه سابق يعني كانت العمليه موجوده في في الهلال الاحمر الكويتي على نطاق ولكن كان ضيق بعد وصول الدكتور هلال الساير الان اتسع هذا النطاق ووصلت خدمات الهلال الاحمر الكويتي من خلال التطوع الطبي الى العديد من مناطق العالم شكرا دكتور انور احمد عبد الدكتور عبد الله الهزاق السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته عبد الله الهزاع منظم العربين عن الصليب الاحمر حقيقة اولا اعبر عن تقديري و يعني فرحتي الغامره واكيد هذا المنتدى ايضا الكريم بتلك التجارب العظيمه جدا تقدمها هذه المؤسسات والجمعيات ونسجل شكرنا لمركز الملك سلمان لاحتواء واقامه هذا المنتدى حقيقه لا شك ان وجود نظام للتطوع مهم جدا وسوف يعزز العطاء في مجال العمل التطوعي فقط أشير إلى ما أشرت إليه دكتور صالح لكن بدون يعني إيضاح قوي جدا أنه قضية التأمين الصحي على المتطوعين خاصة في خارج المملكة من هنا أنا أدعو أولا أن يكون هناك فعلا تأمين صحي أدعو أيضا المؤسسات والشركات التأمين الطبي أن يكون أيوة لها مساهمة في هذا الجانب كما هو أيضا إلى المحسنين والشركات المتخصصة لأن سلامة المتطوع هي جزء أساسي في تحفيزه على العمل وجزء أساسي أيضا على أن نضمن استمرارية العمل في هذه الأعمال المتميزة وجزاهم الله خيرا على هذا العطاء الكبير شكرا النظام الذي صدر هو يعني قد احتوى على حقوق المتطوع في الداخل وفي الخارج الحالية وأنا أعتقد من عندها هذه اللي كنا نطالب فيها من أول تفضل فيها أخي الدكتور صالح قبل قليل اللي كنا نطالب بهالأشياء هذه حتى نوثقها الآن يحق له من حقوقه وحمايته في الداخل وفي الخارج كما كما انه يعني موظف يعمل في في المؤسسه التي يعمل فيها يعني اذا اصيب يعتبر اصابه عمل او اذا تاثر فيكون له بسبب العمل الوفاه مثلا والى اخره فهذه طبعا ذكرت واكدت في النظام الذي صدر والحمد لله أحمد تفضل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أحمد الرويلي مؤسسة سالم بن محفوظ الأهلية قدم الشكر الجزيل لكم على ما شفناه من تجارب رائعة جدا يفتخر الإنسان أنها موجودة في مملكة الإنسانية والجهود اللي يقدمها مركز الملك سلمان للأعمال الإنسانية فبارك الله جهودكم ونفع فيكم يمكن أنا عندي ثلاث أسئلة أو ثلاث نقاط أحب أسمع تجاربكم وخبرتكم صحيح الوقت ما أسعفكم في ذكرها لنا سؤالي الأول عن التقنية والحلول المبتكرة في ممارسة التطوع الطبي إذا في عندكم تجارب أو بعض المثال العمليات عن بعد أو غيرها ممكن إذا نسمع بعض تجاربكم سؤالي الثاني تقريبا كل اللي ذكر يتكلم عن الاستجابة لوجود حالات مرضية لكن الأثر المبني على تقليل المرض من الأساس كان في بعض النماذج اللي ذكرت مثلا الدكتور المسعود ذكر أنه كان ينقل بعض خبرته ومهارته والدكتور الجوهرة ذكرت أنه بعض المهارات تنقل للكوادر الموجودة في المنطقة لكن هل هذا مثلا هو منهج أو متبع أو مقاس أو مأخوذ بالاعتبار حتى نعرف في أثر هالمعرفة اللي نقلت من أطبائنا إلى هالمناطق المتضررة في تقليل الإصابات أو الأمراض سؤالي الثالث اللي هي الحلول موجودة على أنها استجابة هل في حلول مستدامة تطرح حتى تبقى المسألة ليست فقط يمكن ذكر بالفيديو أنها كانت تنتظر ثلاث شهور الحملة السعودية أن تصل إلى منطقتها حتى تذهب بإبنها هل في فكرة لحلول مستدامة تنفذ لمرة واحدة ولكن تبقى ويبقى أثرها ويستدام وفق آليات معينة ما أعرف إذا في عندكم تجارب بهذا الخصوص شكرا لكم شكرا يا أحمد الحقيقة أسئلة يعني في الصميم ومركزه 
ودعني هي فيما يخص التقنيه والاستفاده منها في مجال التطوع الطبي هل فيه ناقل للخبرات والمعرفه للدول التي التي تسافرون وتعملون فيها الشيء الاخر هو الحلول المستدامه سستينابيلتي ف ابغى كل واحد يجاوب على سؤال اكيد بالنسبه للتقنيه من يحب يتولى الموضوع دكتور تفضل جزاك الله خير اسئله حقيقه رائعه وفي وفي مكانها كما ذكر اخي الدكتور صالح بالنسبه للتقنيه نعم يعني نستثمر الموجود لكن حقيقه في في باب مفتوح كبير لهذا واظن حتى الجمعيات داخل المملكه العربيه السعوديه الان متوجهه بقوه في هذا مثال مثل امراض القلب نحن يعني نستطيع نشارككم في التشخيص في اعطاء الراي في العمليه في اعطاء الراي في الاجراء كله عن طريق التقنيه اليوم تستطيع تنقل اغلب الصور المسجله سواء فيديو سواء صور عن بطريق رقمي وتستطيع تساعد الدكتور اللي يبعد عنك 5000 كيلو وتساعده حتى وهو يكشف على المريض يعني هو بيكشف انت بتشوف معه وتستطيع توجهه تقول لا غير هذا الى ذلك مثال قبل يومين مؤتمر ينقل في حالة لغلق ثقب بين البطينين والذي يعمل الحالة صارت له مشكلة كبيرة وما استطاع الخبرة هنا في المملكة العربية السعودية قوية اتصلوا بنا في خلال المؤتمر فذكروا كيف إيش الحلول الممكنة فأعطيناهم مجموعة من الحلول والحمد لله نقلت فلا شك في استثمار في هذا الجانب لكن طبعا اذا كان في اشياء اخرى متوقعه نسال الله ان ييسر ذلك، لكن لا شك انه هو مجال ما تقدمنا فيه كثير. شكرا دكتور، الحقيقه السؤال الثاني هو نقل الخبرات والمعرفه انا ودي احيل الدكتور هذا للدكتور عبد الرحمن السويلم بسبب انه عند التجربه عندما كنت معه في كوسوفو وفي الشيشان. فالدكتور عبد الرحمن تبنى جلب اطباء من كوسوفو للمملكه العربيه السعوديه للتدرب ل وبعد ذلك العوده فيا ريت معالي الدكتور عبد الرحمن يتناول هذا الاجابه على هذا السؤال. انا شكرا دكتور صالح الحقيقه مثل ما تفضل الاخوان احنا لا نذهب فقط لتقديم الخدمه وانما نحاول ان نطور المواقع الصحيه. سواء كان تطوير القوى البشريه وهذا مهم جدا من خلال التدريب ولما ذهبنا الى كوسوفا الحقيقه انشانا برنامج التعاون مع جامعه لندن للاعتراف بالبرنامج اللي قام فيه البرنامج كله اطباء سعوديون وهو اعطاء شهاده دراسات عليا في المناظير وجراحه المناظير. والحقيقة خرجنا فيها أعداد كبيرة وقبلنا أطباء ليس فقط من كوسوفا وإنما من كل منطقة البلقان فأنا بعتقد أنه هذا المنهجية الآن عملناها حتى في بعض الدول الأفريقية وتفضل بعض الأخوان الزملاء الدكتور علي تفضل في هذا الموضوع أنه إحنا عندنا نذهب نحاول أن يكون هناك من منهجيتنا أن نعمل دورات تدريبية و يعني محاولة دعوة بعض الإخوان المتخصصين يتخصصون والتدريب في داخل المملكة العربية السعودية وحصل أيام أطباء عبر القارات أن دعوا مجموعة من الأطباء تدربوا في المملكة العربية السعودية ورجعوا إلى بلادهم يعني يحملون التخصص وإن شاء الله هذا من ليدا مركز الملك سلمان الآن للأعمال الإنسانية أن يتوجه في هذا التوجه لم يتبقى من الوقت إلا أربع دقائق فدعوني نأخذ سؤالين واحد من الدكتور محمد العسبري واحد من الدكتور صالح السحيباني وبعد ذلك أترك الكلمة الأخيرة لكم جميعا كل واحد منكم سوف يحصل على الكلمة الأخيرة شكرا شكرا دكتور الحقيقه يعني نحن نشكر جميع الاخوه اللي قدموا هذه العروض العظيمه وهذه المبادرات الكبيره 
وحفزتني الحقيقة إلى أن هناك طرح أحد المقترحات وأحد المشروعات اللي تتعلق بشبكة المتطوعين أو شبكة للمتطوعين في دول منظمة التعاون الإسلامي وهذا أحد المشروعات اللي نحن الحقيقة نعمل عليها فنتمنى أن منظمة العربية ومركز سلمان أيضا ينضموا إلينا في هذا الجهد بأن تكون هناك شبكة قد فيه طرح علمي لها لهذه الشبكة بحيث تتنوع فيما يتعلق بالأطباء وفيما يتعلق بالعمل الميداني في حالات الكوارث و وقد تكون يعني أحد المشروعات المشتركة بين المنظمة وبين اللجنة الإسلامية الهلال الدولي وبين مركز سلمان وممكن أخوتنا في هيئة الهلال الأحمر السعودي سبق أن نقشناهم في هذه الموضوع أن ينضموا إلينا أيضا وشكرا سيد مرحب شكرا الدكتور محمد العسبلي من الهلال الأحمر الإسلامي والدكتور صالح السحباني تفضل السلام عليكم سار القرير بخاطري فدعوني أفشي لكم بسعادتي وسروري وأنا أستمع لهذه المبادرات النوعية الرائعة التي تثلج الصدع وهي تسعد المحتاجين إليها كما هي في نفس الوقت تسعد العاملين عليها فهنيئا لكم هذه المبادرات النوعية وشكرا مرة أخرى إلى مركز الملك سلمان على أيضا دعوة هؤلاء السؤال المطروح أو الدعوة المطروحة التي يتمنى أن تحظى بشيء من القبول يعني هي لماذا لا يتبنى مركز الملك سلمان مشكورا هذه المبادرات الرائعة سواء كانت جمعيات أم أفراد وتفعيلها وفقا لإطار عمل مؤسسي أنا أعرف أن المركز قام في السابق بجهود طيبة في هذا وتبنى مشاريع للمتطوعين هنا وهناك ولكن الدعوة لعلها تكون من توصيات هذا المؤتمر أو هذا المنتدى هو تبني مثل هذه المشاريع النوعية من هذه الجمعيات التي تشرف المركز ويشرفها المركز في ذات الوقت وشكرا لكم دكتور صالح بارك الله فيك دكتور صالح السحباني أه لم يتبقى من الوقت إلا القليل وأنا أريد من الزملاء المتحدثين أه جميعهم أن أه يقول لهم أه كلمة أخيرة كل واحد على حدة لمدة لا تجاوز دقيقة ولدي سؤال واحد لكم جميعا ماذا ينقصكم وماذا تحتاجون إليه إلى جانب ما تودون أن تعلقون عليه نبدأ بمعالي الدكتور عبد الرحمن السويلم أولا نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى أنه بعد صدور النظام إن شاء الله إذا طبق ستكون هناك نقلات نوعية جدا في العمل التطوعي أولا أن يكون هناك جهاز يعني يتابع كل هذه الأنشطة ومن أهمها الرصد احنا ما عندنا رصد يعني في جهود كبيره ولكنها مبعثره فان شاء الله سوف يكون في هذا الرصد. الشيء الثاني الاهتمام في قضيه البحوث والدراسات. والشيء الثالث هو التحفيز والجوائز و يعني حتى يعني نبرز اصحاب التميز في هذا المجال. والشيء الرابع الحقيقه هو تمثيل المملكه، المملكه صورتها غير واضحة في المجتمعات الدولية خاصة في المجال التطوعي والمجال الإنساني أنا أعتقد أن المملكة الآن عندها رواد وعندها عطاءات متميزة نحن بحاجة إلى أن يكون هناك الجهاز الذي سوف يتبنى هذه الطاقات ويعني يساهم فيها حتى في المجتمعات الدولية سواء كانت عربية أو إسلامية أو حتى العالم بأجمع في المنتديات العالمية وأنا متفائل كثير جدا إن شاء الله إلى مستقبل زاهر بإذن الله إن شاء الله شكرا مع الدكتور الدكتور زياد أنا آسف أولا العرض انبتر للكلام ما استطعت أن أوجزه في سؤال كان على قضية توطين العلاج أو توطين هذه الخدمات في أماكنها 
وهذا المحور الثاني اللي تكلمت انا عنه في اقامه المستشفيات وهذه راح تستمر. الثالث بناء اللي هي المستقبليه اللي هي القوى العامله. عندنا في مصر البصر اكثر من كليه ومعهد لتخريج الفنيين وتدريب الاطباء. السؤال الثالث قضيه الوقايه في الاشياء ايضا من برامج مؤسسه البصر الخيريه قضيه مسوحات الاطفال او طلاب المدارس هذه تعمل برامج ايضا وقائيه تعتبر واستباقيه. ماذا ماذا تحتاجون اليه وماذا ينقصكم؟ السؤال لنا والله نحتاج الكثير والكثير ونحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى الان بدات الشراكه ايضا التي نعتز بها في مع مركز الملك سلمان في اقامه كثير من المشاريع وان شاء الله المشاريع القادمه ستكون افضل واكثر واكثر مشاركه من الشباب السعودي. الدكتور جميل جزاكم الله خير انا انا اثني على كلام سعاده معالي الدكتور عبد الرحمن السويلي وذكر حقيقه فعلا ما نحتاجه واضيف اليه فقط اننا نحتاج اما مجلس استشاري او مجلس حتى يرتقي ان يكون تنفيذي للاعمال الصحيه التطوعيه على مستوى المملكه العربيه السعوديه ينضم تحت لواء مركز الملك سلمان يشرف على هذه الاعمال ويوجهها وحقيقة ستجد كثير كثير من السلاسة والسهولة وأداء الأهداف بشكل احترافي لو وجد مثل هذا المجلس دكتور عبد الله المطرفي أنا أعتقد أنه ما في واحد وبالذات صاحب التخصص إلا ويستطيع أن يقدم شيء سواء طبي أو غير طبي ولو الوقت يا سعد ذكرت لكم قصة أخ في برنامج الزمالة طاباطنة أرثور يعني السنة الثانية كل سنة وهو راتبه كان أقل من 1800 ريال كل سنة يقتطع من فلوسه وإذا هو ثلاثة مدرسين لي يعني يقومون بتوعية صحية وبتعليم لغة عربية في تنزانيا وفي بعض الدول شرق أفريقيا فأنا أقول الرسالة لا إنسان يحتقر أنه ما لسه ما عنده شهادة عليا ما هو استشاري وما عنده إمكانات لا الكل يستطيع ان يقدم ونحتاج وكثير يعني حقيقه يعني يتواصلون معي احنا عندنا ما يزال في عجز في استيعاب المظلات اللي تستوعب المتطوعين لو اليوم اعلنت عن فرصه لجاني عشرات فنحتاج يعني تنظيم لهذا واقول كل واحد يعمل فعنده امكانيه شكرا شكرا الدكتور علي المسعود حتى اجيب على سؤال الاحتياج اظن الحاجه ماسه في نظري لمتطوعين في المجال الصحي غير صحيين نحن بحاجه الى مبدعين في مجال تقنيه المعلومات في مجال الاداره في مجال المحاسبه والقانون يدعمون هذه الاعمال لان هذه الاعمال الصحيه لن تنجح ولن تدوم بقيامها على فقط ممارسين صحيين نحتاج داعمين لوجستيين في تخصصات اخرى وكلمة الاخيره ارجو ان يكون يعني كل واحد وان كانت المشاريع كثيره والاهداف كثيره والمطروح كثير لكن الميدان يتسع لاكثر من ذلك وارجو كل واحد منا بطريقه شخصيه بل افضل يكون بطريقه عمل جماعي ان يكون صاحب مشروع كما انه صاحب مشروع حياتي لعمله وجلب رزقه يكون مشروع اخروي وافعلوا الخير لعلكم تفلحون. دكتور خالد العتيبي أحببت بس أن أعلق تعليق بسيط على مسألة انتقال الخبرات بين المجتمعات وهذا إن لم يكن من الأهم سبب من أسباب حملات التطوعية قد يكون قد يكون هو الدافع الأساسي لنا وكما يقول المثل لا تطعمني كل يوم من سمكة ولكن علمني كيف أصطاد فتبدأ المراحل نقل الخبرات ابتداء من تشخيص الأمراض وأيضا تعتمد على التواصل واستخدام التقنية عبر طريق عن طريق شبكات التواصل بين المستشفيات المختلفة وأيضا تدريب أبناء البلد والجراحين نفسهم في داخل العمليات لكي نجهزهم بأقصى يعني على أعلى المستويات لقيام هذه العمليات وبعد ذلك نقوم بمتابعة هذا هذا هؤلاء المرضى عن طريق وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي واستخدام التقنية كما ذكرت بالنسبة لماذا ينقصنا صراحة أنا أحس أنه 
المملكه العربيه السعوديه ينقصنا ثقافه التطوع وانا اشوف انه التطوع يجب ان يكون ممنهج على جميع المستويات سواء كانت في المدارس في الجامعات في 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 جميع وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي لتكون ثقافه لدى 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 ابناء البلد الذين صراحه اشوف فيهم الخير الكثير لكن لا يجدون من يوجههم وما هي القنوات الاساسيه ليفرغوا طاقاتهم المسموعه وشكرا لكم الدكتور خالد عبد الرحمن يعطيك العافيه حقيقه في المملكه توجد الان 94 جمعيه صحيه تطوعية وفي مثلها نفس الرقم تحت الإنشاء التطوع متجه بقوة حقيقة في المملكة أنا الذي أحتاجه أن تمثل حقيقة الجمعيات التطوعية الصحية في المجالس العليا وتكون مشاركة لصناعة القرار يعني مثلا المجلس الصحي السعودي يفترض أن يكون هناك مقعد لمن يمثل التطوع الصحي حتى يكون هناك تكامل هذا مثال حقيقة أيضا كثير من الجمعيات العلمية المتخصصة تعرض كثير من التجارب والبحوث العلمية في ذات التخصص أنا أوصي حقيقة الجمعيات العلمية أن تضع مجال للتجارب الناجحة والممارسات الناجحة في التخصص لكن في المجال التطوعي مثل جمعية بصر تعرض في الجمعية السعودية إلى آخره أيضا أرى, أرى أنه دعم صناعة الأوقاف غير الربحية رائدة ويعني تقدر أرقامها بتريليون من الدولارات فلماذا لا يكون عندنا هذا العمل حتى يكتفى ونحقق الاستدامة وننتج شيء على مستوى راقي من الجودة والعطاء ويمكن قياسه فنكون فعلا شركاء في التنمية المستدامة الله أعلم شكرا دكتور خالد السيد كربانوف Thank you. I just say two things what we need. Uh, one is the laws and regulations on the volunteering. With Mr. Chair, you had, when you had said it at the beginning, it goes here and here. It goes into my head and it goes into my heart. It goes into my head because without uh, uh, laws and policies enabling volunteering, uh, we're not helping our own societies. And it goes into my heart because this is the least we can do for those people who give their time and effort for volunteering activity. Each country has its own cultural circumstances, its own context, so the laws and the regulations would vary from one country to another. Generally, we believe there's three, four minimal elements that countries might wish to con consider. One of them is safety and security of the volunteers, so we don't put them in the harm's way. Second, and related to that, is also uh, health insurance against occupational injuries. Third, that might be interesting to consider, is to make sure that volunteers get a minimal stipend, minimal living allowance, not salary, but minimal living allowance. Why do we say so? It's because of that. If we don't have minimal living allowance, it means that the volunteering will be only available for rich people. Only rich people, rich families will do it. As Mr. Chair, you had mentioned, volunteering defines the health of the society. So to make it inclusive to all social groups, that might help. And lastly, as my distinguished colleagues mentioned as well, there needs to be a government focal point, a designated agency who owns this agenda. The second thing that we need is better data about volunteerism. I must say, you know, the data that tracks what volunteers do, how they contribute, I must say, this panel that I've sat today is exceptional panel. I've never sat in the panel which had presented as much data about volunteering. Like what my distinguished colleague to my right was presenting about the surveys. This is exactly what we need because we don't have that data. We don't know how to enable volunteering better. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Al-Johara. In the beginning, I want to ask you about the question when you ask about the 
في الحملات التطوعية عندما نقوم بهذه الحملات نحن ليس فقط ننقذ المرضى في الصحيح ولكن الطاقم الطبي في هؤلاء البلدان من أطباء وممرضين وجميعا يكونوا حريصين أنهم يشاركون ويساعدون ويكونوا معنا يعني مثلا أطباء التخدير في البلاد المتضررة يكونوا معنا في التخدير حتى يتعلموا والسبب في هذا أنهم يريدوا أن يخدموا مرضاهم فنحن ننقذ حياة مرضاهم إلى جانب أنهم يستفيدوا مننا في مستقبلا يكون لهم الإمكانية أنهم يستطيعون هم بنفسهم علاج مرضاهم بالنسبة للجراحين بالنسبة لأطباء القلب كلها تماما فتجد فريقهم الطبي يتشارك معنا في كل الحملات والحكمة من هذا حتى يتعلمون كيف يتمكنوا من علاج مرضاهم إلى جانب أن كثير من أطباءهم في أطباء جراحين في بلدانهم تم تدريبهم في المملكة العربية السعودية حيث تمكنوا تدريب جراحة القلب عندنا واستفادوا من هذه الخبرات وصاروا يطبقوها على مرضاهم هناك في البلد ينقصنا فعلا كما قلنا ثقافة التطوع هذه ليس الكثير من يعلم ما هي ثقافة التطوع ينقصنا الإعلام عالميا مجهود المملكة العربية السعودية تقوم بمجهود جبار في هذه الحملات التطوعية لكن في كثير من الدول لا يعلمون ما هو المجهود الذي يقوم فيه المملكة العربية السعودية في هذه الحملات فهذا ينقصنا أن العالم يعلم ماذا نفعل ماذا يفعل المملكة العربية السعودية ما هو مجهودهم في هذه الحملات جوهرة وشكرا لكم جميعا الحقيقة تجاوزنا الوقت المحدد لنا ولكن إذا كان لي كلمة في الختام أولا أنكم جميعا تطالبون بأن يكون لكم مظلة تشريعية وتنظيمية وترصد الحقوق وتنظم العمل وفي نفس الوقت تنمي الموارد مثل ما ذكر الدكتور خالد العبد الرحمن بأوقاف أو غيرها حتى يكون هناك دخل ثابت ويصرف على البرامج التطوعية فلكم مني جميعا وللحضور الأكارم الشكر والتقدير ولمركز الملك سلمان والقائمين عليه كل التحايا والتقدير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا